Section 16 of the History of Rome, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Rome, Volume 2, by Livy, translated by William Maspin Roberts. Book 9, Chapters 1 to 7. Book 9, B.C. 321 to 304. The Second Samnite War. Chapter 1. The Disaster at Caudium. The following year, 321 B.C., was rendered memorable by the disaster which befell the Romans at Caudium and the capitulation which they made there. Titus, Viturius, Calvinus, and Spurius Postumius were the consuls. The Samnites had for their captain-general that year Gaius Pontius, the son of Herennius, the ablest statesman they possessed, whilst the son was their foremost soldier and commander. When the envoys who had been sent with the terms of surrender returned from their fruitless mission, Pontius made the following speech in the Samnite council. Do not suppose that this mission has been barren of results. We have gained this much by it, whatever measure of divine wrath we may have incurred by our violation of treaty obligations has now been atoned for i am perfectly certain that all those deities whose will it was that we should be reduced to the necessity of making the restitution which was demanded under the terms of the treaty have viewed with displeasure the haughty contempt with which the romans have treated our concessions what more could we have done to placate the wrath of heaven or soften the resentment of men than we have done? The property of the enemy, which we considered ours by the rights of war, we have restored. The offer of the war, whom we could not surrender alive, we gave up after he had paid his debt to nature. And least any taint of guilt should remain with us, we carried his possessions to Rome. What more, Romans, do I owe to you or to the treaty or to the gods who were invoked as witnesses to the treaty? What arbitrator am I to bring forward to decide how far your wrath, how far my punishment is to go? I am willing to accept any, whether it be a nation or a private individual. But if human law leaves no rights which the weak share with the stronger, I can still fly to the gods, the avengers of intolerable tyranny, and I will pray them to turn their wrath against those for whom it is not enough to have their own restored to them, and to be loaded also with what belongs to others, whose cruel rage is not satiated by the death of the guilty and the surrender of the their lifeless remains together with their property, who cannot be appeased unless we give them our very blood to suck and our bowels to tear. A war is just and right, Samnites, when it is forced upon us. Arms are blessed by heaven when there is no hope except in arms. Since then it is of supreme importance in human affairs what things men do under divine favour, and what they do against the divine will. Be well assured that, if in your former wars you were fighting against the gods even more than against men, in this war which is impending you will have the gods themselves to lead you. 2. After uttering this prediction, which proved to be as true as it was reassuring, he took the field and, keeping his movements as secret as possible, fixed his camp in the neighborhood of Caudium. From there he sent ten soldiers disguised as shepherds to Calatia, where he understood that the Roman consuls were encamped, with instructions to pasture some cattle in different directions near the Roman outposts. When they fell in with any foraging parties, they were all to tell the same story, and say that the Samnite legions were in Apulia, investing Lucaria with their whole force, and that its capture was imminent. This rumor had purposely been spread before, and had already reached the ears of the Romans. The captured shepherds confirmed their belief in it, especially as their statements all tallied. There was no doubt but that the Romans would assist the Lucerians for the sake of protecting their allies, and preventing the whole of Apulia from being intimidated by the Samnites into open revolt. The only matter for consideration was what route they would take. 
There were two roads leading to Luceria, one along the Adriatic coast through open country, the longer one of the two, but so much the safer, the other and shorter one through the Caudine Forks. This is the character of the spot. There are two passes, deep, narrow, with wooded hills on each side, and a continuous chain of mountains extends from one to the other. Between them lies a watered grassy plain through the middle of which the road goes. Before you reach the plain you have to pass through the first defile and either return by the same path by which you entered, or, if you go on, you must make your way out by a still narrower and more difficult pass at the other end. The Roman column descended into this plain from the first defile with its overhanging cliffs and marched straight through to the other pass. They found it blocked by a huge barricade of felled trees with great masses of rock piled against them. No sooner did they become aware of the enemy's stratagem than his outposts showed themselves on the heights above the pass. A hasty retreat was made, and they proceeded to retrace their steps by the way they had come, when they discovered that this pass also had its own barricade and armed men on the heights above. Then, without any order being given, they called a halt. Their senses were dazed and stupefied, and a strange numbness seized their limbs. Each gazed at his neighbor, thinking him more in possession of his senses and judgment than himself. For a long time they stood silent and motionless. Then they saw the consul's tents being set up, and some of the men getting their entrenching tools ready. Though they knew that in their desperate and hopeless plight it would be ridiculous for them to fortify the ground on which they stood still, not to make matters worse by any fault of their own, they set to work without waiting for orders, and entrenched their camp with its rampart close to the water. While they were thus engaged, the enemy showered taunts and insults upon them, and they themselves in bitter mockery jeered at their own fruitless labor. The consuls were too much depressed and unnerved even to summon a council of war, for there was no place for either council or help, but the staff officers and tribunes gathered round them, and the men with their faces turned towards their tents sought from their leaders, a succor which the gods themselves could hardly render them. 3. Night surprised them while they were lamenting over their situation, rather than consulting how to meet it. The different temperaments of the men came out. Some exclaimed, Let us break through the barricades, scale the mountain slopes, force our way through the forest, try every way where we can carry arms. Only let us get at the enemy whom we have beaten for now nearly thirty years. All places will be smooth and easy to a Roman fighting against the perfidious Samnite. Others answered, Where are we to go? How are we to get there? Are we preparing to move the mountains from their seat? How will you get at the enemy as long as these peaks hang over us? Armed and unarmed, brave and cowardly, we are all alike trapped and conquered. The enemy will not even offer us the chance of an honorable death by the sword. He will finish this war without moving from his seat. Indifferent to food, unable to sleep, they talked in this way through the night. Even the Samnites were unable to make up their minds what to do under such fortunate circumstances. It was unanimously agreed to write to Herennius, the captain-general's father, and ask his advice. He was now advanced in years and had given up all public business, civil as well as military, but though his physical powers were failing, his intellect was as sound and clear as ever. He had already heard that the Roman armies were hemmed in between the two passes at the Caudian Forks, and when his son's courier asked for his advice, he gave it as his opinion that the whole force ought to be at once allowed to depart uninjured. This advice was rejected, and the courier was sent back to consult him again. He now advised that they should every one be put to death. On receiving these replies, contradicting each other like the ambiguous utterances of an oracle, his son's first impression was that his father's mental powers had become impaired through his physical weakness. However, he yielded to the unanimous wish and invited his father to the council of war. The old man, we are told, at once complied and was conveyed in a wagon to the camp. After taking his seat in the council, it became clear from what he said that he had not changed his mind, but he explained his reasons for the advice he gave. 
He believed that by taking the course he first proposed, which he considered the best, he was establishing a durable peace and friendship with a most powerful people, and treating them with such exceptional kindness. By adopting the second, he was postponing war for many generations, for it would take that time for Rome to recover her strength painfully and slowly after the loss of two armies. There was no third course. When his son and the other chiefs went on to ask him what would happen if a middle course were taken, and they were dismissed unhurt but under such conditions as by the rights of war are imposed on the vanquished, he replied, That is just the policy which neither procures friends nor rids us of enemies. Once let men whom you have exasperated by ignominious treatment live, and you will find out your mistake. The Romans are a nation who know not how to remain quiet under defeat. Whatever disgrace this present extremity burns into their souls will rankle them for ever, and will allow them no rest till they have made you pay for it many times over. 4. Neither of these plans was approved, and Herennius was carried home from the camp. In the Roman camp, after many fruitless attempts had been made to break out and they found themselves at last in a state of utter destitution, necessity compelled them to send envoys to the Samnites to ask in the first instance for fair terms of peace, and failing that, to challenge them to battle. Pontius replied that all war was at an end, and since even now that they were vanquished and captured, they were incapable of acknowledging their true position, he should deprive them of their arms and send them under the yoke, allowing them to retain one garment each. The other conditions would be fair to both victors and vanquished. If they evacuated Samnium and withdrew their colonists from his country, the Roman and the Samnite would henceforth live under their own laws as sovereign states united by a just and honorable treaty. On these conditions he was ready to conclude a treaty with the consuls. If they rejected any of them, he forbade any further overtures to be made to him. When the result was announced, such a universal cry of distress arose, such gloom and melancholy prevailed, that they evidently could not have taken it more heavily if it had been announced to them all that they must die on the spot. Then followed a long silence. The consuls were unable to breathe a word either in favor of a capitulation so humiliating or against one so necessary. At last Lucius Lentulus, of all the staff officers the most distinguished, both by his personal qualities and the offices he had held, spoke. I have often, he said, heard my father, consuls, say that he was the only one in the capital who refused to ransom the city from the Gauls with gold, for the force in the capital was not invested and shut in with Fossey and Rampart, as the Gauls were too indolent to undertake that sort of work. It was therefore quite possible for them to make a sortie involving, perhaps, heavy loss, but not certain destruction. If we had the same chance of fighting, whether on favorable or unfavorable ground, which they had of charging down upon the foe from the capital, in the same way as the besieged have often made sorties against their besiegers, I should not fall behind my father's spirit and courage in the advice which I should give. To die for one's country is, I admit, a glorious thing, and as concerns myself, I am ready to devote myself for the people and legions of Rome, or to plunge into the midst of the enemy. But it is here that I behold my country. It is on this spot that all the legions which Rome possesses are gathered, and unless they wish to rush to death for their own sakes, to save their honor, what else have they that they can save by their death? The dwellings of the city, somebody may reply, and its walls, and that crowd of human beings who form its population. Nay, on the contrary, all these things are not saved. They are handed over to the enemy if this army is annihilated. For who will protect them? A defenseless multitude of non-combatants, I suppose, as successfully as it defended them from the approach of the Gauls. Or will they implore the help of an army from Veii with Camillus at its head? Here and here alone are all our hopes, all our strength. If we save these, we save our country. If we give these up to death, we desert and betray our country. Yes, you say, but surrender is base and ignominious. It is. 
but true affection for our country demands that we should preserve it, if need be, by our disgrace as much by our death. However great, then, the indignity, we must submit to it and yield to the compulsion of necessity, a compulsion which the gods themselves cannot evade. Go, consuls, give up your arms as a ransom for that state which your ancestors ransomed with gold. 5. The consuls left to confer with Pontius. When the victor began to insist upon a treaty, they told him that a treaty could not possibly be made without the orders of the people, nor without the fetils and the usual ceremonial. So that the convention of Claudium did not, as is commonly believed, and as even Claudius inserts, take the form of a regular treaty, was concluded through a sponsio, i.e. by the officers giving their word of honor to observe the conditions. For what need would there have been in the case of a treaty for any pledge from the officers or for any hostages, since in concluding a treaty the imprecation is always used? By whosoever default it may come about that the said conditions are not observed, may Jupiter so smite that people as this swine is now struck by the fetils. The consuls, the staff officers, the quaestors, and the military tribunes all gave their word on oath, and all their names are extant to-day, whereas if a regular treaty had been concluded, no names but those of the two fetials would have survived. Owing to the inevitable delay in arranging a treaty, six hundred equities were demanded as hostages to answer with their lives if the terms of the capitulation were not observed. Then a definite time was fixed for surrendering the hostages and sending the army, deprived of its arms, under the yoke. The return of the consuls with the terms of surrender renewed the grief and distress in the camp. So bitter was the feeling that the men had difficulty in keeping their hands off those, through whose rashness, they said, they had been brought into that place, and through whose cowardice they would have to leave it in a more shameful plight than they had come. They had had no guides who knew the neighborhood, no scouts had been thrown out, they had fallen blindly like wild animals into a trap. There they were, looking at each other, gazing sadly at the armor and weapons which were soon to be given up, their right hands which were to be defenseless, their bodies which were to be at the mercy of their enemies. They pictured to themselves the hostile yoke, the taunts and insulting looks of the victors, their marching disarmed between the armed ranks, and then afterwards the miserable progress of an army in disgrace through the cities of their allies, their return to their country and their parents, whither their ancestors had so often returned in triumphal procession. They alone, they said, had been defeated without receiving a single wound, or using a single weapon, or fighting a single battle. They had not been allowed to draw the sword or come to grips with the enemy. Courage and strength had been given them in vain. While they were uttering these indignant protests, the hour of their humiliation arrived which was to make everything more bitter for them by actual experience than they had anticipated or imagined. First of all, they were ordered to lay down their arms and go outside the rampart with only one garment each. The first to be dealt with were those surrendered as hostages, who were taken away for safe keeping. Next, the lictors were ordered to retire from the consuls, who were then stripped of their polludamenta. This aroused such deep commiseration amongst those who a short time ago had been cursing them and saying that they ought to be surrendered and scourged, that every man, forgetting his own plight, turned away his eyes from such an outrage upon the majesty of state as from a spectacle too horrible to behold. 6. The consuls were the first to be sent, little more than half clothed under the yoke. Then each in the order of his rank was exposed to the same disgrace, and finally the legionaries one after another. Around them stood the enemy fully armed, reviling and jeering at them. Swords were pointed at most of them, and when they offended their victors by showing their indignation and resentment too plainly, some were wounded and even killed. THE RETURN OF THE ROMAN ARMY Thus were they marched under the yoke, but what was still harder to bear was that after they had emerged from the pass under the eyes of the foe, though, like men dragged up from the jaws of hell, they seemed to behold the light for the first time, the very light itself, serving only to reveal such a hideous sight as they marched along, 
was more gloomy than any shape of death. They could have reached Capua before nightfall, but not knowing how their allies would receive them, and kept back by a feeling of shame, they all flung themselves, destitute of everything, on the sides of the road near Capua. As soon as news of this reached the place, a proper feeling of compassion for their allies got the better of the inborn disdain of the Campanian. They immediately sent to the consuls their own insignia of office, the fasces and the lictors, and the soldiers they generously supplied with arms, horses, cloves, and provisions. As they entered Capua, the senate and people came out in a body to meet them, showed them all due hospitality, and paid them all the consideration to which, as individuals and as members of an allied state, they were entitled. But all the courtesies and kindly looks and cheerful greetings of their allies were powerless to evoke a single word, or even to make them lift up their eyes and look in the face of the friends who were trying to comfort them. To such an extent that feelings of shame make their gloom and despondency all the heavier, and constrain them to shun the converse and society of men. The next day some young nobles were commissioned to escort them to the frontier. On their return they were summoned to the Senate House, and in answer to inquiries on the part of the older senators, they reported that they seemed to be much more gloomy and depressed than the day before. The column moved along so silently that they might have been dumb. The Roman metal was cowed. They had lost their spirit with their arms. They saluted no man, nor did they return any man's salutation. Not a single man had the power to open his mouth, for fear of what was coming. Their necks were bowed as if they were still beneath the yoke. The Samnites had won not only a glorious victory, but a lasting one. They had not only captured Rome as the Gauls had done before them, but what was a still more warlike exploit, they had captured the Roman courage and hardihood. 7. While this report was being made and listened to with the greatest attention, and the name and greatness of Rome were being mourned over as though lost for ever, in the council of her faithful allies, Ophilius Calavius, the son of Ovis, addressed the senators. He was a man of high birth and with a distinguished career, and now venerable for his age. He is reported to have said, The truth is far otherwise. That stubborn silence, those eyes fixed on the ground, those ears deaf to all consolation, that shame-faced shrinking from the light, are all indications of a terrible resentment fermenting in their hearts, which will break out in vengeance. Either I know nothing of the Roman character, or that silence will soon call forth amongst the Samnites cries of distress and groans of anguish. The memory of the capitulation of Caudium will be much more bitter to the Samnites than to the Romans. Whenever and wherever they meet, each side will be animated by its own courage, and the Samnites will not find the Caudine forks everywhere. The reception in Rome. Rome was now aware of its disaster. The first information they received was that the army was blockaded. Then came the more gloomy news of the ignominious capitulation. Immediately on receiving the first intelligence of the blockade, they began to levy troops. But when they heard that the army had surrendered in such a disgraceful way, the preparations for relieving them were abandoned. And without waiting for any formal order, the whole city presented the aspect of public mourning. The booths round the forum were shut up. All public business in the forum ceased spontaneously before the proclamation closing it was made. The senators laid aside their purple striped tunics and gold rings. The gloom amongst the citizens was almost greater than that in the army. Their indignation was not confined to the generals or the officers who had made the convention. Even the innocent soldiers were the objects of resentment. They said they would not admit them into the city. But this angry temper was dispelled by the arrival of the troops. Their wretched appearance awoke commiseration amongst the most resentful. They did not enter the city like men returning in safety after being given up for lost, but in the guise and with the expression of prisoners. They came late in the evening and crept to their homes, where they kept themselves so close that for some days not one of them would show himself in public or in the forum. The consuls shut themselves up in privacy and refused to discharge any official functions with the exception of one which was wrung from them by a decree of the Senate, namely, the nomination of a dictator to conduct the elections. 
They nominated Quintus Fabius Imbustus with Publius Aelius Paetus as Master of the Horse. Their appointment was found to be irregular, and they were replaced by Marcus Aemilius Pappus as Dictator and Lucius Valerius Flaccus as Master of the Horse. Even they, however, were not allowed to conduct the elections. The people were dissatisfied with all the magistrates of that year, and so matters reverted to an interregnum. Quintus Fabius Maximus and Marcus Valerius Corvus were successively interregis, and the latter held the consular elections. Quintus Publius Philo and Lucius Papirius Cursor, the latter for the second time, were returned. The choice was universally approved, for all knew there were no more brilliant generals at that day. End of section 16section 17 of the history of rome volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the history of rome volume 2 by livy translated by william maspin roberts book 9 chapters 8 to 15 chapter 8 Discussion in the Senate. They entered upon the active duties of their office on the very day of their election, for so had the Senate decreed, and after disposing of the business connected with their accession to office, they proceeded at once to introduce the subject of the capitulation of Caudium. Publilius, who was the presiding consul, called upon Spurius Postumius to speak. He rose in his place with just the same expression that he had worn when passing under the yoke, and began, Consuls, I am quite aware that I have been called upon to speak first, not because I am foremost in honor, but because I am foremost in disgrace, and hold the position not of a senator, but of a man on his trial, who has to meet the charge not only of an unsuccessful war, but also of an ignominious peace. Since, however, you have not introduced the question of our guilt or punishment, I shall not enter upon a defence which, in the presence of men not unacquainted with the mutability of human fortunes, would not be a very difficult one to undertake. I will state in a few words what I think about the question before us, and you will be able to judge from what I say whether it was myself or your legions that I spared when I pledged myself to the convention, however shameful or however necessary it was. This convention, however, was not made by the order of the Roman people, and therefore the Roman people are not bound by it, nor is anything due to the Samnites under its terms beyond our own persons. Let us be surrendered by the Fetials, stripped and bound, let us release the people from their religious obligations, if we have involved them in any, so that without infringing any law, human or divine, we may resume a war which will be justified by the law of nations and sanctioned by the gods. I advise that in the meantime the consuls enroll and equip an army and lead it forth to war, but that they do not cross the hostile frontier until all our obligations under the terms of surrender have been discharged. And you, immortal gods, I pray and beseech, that as it was not your will that the consuls Spurius Postumius and Titus Viturius should wage a successful war against the Samnites, you may at least deem it enough to have witnessed us sent under the yoke and compelled to submit to a shameful convention, enough to witness us surrendered, naked and in chains to the enemy, taking upon our heads the whole weight of his anger and vengeance. May it be in accordance with your will that the legions of Rome under fresh consuls should wage war against the Samnites in the same way in which all wars were waged before we were consuls. When he finished speaking, such admiration and pity were felt for him that they could hardly think that it was the same spurious Postumius who had concluded such a disgraceful peace. They viewed with the utmost sadness the prospect of such a man suffering at the hands of the enemy such terrible punishment as he was sure to meet with, enraged as they would be at the rupture of the peace. 
the whole house expressed in terms of the highest praise their approval of his proposal. They were beginning to vote on the question when two tribunes of the plebs, Lucius Livius and Quintus Malius, entered a protest which they afterwards withdrew. They argue that the people as a whole would not be discharged from their religious obligation by the surrender, unless the Samnites were placed in the same position of advantage which they held at Caudium. Further, they said they did not deserve any punishment for having saved the Roman army by undertaking to procure peace, and they urged as a final reason that as they, the tribunes, were sacrosanct and their persons inviolable, they could not be surrendered to the enemy or exposed to any violence. 9. To this Postumius replied, In the meanwhile, surrender us, whom no inviolability protects, and whose surrender will violate no man's conscience. Afterwards you will surrender those sacrosanct gentlemen, also, as soon as their year of office expires, but if you take my advice you will see that before they are surrendered they are scourged in the form by way of paying interest for punishment that will have been delayed. Why, who is so ignorant of fetial law as not to see that these men are saying this, not because it represents the fact, but to prevent their being surrendered? I do not deny, senators, that where the pledged words of men are held to possess a binding force only second to the sanctions of religion, then such undertakings as we have given are as sacred as formal treaties. But I do say that without the express order of the people, nothing can be ratified which can bind the people. Suppose the Samnites, in the same spirit of insolent pride in which they extorted this capitulation from us, had compelled us to recite the formula for the surrender of cities. Would you say, tribunes, that the Roman people was surrendered, and that this city with its shrines and temples, its territory and its waters, had become the property of the Samnites? I say no more about surrender, because what we are considering is the pledge we gave in the capitulation. Well now, suppose we had given a pledge that the Roman people would abandon the city, would burn it, would no longer have its own magistrates and senates and laws, but would live under the rule of kings. Heaven forbid, you say, yes, but the binding force of a capitulation is not lightened by the humiliating nature of its terms. If the people can be bound by any article, it can by all, a point which some consider important, namely whether it is a consul or a dictator or a preacher who has given the undertaking, is of no weight whatever. The Samnites themselves made this clear, for it was not enough for them that the consuls pledged themselves. They compelled the staff officers, the quaestors, and the military tribunes to do the same. Now no one need say to me, why did you pledge yourself in that way, seeing that a consul has no right to do so, and you were not in a position to promise them a peace of which you could not guarantee the ratification, or to act on behalf of the people when they had given you no mandate to do so? Nothing that happened at Caudium, senators, was dictated by human prudence. The gods deprived both the enemy's commanders and your own of their senses. We did not exercise sufficient caution in our various movements. They, in their folly, threw away a victory when they had won through our folly. They hardly felt safe on the very ground which gave them their victory. Such a hurry were they in to agree to any conditions if only they could deprive of their arms men who were born to arms. If they had been in their senses, would they have had any difficulty in sending envoys to Rome whilst they were fetching an old man from his home to advise them? Was it impossible for them to enter into negotiations with the Senate and with the people about securing peace and making a treaty? It is a free day's journey for lightly equipped horsemen, and in the meantime there would have been an armistice until the envoys returned bringing either peace or the certainty of their victory. Then and then only would there have been a binding agreement, because we should have made it by order of the people. But you would not have made such an order, nor should we have given such a pledge. It was not the will of heaven that there should be any other result than this, namely, that the Samnites should be vainly deluded by a dream too delightful for their minds to grasp, 
that the same fortune which had imprisoned our army should also release it, that an illusory victory should be rendered futile by a still more illusory peace, and that stipulations should be brought in, binding on none but those who actually made them. For what share have you, senators? What share has the people in this business? Who can call you to account? Who can say that you have deceived him? The enemy? You have given no pledge to the enemy. Any fellow citizen? You have not empowered any fellow citizen to give a pledge on your behalf. You are not in any way involved with us, for you have given us no mandate. You are not answerable to the Samnites, for you have had no dealings with them. It is we who are answerable, pledged as debtors, and quite able to discharge the debt in respect of what is our own, which we are prepared to pay, that is, our own persons and lives. On these let them wreak their vengeance, for these let them sharpen their swords in their rage. As for the tribunes, you ought to consider whether it is possible for them to be surrendered at once, or whether it ought to be deferred. But as for us, Titus Viturius, and the rest of you who are concerned, let us in the meantime offer these worthless lives of ours in discharge of our bond, and by our deaths set free the arms of Rome for action. 10. Posthumius's Advice Taken both the speech and the speaker produced a great impression on all who heard him, including the tribunes, who were so far influenced by what they had heard that they formally placed themselves at the disposal of the Senate. They immediately resigned their office and were handed over to the Fetials to be conducted with the rest to Caudium. After the Senate had passed their resolution, it seemed as though the light of day was once more shining on the state. The name of Posthumius was in all men's mouths. He was extolled to the skies. His conduct was put on a level with the self-sacrifice of Publius Decius and other splendid deeds of heroism. It was through his counsel and assistance, men said, that the state had found its way out of a dishonorable and guilty peace. He was exposing himself to the rage of the enemy and all the tortures they could inflict as an expiatory victim for the Roman people. All eyes returned to arms and war. Shall we ever be allowed, they exclaimed, to meet the Samnites in arms? Pontius rejects the sham surrender. Amidst this blaze of angry excitement and thirst for vengeance, a levy was made and nearly all re-enlisted as volunteers. Nine legions were formed out of the former troops, and the army marched to Caudium. The Fetials went on in advance, and on arriving at the city gate they ordered the garment to be stripped off from those who had made the capitulation, and their arms to be tied behind their backs. As the Apirator, out of respect for Posthumius's rank, was binding his cords loosely, why do you not, he asked, draw the cord tight that the surrender may be made in due form? When they had entered the council chamber and reached the tribunal where Pontius was seated, the Fetial addressed him thus, For as much as these men have, without being ordered thereto by the Roman people, the Quirites given their promise and oath that a treaty shall be concluded, and have thereby been guilty of high crime and misdemeanor, I do herewith make surrender to you of these men, to the end that the Roman people may be absolved from the guilt of a heinous and detestable act. As the Fetial said this, Posthumia struck him as hard as he could with his knee, and in a loud voice declared that he was a Samnite citizen, that he had violated the law of nations in maltreating the Fetial, who, as herald, was inviolable, and that after this the Romans would be all the more justified in prosecuting the war. 11. Pontius replied, I shall not accept this surrender of yours, nor will the Samnites regard it as valid. Why do you not, Spurius Posthumius, if you believe in the existence of gods, either cancel the whole agreement, or abide by what you have pledged yourself to? The Samnite people have a right to all those whom it held in its power, or in their stead it has a right to make peace with Rome. But why do I appeal to you? 
you are keeping your word as far as you can and rendering yourself as prisoner to your conqueror. I appeal to the Roman people. If they are dissatisfied with the convention of the Caudine Forks, let them place their legions once more between the passes which imprisoned them. Let there be no fraudulent dealing on either side. Let the whole transaction be annulled. Let them resume the arms which they delivered up at the capitulation. Let them return to that camp of theirs. Let them have everything that they had on the eve of their surrender. When that is done, then let them take a bold line and vote for war. Then let the convention and the peace agreed to be repudiated. Let us carry on the war with the same fortune and on the same ground which we held before any mention was made of peace. The Roman people will not then have any occasion to blame their consuls for pledges they had no right to give, nor shall we have any reason to charge the Roman people with any breach of faith. Will you never be at a loss for reasons why, after defeat, you should not abide by your agreements? You gave hostages to Porcina. Afterwards, you stole them away. You ransomed your city from the Gauls with gold. Whilst they were in the act of receiving the gold, they were cut down. You made peace with us on condition of our restoring your captured legions. You are now making that peace null and void. You always cloak your dishonest dealing under some specious pretext of right and justice. Does the Roman people not approve of its legions being saved at the cost of a humiliating peace? Then let it keep its peace to itself, only let it restore to the victor its captured legions. Such action would be in accord with the dictates of honor, with the faith of treaties, with the solemn proceedings of the Fetiles. But that you should secure what you stipulated for, the safety of thousands of your countrymen, whilst I am not to secure the peace which I stipulated for when I release them. Is this what you, Aulus Cornelius, and you Fetiles call acting according to the law of nations? As to those men whom you make believe to surrender, I neither accept them, nor do I regard them as surrendered, nor do I hinder them from returning to their countrymen, who are bound by a convention the violation of which brings down the wrath of all the gods whose majesty is being trifled with. True, Spurius Postumius has just struck the herald Fetial with his knee. Then wage war. Of course the gods will believe that Postumius is a Samnite citizen, not a Roman, and that it is by a Samnite citizen that a Roman herald has been maltreated, and that for that reason you are justified in making war upon us. It is sad to think that you feel no shame in exposing this mockery of religion to the light of day, and that old men of consular rank should invent excuses for breaking their word which even children would think beneath them. Go, Lictor, remove the bonds from the Romans, let none of them be hindered from departing where they please. Thus set free, they returned to the Roman camp, their personal obligations, and possibly those of the state, having been discharged. 12. Renewal of the War The Samnites clearly saw that instead of the peace which they had so arrogantly dictated, a most bitter war had commenced. They not only had a foreboding of all that was coming, but they almost saw it with their eyes. Now, when it was too late, they began to view with approval the two alternatives which the elder Pontius had suggested. They saw that they had fallen between the two, and by adopting a middle course they had exchanged the secure possession of victory for an insecure and doubtful peace. They realized that they had lost the chance of doing either a kindness or an injury, and would have to fight with those whom they might have got rid of forever as enemies or secured for ever as friends. And though no battle had yet given either side the advantage, men's feelings had so changed that Postumius enjoyed a greater reputation amongst the Romans for his surrender than Pontius possessed amongst the Samnites for his bloodless victory. The Romans regarded the possibility of war as involving the certainty of victory, whilst the Samnites looked upon the renewal of hostilities by the Romans as equivalent to their own defeat. In the meantime, Zetricum revolted to the Samnites. The latter made a sudden descent on Fregulae and succeeded in occupying it in the night, assisted, there is no doubt, by the Satricans. 
mutual fear kept both the Samnites and the Fragilans quiet till daylight, with the return of light the battle began. For some time the Fregolans held their ground, for they were fighting for their hearths and homes, and the non-combatant population assisted them from the roofs of the houses. At length the assailants gained the advantage by adopting a ruse. A proclamation was made that all who laid down their arms should depart unhurt, and the defenders did not interfere with the crier who made it. Now that there were hopes of safety, they fought with less energy, and in all directions arms were thrown away. Some, however, showed more determination, and made their way fully armed through the opposite gate. Their courage proved a better protection than the timid credulity of the others, for these were hemmed in by the Samnites with a ring of fire, and in spite of their cries for mercy, were burnt to death. After arranging their respective commands, the consuls took the field. Papirius marched into Apulia as far as Lucaria, where the equites who had been given as hostages at Caudium were interned. Publilius remained in Samnium to oppose the legions who had been at Caudium. His presence made the Samnites uncertain how to act. They could not march to Luceria for fear of exposing themselves to a rear attack, nor did they feel satisfied to remain where they were, as Luceria might in the meantime be lost. They decided that the best course would be to try their fortune and hazard a battle with Publilius. 13. Accordingly, they drew up their forces for action. Before engaging them, Publilius thought he ought to address a few words to his men, and ordered the assembly to be sounded. There was such an eager rush, however, to the general's tent, and such loud shouts were raised in all directions as the men clamoured to be led to battle, that none of the general's address was heard. The memory of their recent disgrace was quite enough of itself to stimulate every man to fight. They strode rapidly into battle, urging the standard bearers to move faster, and, to avoid any delay in having to hurl their javelins, they flung them away as if at a given signal, and rushed upon the enemy with naked steel. There was no time for the commander's skill to be shown in maneuvering his men or posting his reserves. It was all carried through by the enraged soldiers who charged like madmen. The enemy were not only routed, they did not even venture to stay their flight at their camp, but went in scattered parties in the direction of Apulia. Eventually they rallied and reached Luceria in a body. The same rage and fury which had carried the Romans through the midst of the enemy hurried them on to the Samnite camp, and more carnage took place there than on the battlefield. Most of the plunder was destroyed in their excitement. The other army under Papirius had marched along the coast and reached Arpi. The whole of the country through which he passed was peaceably disposed, an attitude which was due more to the injuries inflicted by the Samnites than to any services which the Romans had rendered. For the Samnites used to live at that day in open hamlets among the mountains, and they were in the habit of making marauding incursions into the low country and the coastal districts. Living the free open air life of mountaineers themselves, they despised the less hardy cultivators of the plains who, as often happens, had developed a character in harmony with their surroundings. If this tract of country had been on good terms with the Samnites, the Roman army would either have failed to reach Arpi, or they would have been unable to obtain provisions on their route and so would have been cut off from supplies of every kind. Even as it was, when they had advanced to Luceria, both besieged and besiegers were suffering from scarcity of provisions. The Romans drew all their supplies from RP, but in very small quantities, for, as the infantry were all employed in outpost and patrol duty, and in the construction of the siege works, the cavalry brought the corn from RP in their haversacks, and sometimes when they encountered the enemy, they were compelled to throw these away, so as to be free to fight. The besieged, on the other hand, were obtaining their provisions and reinforcements from Samnium. But the arrival of the other consul, Publilius, with his victorious army, led to their being more closely invested. He left the conduct of the siege to his colleague, that they might be free to intercept the enemy's convoys on all sides. When the Samnites who were encamped before Luceria found that there was no hope of the besieged enduring their privations any longer, 
they were compelled to concentrate their whole strength and offer battle to Papirius. 14. Whilst both sides were making their preparations for battle, a deputation from Tarentum appeared on the scene with a peremptory demand that both the Samnites and the Romans should desist from hostilities. They threatened that whichever side stood in the way of a secession of arms, they would assist the other side against them. After hearing the demands which the deputation advanced and apparently attaching importance to what they had said, Papirius replied that he would communicate with his colleague. He then sent for him and employed the interval in hastening the preparations for battle. After talking over the matter, about which there could be no two opinions, he displayed the signal for battle. Whilst the consuls were engaged in the various duties, religious and otherwise, which are customary before a battle, the Tarentines waited for them, expecting an answer, and Papirius informed them that the Pularius had reported that the auspices were favourable and the sacrifice most satisfactory. You see, he added, that we are going into action with the sanction of the gods. He then ordered the standards to be taken up, and as he marched his men on to the field, he expressed his contempt for a people of such egregious vanity that whilst quite capable of managing their own affairs, owing to domestic strife and discord, they thought themselves justified in prescribing to others how far they must go in making peace or war. The Samnites, on the other hand, had given up all thoughts of fighting, either because they were really anxious for peace, or because it was their interest to appear so, in order to secure the good will of the Tarentines. When they suddenly caught sight of the Romans drawn up for battle, they shouted that they should act according to the instructions of the Tarentines. They would neither go down into the field, nor carry their arms outside their rampart. They would rather let advantage be taken of them, and bear whatever chance might bring them, than be thought to have flouted the peaceful advice of Tarentum. Consul said that they welcomed the omen, and prayed that the enemy might remain in that mood, so as not even to defend their rampart. Advancing in two divisions up to the entrenchments, they attacked them simultaneously on all sides. Some began to fill up the fosse, others tore down the abatis on the rampart and hurled the timber into the fosse. It was not their native courage only, but indignation and rage as well which goaded them on, smirking as they were from their recent disgrace. As they forced their way into the camp, they reminded one another that there were no forks of caudium there, none of those insuperable defiles where deceit had won an insolent victory over incaution, but Roman valour which neither rampart nor fosse could check. They slew alike those who had fought and those who fled, armed and unarmed slaves and freemen, young and old men and beasts. Not a single living thing would have survived had not the consuls given the signal to retire, and by stern commands and threats driven the soldiers who were thirsting for blood out of the enemy's camp. As the men were highly incensed at this interruption to a vengeance which was so delightful, it was necessary to explain to them on the spot why they were prevented from carrying it further. The consuls assured them that they neither had yielded nor would yield to any man in showing their hatred of the enemy, and as they had been their leaders in the fighting, so they would have been foremost in encouraging their insatiable rage and vengeance. But they had to consider the six hundred equities who were being detained as hostages in Luceria, and to take care that the enemy, despairing of any quarter for themselves, did not wreak their blind rage on their captives, and destroy them before they perish themselves. The soldiers quite approved, and were glad that their indiscriminate fury had been checked. They admitted that they must submit to anything rather than endanger the safety of so many youths belonging to the noblest families in Rome. 15. The soldiers were dismissed to quarters, and a council of war was held to decide whether they should press on the siege of Luceria with their whole force, or whether Publilius with his army should visit the Apulians and ascertain their intentions, about which there was considerable doubt. The latter was decided upon, and the consul succeeded in reducing a considerable number of their towns in one campaign, whilst others were admitted into alliance. Papirius, who had remained behind to prosecute the siege of Luceria, soon found his expectations realized. 
For as all the roads by which supplies could be brought in were blocked, the Samnite garrison in Luceria was so reduced by famine that they sent to the Roman consul an offer to restore the hostages for whose recovery the war had been undertaken, if he would raise the siege. He replied that they ought to have consulted Pontius, at whose instigation they had sent the Romans under the yoke, as to what terms he thought to be imposed on the vanquished. As, however, they preferred that equal terms should be fixed by the enemy rather than proposed by themselves, he told the negotiators to take back word to Luceria that all the arms, baggage, and beasts of burden, together with the non-combatant population, were to be left behind, the soldiers he should send under the yoke, and leave them one garment apiece. And knowing this, he said, he was subjecting them to no novel disgrace, but simply retaliating upon them, one which they had themselves inflicted. They were compelled to accept these terms, and seven thousand men were sent under the yoke. An enormous amount of booty was found in the Syria, all the arms and standards which had been taken at Caudium, and what created the greatest joy of all. They recovered the equities, the hostages whom the Samnites had placed there for security. Hardly any victory that Rome ever won was more noteworthy worthy, for the sudden change that it wrought in the circumstances of the Republic, especially if, as I find stated in some annals, Pontius the son of Herennius, the Samnite captain-general, was sent under the yoke with the rest, to expiate the disgrace he had inflicted on the consuls. I am not, however, so much surprised that uncertainty should exist with regard to this point, as I am that any doubt should be felt as to who really captured Luceria, whether, that is to say, it was Lucius Cornelius acting as dictator, with Lucius Papirius Cursor as master of the horse, who achieved those successes at Caudium and afterwards at Luceria, and as the one man who avenged the stain on Roman honour celebrated what I am inclined to think was, with the exception of that of Furius Camillus, most just earned triumph that any doubt that day had enjoyed, or whether the glory of that distinction should be attributed to the consuls, and especially to Papirius. There is a further mistake here owing to doubts as to whether at the next consular elections Papirius Cursor was re-elected for the third time in consequence of his success at Luceria, together with Quintus Aulius Coritanus for the second time, or whether the name should really be Lucius Papirius Mugellanus. End of section 17. Section 18 of the History of Rome, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.com. Org. The History of Rome, Volume 2, by Livy, translated by William Maspin Roberts. Book 9, Chapters 16 to 22. Chapter 16, Reduction of Satricum. The authorities are agreed that the remainder of the war was conducted by the consuls. Aulius finished the campaign against the Frontanians in one battle. Their routed army fled to their city, and after giving hostages, the consul received their surrender. The other consul was equally fortunate in his campaign against the Satricans. Though admitted to Roman citizenship, they had revolted to the Samnites after the Caudine disaster and allowed them to garrison their city. But when the Roman army was close to their walls, they sent an urgent request, coached in very humble terms, for peace. The consul replied that unless they handed over the Samnite garrison, or put them to death, they were not to go to him again. The severity of this reply created more terror amongst them than the actual presence of the Roman army. They repeatedly asked him by what means he thought that such a small and weak body as they were could attempt to use force against a strong and well-armed garrison. He told them to seek counsel from those through whose advice they had admitted the garrison in the first instance. After having with some difficulty obtained his permission to consult their senate, they returned to the city. There were two parties in the Senate. The leaders of the one were the offers of the revolt from Rome, the other consisted of loyal citizens. 
Both, however, were equally anxious that every effort should be made to induce the consul to grant peace. As the Samnite garrison were not in the least prepared to stand a siege, they intended to evacuate the city the following night. The party who had introduced them thought it would be quite sufficient to let the consul know at what hour and by what gate they would leave. The others who had been all along opposed to their coming actually opened the gate to the consul that very night and admitted his troops into the city. The Samnites were unexpectedly attacked by a force concealed in the woods through which they were marching whilst the shouts of the Romans were resounding in all parts of the city. By this double act of treachery, the Samnites were slain and Satricum captured within the space of one short hour, and the consul became complete master of the situation. He ordered a strict inquiry to be made as to who were responsible for the revolt, and those who were found to be guilty were scourged and beheaded. The Satricans were deprived of their arms, and a strong garrison was placed in the city. The writers who tell us that it was under Papirius that Luceria was recovered, and the Samnites sent under the yoke, go on to inform us that after the capture of Satricum, he returned to Rome to celebrate his triumph. And indeed he was, undoubtedly, a man deserving of all praise for his soldierly qualities, distinguished as he was not only by intellectual force, but also by his physical physical prowess. He was especially noted for his swiftness of foot, which gave him his cognomen. He is stated to have beaten all those of his own age in racing. Owing either to his great strength, or the amount of exercise he took, he had an enormous appetite. Under no commander did either horse or foot find service harder, for he himself never knew what it was to be tired. On one occasion the cavalry ventured to ask him to excuse them some of their fatigue duty in consideration of their having fought a successful action. He replied, "'That you may not say I never excuse you anything, I excuse you from rubbing your horses' backs when you dismount.' He was as much of a martinet to the allies of Rome as he was to his own countrymen. The commander of the Praenestine detachment had shown a lack of courage in bringing his men up from the rear into the fighting line. Papirius, walking in front of his tent, ordered him to be called up, and on his appearance told the lictor to get the axe ready. The Praenestine, on hearing this, stood paralyzed with fear. "'Come, lictor,' said Papirius, "'cut out this route. It is in the way of people as they walk.' After almost frightening him to death with this threat, he dismissed him with a fine. No age has been more prolific in great and noble characters than the one in which he lived, and even in that age there was no one whose single arm did more to sustain the commonwealth. Had Alexander the Great, after subjugating Asia, turned his attention to Europe, there are many who maintain that he would have met his match in Papirius. 17. Comparison of the strength of Rome with that of Macedonia under Alexander the Great. Nothing can be thought to be further from my aim since I commence this task than to digress more than is necessary from the order of the narrative, or by embellishing my work with a variety of topics to afford pleasant resting places, as it were, for my readers, and mental relaxation for myself. The mention, however, of so great a king and commander induces me to lay before my readers some reflections which I have often made when I have proposed to myself the question, what would have been the results for Rome if she had engaged in war with Alexander? The things which tell most in war are the numbers and courage of the troops, the ability of the commanders, and fortune, who has such a potent influence over human affairs, especially those of war. Any one who considers these factors either separately or in combination will easily see that as the Roman Empire proved invincible against other kings and nations, it, so it would have proved invincible against Alexander. Let us, first of all, compare the commanders on each side. I do not dispute that Alexander was an exceptional general, but his reputation is enhanced by the fact that he died while still young and before he had time to experience any change of fortune, not to mention other kings and illustrious captains who afford striking examples of the mutability of human affairs. 
I will only instance Cyrus, whom the Greeks celebrate as one of the greatest of men. What was it that exposed him to reverses and misfortunes but the length of his life, as recently in the case of Pompey the Great? Let me enumerate the Roman generals, not all out of all ages, but only those with whom, as consuls and dictators, Alexander would have had to fight. Marcus Valerius Corvus, Gaius Marcius Rutilus, Gaius Sulpicius, Titus Manlius Torquatus, Quintus Publius Bilo, Lucius Papirius Cursor, Quintus Fabius Maximus, the two Decii, Lucius Voluminius, and Manlius Curius. Following these come those men of colossal mould who would have confronted him if he had first termed his arms against Carthage, and then crossed over into Italy later in life. Every one of these men was Alexander's equal in courage and ability and the art of war, which from the beginning of the city had been an unbroken tradition, had now grown into a science based on definite and permanent rules. It was thus that the kings conducted their wars, and after them the Junii and the Valerii, who expelled the kings, and in later succession the Fabii, the Quinctii, and the Cornelii. It was these rules that Camillus followed, and the men who would have had to fight with Alexander had seen Camillus as an old man when they were little more than boys. Alexander, no doubt, did all that a soldier ought to do in battle, and that is not his least title to fame. But if Manlius Torquatus had been opposed to him in the field, would he have been inferior to him in this respect, or Valerius Corvus, both of them distinguished as soldiers before they assumed command, would the Decii, who, after devoting themselves, rushed upon the enemy, or Papirius Cursor with his vast physical courage and strength? Would the clever generalship of one young man have succeeded in baffling the whole Senate, not to mention individuals, that Senate of which he, who declared that it was composed of kings, alone formed a true idea? Was there any danger of his showing more skill than any of those whom I have mentioned in choosing the site for his camp, or organizing his commissariat, or guarding against surprises, or choosing the right moment for giving battle, or disposing his men in line of battle and posting his reserves to the best advantage, he would have said that it was not with Darius that he had to do, dragging after him a train of women and eunuchs, wrapped up in purple and gold, encumbered with all the trappings of state. He found him an easy prey rather than a formidable enemy, and defeated him without loss, without being called to do anything more daring than to show a just contempt for the idle show of power. The aspect of Italy would have struck him as very different from the India, which he traversed in drunken revelry with an intoxicated army. He would have seen in the passes of Apulia and the mountains of Lucania the traces of the recent disaster which befell his house when his uncle Alexander, king of Epirus, perished. 18. I am speaking of Alexander as he was before he was submerged in the flood of success, for no man was less capable of bearing prosperity than he was. If we look at him as transformed by his new fortunes and presenting the new character, so to speak, which he had assumed after his victories, it is evident that he would have come into Italy more like Darius than Alexander, and would have brought with him an army which had forgotten its native Macedonia and was rapidly becoming Persian in character. It is a disagreeable task in the case of so great a man to have to record his ostentatious love of dress, the prostrations which he demanded from all who approached his presence, and which the Macedonians must have felt to be humiliating, even had they been vanquished, how much more when they were victors, the terribly cruel punishments he inflicted, the murder of his friends at the banquet table, the vanity which made him invent a divine pedigree for himself. What? pray would have happened if his love of wine had become stronger, and his passionate nature more fiery and violent as he grew older. I am only stating facts about which there is no dispute. Are we to regard none of these things as serious drawbacks to his merits as a commander? Or was there any danger of that happening which the most frivolous of the Greeks, who actually extol the Parthians at the expense of the Romans, are so constantly harping upon? 
namely that the Roman people must have bowed before the greatness of Alexander's name, though I do not think they had even heard of him, and that not one out of all the Roman chiefs would have uttered his true sentiments about him, though men dared to attack him in Athens, the very city which had been shattered by Macedonian arms, and almost well in sight of the smoke ruins of Thebes, and the speeches of his assailants are still extant to prove this. However lofty our ideas of this man's greatness, still it is the greatness of one individual, attained in a successful career of little more than ten years. Those who extol it on the ground that though Rome has never lost a war, she has lost many battles, whilst Alexander has never fought a battle unsuccessfully, are not aware that they are comparing the actions of one individual and he a youth with the achievements of a people who have had eight hundred years of war where more generations are reckoned on one side than years on the other can we be surprised that in such a long space of time there have been more changes of fortune than in a period of thirteen years why do you not compare the fortunes of one man with another, of one commander with another? How many Roman generals could I name who have never been unfortunate in a single battle? You may run through page after page of the lists of magistrates, both consuls and dictators, and not find one with whose valour and fortunes the Roman people have ever for a single day had cause to be dissatisfied and these men are more worthy of admiration than alexander or any other king some retained the dictatorship for only ten or twenty days none held a consulship for more than a year the levying of troops was often obstructed by the tribunes of the plebs they were late in consequence in taking the field and were often recalled before the time to conduct the elections frequently when they were commencing some important operation their year of office expired their colleagues frustrated or ruined their plans some through recklessness some through jealousy they often had to succeed to the mistakes or failures of others and take over an army of raw recruits or one in a bad state of discipline kings are free from all hindrances they are lords of time and circumstance and draw all things into the sweep of their own designs thus the invincible alexander would have crossed swords with invincible captains and would have given the same pledges to fortune which they gave nay he would have run greater risks than they for the macedonians had only one alexander who was not only liable to all sorts of accidents, but deliberately exposed himself to them, whilst there were many Romans equal to Alexander in glory and in the grandeur of their deeds, and yet each of them might fulfil his destiny by his life or by his death without imperiling the existence of the state. 19. It remains for us to compare the one army with the other, as regards either the numbers or the quality of the troops, or the strength of the allied forces. Now the census for that period gives 250,000 persons. In all the revolts of the Latin League, ten legions were raised, consisting almost entirely of city troops. Often during those years, four or five armies were engaged simultaneously in Etruria, in Umbria, where they had to meet the Gauls as well, in Samnium, and in Lucania. Then as regards the attitude of the various Italian tribes, the whole of Latium with the Sabines, Volscians, and Equii, the whole of Campania, parts of Umbria and Etruria, the Picentines, the Marsi and Peligni, the Vestinians and Apulians, to which we should add the entire coast of the Western Sea with its Greek population, stretching from Furiae to Neapolis and Cumae, and from there as far as Antium and Ostia, all these nationalities he would have found to be either strong allies of rome or reduced to impotence by roman arms he would have crossed the sea with his macedonian veterans amounting to not more than thirty thousand men and four thousand cavalry mostly thracian this formed all his real strength if he had brought over in addition persians and indians and other orientals he would have found them a hindrance rather than a help we must remember also that the romans had a reserve to draw upon at home but alexander warring on a foreign soil would have found his army diminished by the wastage of war as happened afterwards to hannibal 
His men were armed with round shields and long spears. The Romans had the large shield called the scutum, a better protection for the body, and the javelin, a much more effective weapon than the spear, whether for hurling or thrusting. In both armies the soldiers fought in line rank by rank, but the Macedonian phalanx lacked mobility and formed a single unit. The Roman army was more elastic, made up of numerous divisions which could easily act separately or in combination as required. Then, with regard to fatigue duty, what soldier is better able to stand hard work than the Roman? If Alexander had been worsted in one battle, the war would have been over. What army could have broken the strength of Rome when Caudium and Cannae failed to do so? Even if things had gone well with him at first, he would often have been tempted to wish that Persians and Indians and effeminate Asiatics were his foes, and would have confessed that his former wars had been waged against women, as Alexander of Epirus is reported to have said, when after receiving his mortal wound, he was comparing his own fortune with that of this very youth in his Asiatic campaigns. When I remember that in the first Punic War we fought at sea for twenty-four years, I think that Alexander would hardly have lived long enough to see one war through. It is quite possible, too, that as Rome and Carthage were at the time leagued together by an old standing treaty, the same apprehensions might have led those two powerful states to take up arms against the common foe, and Alexander would have been crushed by their combined forces. Rome has had experience of a Macedonian war, not indeed when Alexander was commanding, nor when the resources of Macedon were still unimpaired, but the contests against Antiochus, Philip, and Perses were fought not only without loss, but even without risk. I trust that I shall not give offence when I say that, leaving out of sight the civil wars, we have never found an enemy's cavalry or infantry too much for us, when we have fought in the open field, on ground equally favourable for both sides, still less when the ground has given us an advantage. The infantry soldier with his heavy armour and weapons may reasonably fear the arrows of Parthian cavalry, or passes invested by the enemy, or country where supplies cannot be brought up, but he has repulsed a thousand armies more formidable than those of Alexander and his Macedonians, and will repulse them in the future if only the domestic peace and concord which we now enjoy remains undisturbed for all the years to come. 20. Marcus Faustius Flacina and Lucius Plautius Vidox were the next consuls. In this year, several communities amongst the Samnites made overtures for a fresh treaty. These deputations, when admitted to an audience, prostrated themselves on the ground, and their humble attitude influenced the Senate in their favour. Their prayers, however, were by no means so efficacious with the assembly to which they had been referred by the Senate. Their request for a treaty was refused, but after they had spent several days in appealing to individual citizens, they succeeded in obtaining a two years' truce. In Apulia, too, the people of Tianum and Canusium, tired of the constant ravages which they had suffered, gave hostages and surrendered to the consul Lucius. Plautius. It was in this year also that prefixes were first appointed for Capua, and a code of laws given to that city by the praetor Lucius Furius. Both these boons were granted in response to a request from the Campanians themselves as a remedy for the deplorable state of things brought about by civic discord. Two new tribes were formed, the Ufentine and the Falernian. As the power of Apulia was declining, the people of Tieti came to the new consuls Gaius Junius Bubulcus and Quintus Aemilius Barbula to negotiate for a treaty. They gave a formal undertaking that throughout Apulia peace would be maintained towards Rome, and the confident assurances they gave led to a treaty being granted, not, however, as between two independent states, they were to acknowledge the suzerainty of Rome. After the subjugation of Apulia, 
for Forentum, also a place of considerable strength, had been captured by Junius, an advance was made into Lucania, and the consul Amelius surprised and captured the city of Nerulum. The order introduced into Capua by the adoption of Roman institutions had become generally known amongst the states in alliance with Rome, and the entities asked for the same privilege as they were without a fixed code of law or any regular magistrates of their own. The patrons of the colony were commissioned by the Senate to draw out a system of jurisprudence. Not only the arms of Rome, but her laws, were spreading far and wide. 21. At the termination of their year of office, the consuls did not hand the legions over to their successors, Spurius Nautius and Marcus Popilius, but to the dictator, Lucius Aemilius. In conjunction with Marcus Fulvius, the master of the horse, he commenced an attack on Satacula, and the Samnites at once seized this opportunity to renew hostilities. The Romans were threatened by a double danger. The Samnites, after getting a large army together, had entrenched themselves not far from the Roman camp in order to relieve their blockaded allies, whilst the Satuculans suddenly flung their gates open and made a tumultuous attack on the Roman outposts. The two bodies of combatants, each relying more on the help of the other than on its own strength, united in a regular attack on the Roman camp. Though both sides of the camp were attacked, the dictator kept his men free from panic, owing to his having selected a position which could not easily be turned, and also because his men presented two fronts. He directed his efforts mainly against those who had made the sortie, and drove them back, without much trouble, behind their walls. Then he turned his whole strength against the Samnites. Here the fighting was more sustained, and the victory was longer in coming, but when it did come it was decisive. The Samnites were driven in disorder to their camp, and after extinguishing all the camp fires they departed silently in the night, having abandoned all hope of saving Saticula. By way of retaliation, they invested Plistica, a city in alliance with Rome. 22. The year having expired, the war was thenceforward carried on by the dictator Quintus Fabius, whilst the new consuls, like their predecessors, remained in Rome. Fabius marched with reinforcements to Saticula to take over the army from Amelius. The Samnites did not remain before Plistica. They had called up fresh troops from home, and trusting to their numbers, they fixed their camp on the same ground as in the previous year, and endeavored to distract the Romans from their siege operations by a series of harassing attacks. This made the dictator all the more determined to press the siege, as he considered that the reduction of the place would largely affect the character of the war. He treated the Samnites with comparative indifference, and merely strengthened the pickets on that side of the camp to meet any attack that might be made. This emboldened the Samnites. They rode up to the rampart day after day and allowed the Romans no rest. At last they almost got within the gates of the camp, when Quintus Aulius, the master of the horse, without consulting the dictator, charged them furiously from the camp with the whole of his cavalry and drove them off. Though this was only a desultory conflict, fortune influenced it so largely that she inflicted a signal loss on both sides and brought about the deaths of both commanders. First, the Samnite general, indignant at being repulsed and put to flight from the ground over which he had ridden with such confidence, induced his cavalry by entreaties and encouragement to renew the combat. Whilst he was conspicuous amongst them as he urged on the fighting, the master of the horse levelled his lance and spurred his horse against him with such force that with one thrust he hurled him from his saddle dead. His men were not, as often happens, dismayed at their leader's fall. All who were around him flung their missiles on Aulius, who had incautiously ridden on amongst them, but they allowed the dead general's brother to have the special glory of avenging his death. In a frenzy of grief and rage, he dragged the master of the horse out of his saddle and slew him. The Samnites, amongst whom he had fallen, would have secured the body had not the Romans suddenly leaped from their horses, on which the Samnites were obliged to do the same. 
A fierce infantry fight raged round the bodies of the two generals in which the Roman was decidedly superior, the body of Aulius was rescued, and amidst mingled demonstrations of grief and joy, the victors carried it into camp. After losing their leader and seeing the unfavourable result of the trial of strength in the cavalry action, the Samnites considered it useless to make any further efforts on behalf of Saticula and resumed the siege of Plistica. A few days later, Saticula surrendered to the Romans, and Plistica was carried by assault by the Samnites. End of section 18section 19 of the history of rome volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the history of rome volume 2 by livy translated by william maspin roberts book 9 chapters 23 to 28 Chapter 23 Fighting Round Sora The seat of war was now changed. The legions were marched from Samnium and Apulia to Sora. This place had revolted to the Samnites after putting the Roman colonists to death. The Roman army marched thither with all speed to avenge the death of their countrymen and to re-establish the colony. No sooner had they arrived before the place than the reconnaitring parties who had been watching the different routes brought in reports one after another that the Samnites were following and were now at no great distance. The consul marched to meet the enemy, and an indecisive action was fought at Latuli. The battle was put a stop to, not by the losses or flight of either side, but by night, which overtook the combatants while still uncertain whether they were victors or vanquished. I find in some authorities that this battle was unfavourable to the Romans, and that Quintus Aulius, the master of the horse, fell there. Gaius Fabius was appointed master of the horse in his place, and came with a fresh army from Rome. He sent orderlies in advance to consult the dictator as to where he should take up his position, and also as to the time and mode of attacking the enemy. After becoming thoroughly acquainted with the dictator's plans, he halted his army in a place where he was well concealed. The dictator kept his men for some days confined to their camp, as though he were enduring a siege rather than conducting one. At last he suddenly displayed the signal for battle, thinking that brave men were more likely to have their courage stimulated when all their hopes depended upon themselves, he kept the arrival of the master of the horse and the fresh army concealed from his soldiers, and as though all their prospects of safety depended upon their cutting their way out, he said to his men, We have been caught in a position where we are shut in, and we have no way out unless we can open one by our victorious swords. Our standing camp is sufficiently protected by its entrenchments, but it is untenable owing to want of provisions. All the places from which supplies could be obtained have revolted, and even if the people were willing to help us, the country is impassable for convoys. I shall not cheat your courage by leaving a camp here into which you can retire, as you did on the last occasion, without winning the victory. Entrenchments are to be protected by arms, not arms by entrenchments. Let those who think it worth their while to prolong the war hold their camp as a place of retreat, we must have regard to nothing but victory. Advance the standards against the enemy, and when the column is clear of the camp, those who have been told off for the purpose will set it on fire. What you lose, soldiers, will be made up to you in the plunder of all the surrounding cities which have revolted. The dictator's words, pointing to the dire necessity to which they were reduced, produced intense excitement, and rendered desperate by the sight of the burning camp, although the dictator had only ordered some spots nearest to them to be set on fire, they charged like madmen, and at the first onset threw the enemy into confusion. At the same moment the master of the horse, seeing the burning camp in the distance, the agreed signal, attacked the enemy in the rear. 
Thus hemmed in, the Samnites fled in all directions, each as best he could. A vast number, who had crowded together in their panic, and were so close to one another that they could not use their weapons, were killed between the two armies. The enemy's camp was captured and plundered, and the soldiers, loaded with spoil, were marched back to their own camp. Even their victory did not give them so much pleasure as the discovery that with the exception of a small part spoilt by fire, their camp was unexpectedly safe. 24. They then returned to Sora, and the new consuls, Marcus Potilius and Gaius Sulpicius, took over the army from the dictator Fabius, after a large proportion of the veterans had been sent home, and new cohorts brought up as reinforcements. Owing, however, to the difficulties presented by the position of the city, no definite plan of attack was yet formed. A long time would be needed to reduce it by famine, and to attempt to storm it would involve considerable risk. In the midst of this uncertainty, a soren deserter left the town secretly, and made his way to the Roman sentinels, whom he requested to conduct him at once to the consuls. On being brought before them, he undertook to betray the place into their hands. When questioned as to the means by which he would carry out his undertaking, he laid his proposals before them, and they appeared quite feasible. He advised them to remove their camp, which was almost adjoining the walls, to a distance of six miles from the town. This would lead to less vigilance on the part of those who were on outpost duty during the day and sentry duty at night. The following night, after some cohorts had been ordered to conceal themselves in some wooded spots close under the town, he conducted a picked body of ten men by a steep and almost inaccessible path into the citadel. Here a quantity of missile weapons had been collected, far more than would be required for the men who had been brought there, and in addition there were large stones, some lying about as is usual in craggy places, others piled in heaps by the townsmen to use for the defense of the place. When he had posted the Romans here and had pointed out to them a steep and narrow path leading up from the town, he said to them, From this ascent even three armed men could keep back a multitude however large. You are ten in number, and what is more you are Romans and the bravest of them. You have the advantage of position and you will be helped by the night, which by its obscurity makes everything look more terrible. I will now spread panic everywhere. You devote yourselves to holding the citadel. Then he ran down and created as great a tumult as he possibly could, shouting, To arms, citizens, help, help! The citadel has been seized by the enemy. Hasten to its defense. He kept up the alarm as he knocked at the doors of the principal men. He shouted it in the ears of all whom he met, of all who rushed out, terror-struck into the streets. The panic which one man had started was carried by numbers through the city. The magistrates hurriedly sent men up to the citadel to find out what had happened, and when they heard that it was held by an armed force, whose numbers were grossly exaggerated, they gave up all hopes of recovering it. All quarters of the city were filled with fugitives, the gates were burst open by people who were only half awake and mostly without arms, and through one of these the Roman cohorts, roused by the shouting, rushed in and slew the frightened crowds who were thronging the streets. Sor was already captured when, in the early dawn, the consuls appeared and accepted the surrender of those whom fortune had spared from the nocturnal massacre. Amongst these, two hundred and twenty-five were sent in chains to Rome as they were universally admitted to have been the instigators of the murder of the colonists and the revolt which followed. The rest of the population were left uninjured, and a garrison was stationed in the town. All those taken to Rome were scourged and beheaded to the great satisfaction of the plebs, who felt it to be a matter of supreme importance that those who had been sent out in such large numbers as colonists should be safe wherever they were. 25. Suppression of Movements in Ausonia, Campania, and Apulia after leaving Sora, the consuls extended the war to the cities and fields of Ausonia. 
for the whole country had become restless, owing to the presence of the Samnites after the Battle of La Tuli. Plots were being hatched everywhere throughout Campania, even Capua was not free from disaffection, and it was found upon investigation that the movement had actually reached some of the principal men in Rome. It was, however, as in the case of Sora, through the betrayal of her cities, that Ausonia fell under the power of Rome. There were three cities, Ossina, Menturni, and Vescia, which some twelve young men belonging to the principal families there had mutually agreed to betray to the Romans. They came to the consuls and informed them that their people had long been looking forward to the arrival of the Samnites, and after they had heard of the Battle of Latuli, they looked upon the Romans as vanquished, and many of the younger men had volunteered to serve with the Samnites. After the Samnites, however, had been driven out of their country, they were wavering between peace and war, afraid to close their gates to the Romans lest they should provoke a war, and yet determined to close them if a Roman army approached their city. In this state of indecision they would fall an easy prey. Acting on their advice, the Romans moved their camp into the neighborhood of these cities, and at the same time soldiers were dispatched, some fully armed, to occupy concealed positions near the walls. Others in ordinary dress, with swords hidden under their togas, were to enter the cities through the open gates at the approach of daylight. As soon as the latter began to attack the guards, the signal was given for the others to rush from their ambush. Thus the gates were secured, and the three towns were captured at the same time and by the same stratagem. As the generals were not there to direct the attack, there was no check upon the carnage which ensued, and the nation of the Ausonians was exterminated, just as if they had been engaged in an internecine war though there was no certain proof of their having revolted. 26. During this year the Roman garrison at Luceria was treacherously betrayed, and the Samnites became masters of the place. The traitors did not go long unpunished. A Roman army was not far away, and the city, which lay in a plain, was taken at the first assault. The Lucerines and Samnites were put to death, no quarter being given, and such deep indignation was felt at Rome that when the question of sending fresh colonists to Luceria was under discussion in the Senate, many voted for the complete destruction of the city. Not only the bitter feeling towards a people who had been twice subdued, but also the distance from Rome made them shrink from banishing their countrymen so far from home. However, the proposal to dispatch colonists was adopted. 2,500 were sent. Prosecutions for Treason Whilst disloyalty was thus manifesting itself everywhere, Capua also became the centre of intrigues amongst some of her principal men. When the matter came up in the Senate, there was a general feeling that it ought to be dealt with at once. A decree was passed authorizing the immediate opening of a court of inquiry, and Gaius Manius was nominated dictator to conduct the proceedings. Marcus Foslius was appointed master of the horse. The greatest alarm was created by this step, and the Calavii Ovius and Novius, who had been the ringleaders, did not wait to be denounced to the dictator, but placed themselves beyond the reach of a prosecution by what was undoubtedly a self-inflicted death. As there was no longer any matter for investigation at Capua, the inquiry was directed to those who were suspected in Rome. The decree was interpreted as authorizing an inquiry, not in regard to Capua especially, but generally in respect of all who had formed cabals and conspiracies against the Republic, including the secret leagues entered into by candidates for office. The inquiry began to embrace a wider scope both with respect to the nature of the alleged offenses and the persons affected, and the dictator insisted that the authority vested in him as criminal judge was unlimited. Men of high family were indicted, and no one was allowed to appeal to the tribunes to arrest proceedings. 
when matters had gone thus far, the nobility, not only those against whom information was being laid, but the order as a whole, protested that the charge did not lie on the patricians, to whom the path to honours always lay open, unless it was obstructed by intrigue, but on the novi homines. They even asserted that the dictator and the master of the horse were more fit to be put upon their trial than to act as inquisitors in cases where this charge was brought, and they would find that out as soon as they had vacated their office. Under these circumstances, Manius, more anxious to clear his reputation than to retain his office, came forward in the assembly and addressed it in the following terms. You are all cognizant, queerities, of what my life has been in the past, and this very office which has been conferred upon me is a testimony to my innocence. There are men amongst the nobility, as to their motives it is better that you should form your own opinion than that I, holding the office I do, should say anything without proof, who tried their utmost to stifle this inquiry. When they found themselves powerless to do this, they sought to shelter themselves, patricians though they were, behind the stronghold of their opponents, the tribunician veto, so as to escape from trial. At last, driven from that position, and thinking any course safer than that of trying to prove their innocence, they have directed their assaults against us and private citizens have not been ashamed to demand the impeachment of the dictator now that gods and men alike may know that in trying to avoid giving an account of themselves these men are attempting the impossible and that i am prepared to answer any charge and meet my accusers face to face i at once resign my dictatorship and if the senate should assign the task to you consuls i beg that you will begin with marcus Fosslius and myself so that it may be conclusively shown that we are protected from such charges not by our official position but by our innocence he then at once laid down his office followed by the master of the horse they were the first to be tried before the consuls for so the senate ordered and as the evidence given by the nobles against them completely broke down they were triumphantly acquitted even Publius Philo, a man who had repeatedly filled the highest offices as a reward for his services at home and in the field, but who was disliked by the nobility, was put on his trial and acquitted. As usual, however, it was only whilst this inquisition was a novelty that it had strength enough to attack illustrious names. It soon began to stoop to humbler victims, until it was at length stifled by the very cabals and factions which it had been instituted to suppress. 27. Defeat of the Samnites in Campania the rumour of these proceedings, and still more the expectation of a Campanian revolt, which had already been secretly organised, recalled the Samnites from their designs in Apulia. They marched to Caudium, which from its proximity to Capua would make it easy for them, if the opportunity offered, to wrest that city from the Romans. The consuls marched to Caudium with a strong force. For some time both armies remained in their positions on either side of the pass, as they could only reach each other by a most difficult route. At length the Samnites descended by a short detour through the open country into the flat district of Campania, and there for the first time they came within sight of each other's camp. There were frequent skirmishes, in which the cavalry played a greater part than the infantry, and the Romans had no cause to be dissatisfied with these trials of strength, nor with the delay which was prolonging the war. The Samnite generals, on the other hand, saw that these daily encounters involved daily losses, and that the prolongation of the war was sapping their strength. They decided, therefore, to bring on an action. They posted their cavalry on the two flanks of their army with instructions to keep their attention on the camp in case it were attacked, rather than on the battle, which would be safe in the hands of the infantry. On the other side, the consul Sulpicius directed the right wing, Potilius the left. 
The Roman right was drawn up in more open order than usual, as the Samnites opposed to them were standing in thinly extended ranks in order either to surround the enemy or to prevent themselves from being surrounded. The left, which was in a much closer formation, was further strengthened by a rapid maneuver of Potilius, who suddenly brought up into the fighting line the cohorts, which were usually kept in reserve in case the battle was prolonged. He then charged the enemy with his full strength. As the Samnite infantry were shaken by the weight of the attack, their cavalry came to their support, and riding obliquely between the two armies, were met by the Roman cavalry, who charged them at a hard gallop, and threw infantry and cavalry alike into confusion, until they had forced back the whole line in this part of the field. Sulpicius was taking his part, with Potilius in encouraging the men in this division, for on hearing the battle shout raised, he had ridden across from his own division, which was not yet engaged. Seeing that the victory was no longer doubtful, here he rode back to his post with his 1,200 cavalry, but he found a very difficult condition of things there. The Romans had been driven from their ground, and the victorious enemy were pressing them hard. The presence of the consul produced a sudden and complete change. The courage of the men revived at the sight of their general, and the cavalry whom he had brought up rendered an assistance out of all proportion to their numbers. Whilst the sound followed soon by the sight of the success on the other wing, reanimated the combatants to redouble their exertions. From this moment the Romans were victorious along the whole line, and the Samnites abandoning all further resistance were all killed or taken prisoners, with the exception of those who succeeded in escaping to Maleventum, now called Beneventum. Their loss in prisoners and slain is stated by the chroniclers to have amounted to 30,000. 28. Further Operations Against the Samnites After this great victory, the consuls advanced to Bovianum, which they proceeded to invest. They remained there in winter quarters until Gaius Potilius, who had been named dictator with Marcus Faustius as master of the horse, took over the army from the new consuls, Lucius Papirius Cursor, consul for the fifth time, and Gaius Junius Bubulcus for the second time. On learning that the citadel of Fregulae had been captured by the Samnites, he raised the siege of Bovianum and marched to Fregulae. The place was retaken without fighting, for the Samnites evacuated it in the night, and after leaving a strong garrison there, the dictator returned to Campania with the main object of recovering Nola. At his approach, the whole of the Samnite population and the native peasantry retired within the walls. After examining the position of the city, he gave orders for all the buildings outside the wall, and there was a considerable population in the suburbs, to be destroyed in order to render the approach easier. Not long afterwards, Nola was taken, either by the dictator or by the consul Gaius Junius, for both accounts are given. Those who give the credit of the capture to the consul state that Atina and Calatia were also taken by him, and they explain the appointment of Potilius by saying that he was nominated dictator for the purpose of driving in the nail on the outbreak of an epidemic. Colonies were sent out this year to Susa and Pontia. Susa had belonged to the Aruncans, and the island of Pontia had been inhabited by the Volscians as it lay off their coast. The Senate also authorized the settlement of a colony at Interimna on the Cassinus, but it fell to the succeeding consuls Marcus Valerius and Publius Decius to appoint the commissioners and send out the colonists to the number of 4,000. End of section 19. Section 20 of the History of Rome, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Rome, Volume 2, by Livy, translated by William Maston Roberts. Book 9, Chapters 29 to 37. Chapter 29, 
the censorship of Appius Claudius. The Samnite War was now drawing to a close, but before the Senate could dismiss it entirely from their thoughts, there was a rumor of war on the side of Etruria. With the one exception of the Gauls, no nation was more dreaded at that time, owing to their proximity to Rome and their vast population. One of the consuls remained in Samnium to finish the war, and the other, Publius Decius, was detained in Rome by a serious illness, and on instructions from the Senate, nominated Gaius Junius Bubulcus dictator. In view of the seriousness of the emergency, the dictator compelled all who were liable for service to take the military oath, and used his utmost endeavors to have arms and whatever else was required in readiness. Notwithstanding the great preparations he was making, he had no intention of assuming the aggressive, and had quite made up his mind to wait until the Etruscans made the first move. The Etruscans were equally energetic in their preparations, and equally reluctant to commence hostilities. Neither side went outside their own frontiers. This year, 312 BC, was signalized by the censorship of Appius Claudius. His claim to distinction with posterity rests mainly upon his public works, the road and the aqueduct, which bear his name. He carried out these undertakings single-handed, for, owing to the odium he incurred by the way he revised the senatorial lists and filled up the vacancies, his colleague, thoroughly ashamed of his conduct, resigned. In the obstinate temper which had always marked his house, Appius continued to hold office alone. It was owing to his action that the Potitiae, whose family had always possessed the right of ministering at the Ava Maxima of Hercules, transferred that duty to some temple servants, whom they had instructed in the various observances. There is a strange tradition connected with this, and one well calculated to create religious scruples in the minds of any who would disturb the established order of ceremonial usages. It is said that, though when the change was made there were twelve branches of the family of the Potitiae, comprising thirty adults, not one member, old or young, was alive twelve months later. Nor was the extinction of the Potitian name the only consequence. Appius himself, some years afterwards, was struck with blindness by the unforgetting wrath of the gods. Thirty. The consuls for the following year were Gaius Junius Bubulcus, for the third time, and Quintus Aemilius Barbula, for the second time. At the beginning of their year of office they laid a complaint before the assembly, touching the unscrupulous way in which vacancies in the Senate had been filled up, men having been passed over who were far superior to some who had been selected whereby the whole senatorial order had been sullied and disgraced. They declared that the selection had been made solely with a view to popularity and out of sheer caprice, and that no regard whatever had been paid to the good or bad characters of those chosen. They then gave out that they should ignore them altogether, and at once proceed to call over the names of the senators as they appeared on the roll before Appius Claudius and Gaius Plautius were made censors. Two official posts were, for the first time this year, placed at the disposal of the people, both of a military character. One was the office of military tribune. Sixteen were henceforth appointed by the people for the four legions. These had hitherto been selected by the dictators and consuls, very few places being left to the popular vote. Lucius Attilius and Gaius Marcius, tribunes of the plebs, were responsible for that measure. The other was the post of naval commissioner. The people were to appoint two to superintend the equipment and refitting of the fleet. This provision was due to Marcus Decius, a tribune of the plebs. An incident of a somewhat trifling character occurred this year, 
which I should have passed over did it not appear to be connected with religious customs. The Guild of Flute Players had been forbidden by the censors to hold their annual banquet in the Temple of Jupiter, a privilege they had enjoyed from ancient times. Hugely disgusted, they went off in a body to Tiber, and not one was left in the city to perform at the sacrificial rites. The Senate were alarmed at the prospect of the various religious ceremonies being thus shorn of their due ritual, and they sent envoys to Tiber, who were to make it their business to see that the Romans got these men back again. The Tibertines promised to do their best, and invited the musicians into the Senate House, where they were strongly urged to return to Rome. As they could not be persuaded to do so, the Tibertines adopted a ruse quite appropriate to the character of the men they were dealing with. It was a feast day, and they were invited to various houses, ostensibly to supply music at the banquets. Like the rest of their class, they were fond of wine, and they were plied with it till they drank themselves into a state of torpor. In this condition they were thrown into wagons and carried off to Rome. They were left in the wagons all night in the forum, and did not recover their senses till daylight surprised them, still suffering from the effect of their debauch. The people crowded round them and succeeded in inducing them to stay, and they were granted the privilege of going about the city for three days every year, and their long dresses and masks, with singing and mirth, a custom which is still observed. Those members of the guild who played on solemn occasions in the Temple of Jupiter had the right restored to them of holding their banquets there. These incidents occurred while the public attention was fixed on two most serious wars. 31. Further Successes in Samnium The consuls drew lots for their respective commands, the Samnites fell to Junius, the new theatre of war in Etruria to Aemilius. The Roman garrison of Cluvia and Samnium, after being unsuccessfully attacked, were starved into surrender and were then massacred after being cruelly mangled by the scourge. Enraged at this brutality, Junius felt that the first thing to be done was to attack Cluvia, and on the very day he arrived before the place, he took it by storm and put all the adult males to death. Thence his conquering army marched to Bovianum. This was the chief city of the Pentrian Samnites, and by far the wealthiest and best supplied with arms. There was not the same cause for resentment here as at Cluvia. The soldiers were mainly animated by the prospect of plunder, and on the capture of the place the enemy were treated with less severity. But there was almost more booty collected there than from all the rest of Samnium, and the whole of it was generously given up to the soldiers. Now that nothing could withstand the overwhelming might of Roman arms, neither armies nor camps nor cities, the one idea in the minds of all the Samnite leaders was to choose some position from which Roman troops, when scattered on their foraging expeditions, might be caught and surrounded. Some peasants who pretended to be deserters, and some who had, either deliberately or by accident, been made prisoners, came to the consuls with a story in which they all agreed, and which really was true, namely, that an immense quantity of cattle had been driven into a pathless forest. The consuls were induced by this story to send the legions, with nothing but their kits to encumber them, in the direction the cattle had taken, to secure them. A very strong body of the enemy were concealed on either side of the road, and when they saw that the Romans had entered the forest, they suddenly raised a shout and made a tumultuous attack upon them. The suddenness of the affair at first created some confusion, while the men were piling their kits in the centre of the column and getting at their weapons, but as soon as they had each freed themselves from their burdens and put themselves in fighting trim, they began to assemble round the standards. From their old discipline and long experience they knew their places in the ranks, and the line was formed without any orders being needed, each man acting on his own initiative. 
the consul rode up to the part where the fighting was hottest, and, leaping off his horse, called Jupiter, Mars, and other gods to witness that he had not gone into that place in quest of any glory for himself, but solely to provide booty for his soldiers, nor could any other fault be found with him except that he had been too anxious to enrich his men at the expense of the enemy. From that disgrace nothing would clear him but the courage of his men. Only they must one and all make a determined attack. The enemy had been already worsted in the field, stripped of his camp, deprived of his cities, and was now trying the last chance by lurking secretly in ambush and trusting to his ground, not to his arms. What ground was too difficult for Roman courage? He reminded them of the citadels of Fregoli and of Sora, and of the successes they had everywhere met with when the nature of the ground was all against them. Fired by his words, his men, oblivious of all difficulties, went straight at the hostile line above them. Some exertion was needed while the column were climbing up the face of the hill, but when once the leading standards had secured a footing on the summit, and the army found that it was on favourable ground, it was the enemy's turn to be dismayed. They flung away their arms, and in wild flight made for the lurking places in which they had shortly before concealed themselves. But the place which they had selected as presenting most difficulty to the enemy now became a trap for themselves and impeded them in every way very few were able to escape as many as twenty thousand men were killed and the victorious romans dispersed in different directions to secure the cattle of which the enemy had made them a present thirty two war with etruria during these occurrences in Samnium, the whole of the cities of Etruria, with the exception of Eretium, had taken up arms and commenced what proved to be a serious war by an attack on Sutrium. This city was in alliance with Rome, and served as a barrier on the side of Etruria. Aemilius marched thither to raise the siege, and selected a site before the city where he entrenched himself. His camp was plentifully supplied with provisions from Sutrium. The Etruscans spent the day after his arrival in discussing whether they should bring on an immediate engagement or protract the war. The generals decided upon the more energetic course as the safer one, and the next day at sunrise the signal for battle was displayed and the troops marched into the field. As soon as this was reported to the consul, he ordered the tessera to be given out, instructing the men to take their breakfast, and after they were strengthened by food, to arm themselves for battle. When he saw that they were in complete readiness, he ordered the standards to go forward, and after the army had emerged from the camp, he formed his battle line not far from the enemy. For some time both sides stood in expectation, each waiting for the other to raise the battle shout and begin the fighting. The sun passed the meridian before a single missile was discharged on either side. At length the Etruscans, not caring to leave the field without securing some success, raised the battle shout, the trumpet sounded and the standards advanced. The Romans showed no less eagerness to engage. They closed with each other in deadly earnest. The Etruscans had the advantage in numbers, the Romans in courage. The contest was equally maintained and cost many lives, including the bravest on both sides, nor did either army show any signs of giving way until the second Roman line came up fresh into the place of the first, who were wearied and exhausted. The Etruscans had no reserves to support their first line, and all fell in front of their standards or around them. No battle would have witnessed fewer fugitives or involved greater carnage had not the Tuscans, who had made up their minds to die, found protection in the approach of night, so that the victors were the first to desist from fighting. After sunset the signal was given to retire, and both armies returned in the night to their respective camps. Nothing further worth mention took place that year at Sutrium. 
The enemy had lost the whole of their first line in a single battle, and had only their reserves left, who were hardly sufficient to protect their camp. Amongst the Romans there were so many wounded, that those who left the field disabled were more numerous than those who had fallen in the battle. 33. Appius Claudius prolongs his censorship in defiance of the law. The consuls for the following year were Quintus Fabius and Gaius Marcius Rutilus. Fabius took over the command at Sutrium and brought reinforcements from Rome. A fresh army was also raised in Etruria and sent to support the besiegers. Very many years had elapsed since there had been any contests between the patrician magistrates and the tribunes of the plebs. Now, however, a dispute arose through that family which seemed marked out by destiny to be the cause of quarrels with the plebs and its tribunes. Appius Claudius had now been censor eighteen months, a period fixed by the Aemilian law for the duration of that office. In spite of the fact that his colleague, Gaius Plautius had resigned, he could under no circumstances whatever be induced to vacate his office. Publius Sempronius was the tribune of the plebs who commenced an action for limiting his censorship to the legal period. In taking this step, he was acting in the interests of justice quite as much as in the interests of the people, and he carried the sympathies of the aristocracy no less than he had the support of the masses. He recited the several provisions of the Aemilian law, and extolled its offer, Mamercus Aemilius the dictator, for having shortened the censorship. Formerly, he reminded his hearers, it was held for five years, a time long enough to make it tyrannical and despotic. Aemilius limited it to eighteen months. Then, turning to Appius, he asked him, "'Pray tell me, Appius, what would you have done had you been censor at the time that Gaius Furius and Marcus Giganius were censors? Appius Claudius replied that the tribune's question had not much bearing on his case. He argued that though the law might be binding in the case of those censors during whose period of office it was passed, because it was after they had been appointed that the people ordered the measure to become law, and the last order of the people was law for the time being, Nevertheless, neither he nor any of the censors subsequently appointed could be bound by it, because all succeeding censors had been appointed by the order of the people, and the last order of the people was the law for the time being. 34. This quibble on the part of Appius convinced no one. Sempronius then addressed the assembly in the following language. Quirites, here you have the progeny of that Appius who, after being appointed December for one year, appointed himself for a second year, and then, without going through any form of appointment either at his own hands or at any one else's, retained the fasces in the supreme authority for a third year, and persisted in retaining them until the power which he gained by foul means, exercised by foul means, and retained by foul means, proved his ruin. This is the family, Quirites, by whose violence and lawlessness you were driven out of your city, and compelled to occupy the sacred mount, the family against which you won the protection of your tribunes, the family on whose account you took up your position in two armies on the Aventine. It is this family which has always opposed the laws against usury and the agrarian laws, which interfered with the right of intermarriage between patricians and plebeians, which blocked the path of the plebs to curial offices. This name is much more deadly to your liberties than the name of the Tarquins. Is it really the case, Appius Claudius, that though it is a hundred years since Mamercus Aemilius was dictator, and there have been all those censors since? Men of the highest rank and strength of character, not one of them ever read the twelve tables, not one of them knew that the last order of the people is the law for the time being. Of course they all knew it, and because they knew it they preferred to obey the Emilian law rather than that older one by which the censors were originally appointed, simply because the former was the law passed by order of the people, and also because when two laws contradict each other, the latter one repeals the earlier. 
Do you maintain, Appius, that the people are not bound by the Amelian law, or do you claim, if they are bound by it, that you alone are exempt from its provisions? That law availed to bind those arbitrary censors, Gaius Furius and Marcus Giganius, who gave us a proof of the mischief which that office could work in the Republic when, in revenge for the limitation of their power, they placed amongst the Aurarii, the foremost soldier and statesman of his time, America Aemilius. It bound all the succeeding censors for a hundred years. It binds your colleague Gaius Plautius, who was appointed under the same auspices, with the same powers as yourself, that the people appoint him with all the customary powers and privileges that a censor can possess, or are you the solitary exception in whom all these powers and privileges reside? Whom then can you appoint as king for sacrifices? He will cling to the name of king and say that he was appointed with all the powers that the kings of Rome possessed. Who do you suppose would be contented with a six months dictatorship or a five days interregnum? Whom would you venture to nominate as dictator for the purpose of driving in the nail or presiding at the games? How stupid and spiritless, Quirites, you must consider those men to have been who after their magnificent achievements resigned their dictatorship in twenty days or vacated their office owing to some flaw in their appointment. But why should I recall instances of old time? It is not ten years since Gaius Manius as dictator was conducting a criminal process with a rigour which some powerful people considered dangerous to themselves, and in consequence his enemies charged him with being tainted with the very crime he was investigating. He at once resigned his dictatorship in order to meet, as a private citizen, the charges brought against him. I am not far from wishing to see such moderation in you, Appius. Do not show yourself a degenerate scion of your house. Do not fall short of your ancestors and their craving for power, their love of tyranny. Do not vacate your office a day or an hour sooner than you are obliged. Only see that you do not exceed the fixed term. Perhaps you will be satisfied with an additional day or an additional month. No, he says, I shall hold my censorship for three years and a half beyond the period fixed by the Emilian law, and I shall hold it alone. This sounds very much like an absolute monarch. Or will you co-opt a colleague, a proceeding forbidden by divine laws, even where one has been lost by death? There is a sacred function going back to the very earliest times, the only one actually initiated by the deity in whose honor it is performed, which has always been discharged by men of the highest rank and most blameless character. You, conscientious censor that you are, have transferred this ministry to servants, and a house older than this city, hollowed by the hospitality they showed to immortal gods, has become extinct in one short year owing to you and your censorship. But this is not enough for you. You will not rest till you have involved the whole commonwealth in a sacrilege, the consequences of which I dare not contemplate. The capture of this city occurred in that lustrum in which the censor, Lucius Papirius Cursor, after the death of his colleague, Gaius Julius, co-opted as his colleague, Marcus Cornelius Aluginensis, sooner than abdicate his office. And yet how much more moderation did he show even then than you, Appius? He did not continue to hold his censorship alone, nor beyond the legal term. Lucius Papirius did not, however, find any one to follow his example. All succeeding censors resigned office on the death of their colleague. But nothing restrains you, neither the expiry of your term of office, nor the resignation of your colleague, nor the law, nor any feelings of self-respect. You consider it a merit to show arrogance, effrontery, contempt of gods and men. When I consider the majesty and reverence which surround the office that you have held, Appius Claudius, I am most reluctant to subject you to personal restraint, or even to address you in severe terms. But your obstinacy and arrogance have compelled me to speak as I have done, and now I warn you that if you do not comply with the Emilian law, I shall order you to be taken to prison. Our ancestors made it a rule that if at the election of censors two candidates did not get the requisite majority of votes, one should not be returned alone, but the election should be adjourned. Under this rule, as you cannot be appointed sole censor, 
I will not allow you to remain in office alone. He then ordered the censor to be arrested and taken to prison. Appius formally appealed to the protection of the tribunes, and though Sempronius was supported by six of his colleagues, the other three vetoed any further proceedings. Appius continued to hold his office alone, amidst universal indignation and disgust. 35. War with Etruria During these proceedings in Rome, the siege of Sutrium was being kept up by the Etruscans. The consul Fabius was marching to assist the allies of Rome and to attempt the enemy's lines wherever it seemed practicable. His route lay along the lowest slopes of the mountain range, when he came upon the hostile forces drawn up in battle formation. The wide plain which stretched below revealed their enormous numbers, and, and in order to compensate for their own inferiority in that respect, by the advantage of position, he deflected his column a little way on to the rising ground, which was rough and covered with stones. He then formed his front against the enemy. The Etruscans, thinking of nothing but their numbers on which they solely relied, came on with such eager impetuosity that they flung away their javelins in order to come more quickly to a hand-to-hand -hand fight, and rushed upon their foe with drawn swords. The Romans, on the other hand, showered down upon them first their javelins, then the stones with which the ground plentifully supplied them. Shields and helmets alike were struck, and those who were not wounded were confounded and bewildered. It was almost impossible for them to get to close quarters, and they had no missiles with which to keep up the fight from a distance. Whilst they were standing as a mark for the missiles, without any sufficient protection, some even retreating, the whole line wavering and unsteady, the Roman hastity and, and principes raised their battle shout again and charged down upon them with drawn swords. The Etruscans did not wait for the charge, but faced about and in an disorderly flight made for their camp. The Roman cavalry, however, galloping in a slanting direction across the plain, headed off the fugitives who gave up all idea of reaching their camp, and turned off to the mountains. For the most part without arms and with a large proportion of wounded, the fugitives entered the Ciminian forest. Many thousands of Etruscans were killed, thirty-eight standards were taken, and in the capture of the camp the Romans secured an immense amount of booty. Then the question was discussed whether to pursue the enemy or no. 36. The Ciminian forest was, in those days, more frightful and impassable than the German forests were recently found to be. Not a single trader had, up to that time, ventured through it. Of those present in the council of war, hardly any one but the general himself was bold enough to undertake to enter it. They had not yet forgotten the horrors of Caudium. According to one tradition, it appears that Marcus Fabius, the consul's brother, others say Caiso, others again Lucius Claudius, the consul's half-brother, declared that he would go and reconnoitre, and shortly returned with accurate information. He had been brought up in Cairo, and was thoroughly conversant with the Etruscan language and literature. There is authority for asserting that at that time Roman boys were, as a rule, instructed in Etruscan literature, as they now are in Greek, but I think the probability is that there was something remarkable about the man who displayed such boldness in disguising himself and mingling with the enemy. He is said to have been accompanied by only one servant, and during their journey they only made brief inquiries as to the nature of the country and the names of its leading men, lest they should make some startling blunder in conversing with the natives, and so be found out. They went disguised as shepherds, with their rustic weapons, each carrying two bills and two heavy javelins, but neither their familiarity with the language nor the fashion of their dress nor their implements afforded them so much protection as the impossibility of believing that any stranger would enter the Ciminian forest. 
It is stated that they penetrated as far as Camerinum in Umbria, and on their arrival there the Roman ventured to say who they were. He was introduced into the Senate, and acting in the consul's name, he established a treaty of friendship with them. After having been most kindly and hospitably received, he was requested to inform the Romans that thirty days provision would be ready for them if they came into that district, and the Camertine soldiery would be prepared to act under their orders. When the consul received this report, he sent the baggage on in advance at the first watch. The legions were ordered to march behind the baggage, while he himself remained behind with the cavalry. The following day at dawn he rode up with his cavalry to the enemy's outposts, stationed on the edge of the forest, and after he had engaged their attention for a considerable time, he returned to the camp, and in the evening, leaving by the rear gate, he started after the column. By dawn on the following day he was holding the nearest heights of the Seminian range, and after surveying the rich fields of Etruria, he sent out parties to forage. A very large quantity of plunder had already been secured when some cohorts of Etruscan peasantry, hastily got together by the authorities of the neighbourhood, sought to check the foragers. They were, however, so badly organised that, instead of rescuing the prey, they almost fell a prey themselves. After putting them to flight with heavy loss, the Romans ravaged the country far and wide, and returned to their camp loaded with plunder of every kind. It happened to be during this raid that a deputation, consisting of five members of the Senate with two tribunes of the plebs, came to warn Fabius, in the name of the Senate, not to traverse the Seminian forest. They were very glad to find that they had come too late to prevent the expedition, and returned to Rome to report victory. 37. This expedition did not bring the war to a close, it only extended it. The whole country lying below the Seminian range had felt the effects of his devastations, and they roused the indignation of the cantons of Etruria and of the adjoining districts of Umbria. A larger army than had ever assembled before was marched to Sutrium. Not only did they advance their camp beyond the edge of the forest, but they showed such eagerness that they marched down in battle order on to the plain as soon as possible. After advancing some distance they halted, leaving a space between them and the Roman camp for the enemy to form his lines. When they became aware that their enemy declined battle, they marched up to the rampart of the camp, and, on seeing that the outposts retired within the camp, they loudly insisted upon their generals ordering the day's rations to be brought down to them from their camp, as they intended to remain under arms and attack the hostile camp, if not by night, at all events at dawn. The Romans were quite as excited at the prospect of battle, but they were kept quiet by their commander's authority. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when the general ordered the troops to take food, and instructed them to remain under arms and in readiness at whatever hour he gave the signal, whether by day or by night. In a brief address to his men, he drew a contrast between the military qualities of the Samnites and those of the Etruscans, speaking highly of the former and disparaging the latter, saying that there was no comparison between them as regarded either their courage or their numbers. They would learn in time that he had another weapon in reserve. Meanwhile, he must keep silence. By these dark hints he made his men believe that the enemy were being betrayed, and this helped to restore the courage which had quailed at the sight of such an immense multitude. This impression was confirmed by the absence of any intention on the part of the enemy to entrench the ground they were occupying. After the troops had had dinner, they rested until about the fourth watch. Then they rose quietly and armed themselves. A quantity of mattock-headed axes were distributed to the camp followers, with which they were to dig away the rampart and fill up the fosse with it. The troops were formed up within their entrenchments, and picked cohorts were posted at the exits of the camp. Then, a little before dawn, in summer nights the time for deepest sleep, the signal was given. The men crossed the levelled rampart in line and fell upon the enemy, who were lying about in all directions. Some were killed before they could stir, others only half awake as they lay, most of them whilst wildly endeavouring to seize their arms. 
Only a few had time to arm themselves, and these, with no standards under which to rally, no officers to lead them, were routed and fled, the Romans following in hot pursuit. Some sought their camp, others the forest. The latter proved the safer refuge, for the camp situated in the plain below was taken the same day. The gold and silver were ordered to be brought to the consul, the rest of the spoil became the property of the soldiers. The killed and prisoners amounted to sixty thousand. Some authorities assert that this great battle was fought beyond the Ciminian forest at Perusia, and that fears were felt in the city lest the army, cut off from all help by that terrible forest, should be overwhelmed by a united force of Tuscans and Umbrians. But wherever it was fought, the Romans had the best of it. As a result of this victory, Perusia, Cortona, and Eretium, which were at that time the three leading cantons of Etruria, sent to Rome for a treaty of peace. A thirty years' truce was granted them. End of section 20「Section 21 of the History of Rome, Volume 2 Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Rome, Volume 2, by Livy, translated by William Maspin Roberts. Book 9, Chapters 38 to 46. Chapter 38 Operations Against the Samnites. During these occurrences in Etruria, the other consul, Gaius Marcius Rutilus, took Alephae from the Samnites. Many other fortified posts and hamlets were either destroyed or passed uninjured into the power of the Romans. While this was going on, Publius Cornelius, whom the Senate had made maritime prefect, took the Roman fleet to Campania and brought up at Pompeii. Here the crews landed and proceeded to ravage the territory of Nuceria, after devastating the district near the coast, from which they could have easily reached their ships, they went further inland, attracted as usual by the desire for plunder, and here they roused the inhabitants against them. As long as they were scattered through the field they met nobody, though they might have been cut off to a man, but when they returned, thinking themselves perfectly safe, they were overtaken by the peasants and stripped of all their plunder. Some were killed, the survivors were driven helter-skelter to their ships. However great the alarm created in Rome by Quintus Fabius's expedition through the Ciminian forest, there was quite as much pleasure felt by the Samnites when they heard of it. They said that the Roman army was hemmed in. It was the Caudine disaster over again. The old recklessness had again led a nation always greedy for further conquests into an impassable forest. They were beset by the difficulties of the ground quite as much as by hostile arms. Their delight was, however, tinged with envy when they reflected that fortune had diverted the glory of finishing the war with Rome from the Samnites to the Etruscans. So they concentrated their whole strength to crush Gaius Marcius, or, if he did not give them a chance of fighting, to march through the country of the Marsi and Sabines into Etruria. The consul advanced against them, and a desperate battle was fought with no decisive result. Which side lost most heavily was doubtful, but a rumour was spread that the Romans had been worsted, as they had lost some belonging to the equestrian order and some military tribunes, besides a staff officer, and, what was a signal disaster, the consul himself was wounded. Reports of the battle, exaggerated as usual, reached Rome and created the liveliest alarm among the senators. It was decided that a dictator should be nominated, and no one had the slightest doubt that Papirius Cursor would be nominated, the one man who was regarded as the supreme general of his day. 
but they did not believe that a messenger could get through to the army in Samnium, as the whole country was hostile, nor were they by any means sure that Marcius was still alive. The other consul, Fabius, was on bad terms with Papirius. To prevent this private feud from causing public danger, the Senate resolved to send a deputation to Fabius, consisting of men of consular rank, who were to support their authority as public envoys by using their personal influence to induce him to lay aside all feelings of enmity for the sake of his country. When they had handed to Fabius the resolution of the Senate, and had employed such arguments as their instructions demanded, the consul, keeping his eyes fixed on the ground, withdrew from the deputation without making any reply and leaving them in utter uncertainty as to what he would do. Subsequently, he nominated Lucius Papirius dictator according to the traditional usage at midnight. When the deputation thanked him for having shown such rare self-command, he remained absolutely silent, and without vouchsafing any reply or making any allusion to what he had done, he abruptly dismissed them, showing by his conduct what a painful effort it had cost him. Papirius named Gaius Junius Bubulcus master of the horse. Whilst he was submitting to the assembly of Curies, the resolution conferring the dictatorial power, an unfavorable omen compelled him to adjourn the proceedings. It fell to the Faustian Curie to vote first, and this Curie had voted first in the years in which two memorable disasters occurred, the capture of the city and the capitulation of Caudium. Licinius Masser adds a third disaster through which this Curie became ill-omened, the massacre at the Crimera. 39. The following day, after fresh auspices had been taken, the dictator was invested with his official powers. He took command of the legions which were raised during the scare connected with the expedition through the Ciminian forest, and led them to Longula. Here he took over the consul's troops, and with the united force went into the field. The enemy showed no disposition to shirk battle, but while the two armies stood facing each other fully prepared for action, yet neither anxious to begin, they were overtaken by night. Their standing camps were within a short distance of each other, and for some days they remained quiet, not, however, through any distrust of their own strength or any feeling of contempt for the enemy. Meantime, the Romans were meeting with success in Etruria, for in an engagement with the Umbrians, the enemy were unable to keep up the fight with the spirit which they began it, and without any great loss, were completely routed. An engagement also took place at Lake Vadiminus, where the Etruscans had concentrated an army raised under Alex Secreta, in which each man chose his comrade. As their army was more numerous than any they had previously raised, so they exhibited a higher courage than they had ever shown before. So savage was the feeling on both sides that, without discharging a single missile, they began the fight at once with swords. The fury displayed in the combat, which long hung in the balance, was such that it seemed as though it was not the Etruscans who had been so often defeated that we were fighting with, but some new, unknown people. There was not the slightest sign of yielding anywhere. As the men in the first line fell, those in the second took their places to defend the standards. At length the last reserves had to be brought up, and to such an extremity of toil and danger had matters come that the Roman cavalry dismounted, and, leaving their horses in charge, made their way over piles of armor and heaps of slain to the front ranks of the infantry. They appeared like a fresh army amongst the exhausted combatants, and at once threw the Etruscan standards into confusion. The rest of the men, worn out as they were, nevertheless followed up the cavalry attack, and at last broke through the enemy's ranks. Their determined resistance was now overcome, and when once their maniples began to give way, they soon took to actual flight. That 
day broke for the first time the power of the Etruscans after their long continued and abundant prosperity. The main strength of their army was left on the field, and their camp was taken and plundered. 40. Equally hard fighting and an equally brilliant success characterized the campaign which immediately followed against the Samnites. In addition to their usual preparations for war, they had new glittering armor made in which their troops were quite resplendent. There were two divisions. One had their shields plated with gold, the other with silver. The shield was made straight and broad at the top to cover the chest and shoulders, then became narrower towards the bottom to allow of it being more easily moved about. To protect the front of the body, they wore coats of chain armor. The left leg was covered with a greave, and their helmets were plumed to give them the appearance of being taller than they really were. The tunics of the men with gold-plated shields were in variegated colors. Those with the silver shields had tunics of white linen. The latter were assigned to the right wing. The former were posted on the left. The Romans knew that all this splendid armor had been provided, and they had been taught by their generals that a soldier ought to inspire dread not by being decked out in gold and silver, but by trusting to his courage and his sword. They looked upon those things as a spoil for the enemy, rather than a defense for the wearer, resplendent enough before a battle, but soon stained and fouled by wounds and bloodshed. They knew that the one ornament of the soldier was courage, and all that finery would belong to whichever side won the victory. An enemy, however rich, was the prize of the victor, however poor the victor might be. With this teaching fresh in their minds, Cursor led his men into battle. He took his place on the right wing, and gave the command of the left to the master of the horse. As soon as the two lines came into collision, a contest began between the dictator and the master of the horse, quite as keen as the struggle against the enemy, as to whose division should be the first to win the victory. Junius happened to be the first to dislodge the enemy, bringing up his left wing against the enemy's right, where the devoted soldiers were posted, conspicuous in their white tunics and glittering armor. He declared that he would sacrifice them to Orcus, and, pushing the attack, he shook their ranks and made them visibly give way. On seeing this, the dictator exclaimed, "'Shall the victory begin on the left wing? Is the right wing, the dictator's own division, going to follow where another had led the way in battle, and not win for itself the greatest share of the victory?' This roused the men. The cavalry behaved with quite as much gallantry as the infantry, and the staff officers displayed no less energy than the generals. Marcus Valerius on the right wing, and Publius Decius on the left, both men of consular rank, rode up to the cavalry who were covering the flanks, and urged them to snatch some of the glory for themselves. They charged the enemy on both flanks, and the double attack increased the consternation of the enemy. To complete their discomfiture, the Roman legions again raised their battle shout and charged home. Now the Samnites took to flight, and soon the plain was filled with shining armor and heaps of bodies. At first the terrified Samnites found shelter in their camp, but they were not able even to hold that. It was captured, plundered, and burnt before nightfall. The Senate decreed a triumph for the dictator. By far the greatest sight in the procession was the captured armor, and so magnificent were the pieces considered that the gilded shields were distributed amongst the owners of the silversmiths' shops to adorn the forum. This is said to be the origin of the custom of the idols decorating the forum when the symbols of three Capitoline deities are conducted in procession through the city on the occasion of the great games. Whilst the Romans made use of this armor to honor the gods, the Campanians, out of contempt and hatred towards the Samnites, made the gladiators who performed at their banquets wear it, and they then called them Samnites. 
The consul Fabius fought a battle this year with the remnants of the Etruscans at Perusia, for the city had broken the truce. He gained an easy and decisive victory, and after the battle he approached the walls and would have taken the place had not envoys been sent on to surrender it. After he had stationed a garrison in Perusia, deputations came to him from different cities in Etruria to ask for a restoration of amicable relations. These he sent on to the Senate at Rome. Then he entered the city in triumphal procession, after achieving a more solid success than the dictator, especially as the defeat of the Samnites was put down largely to the credit of the staff officers, Publius Decius and Marcus Valerius. These men were chosen by an almost unanimous vote at the next elections, one as consul, the other as praetor. 41. Owing to his splendid services in the subjugation of Etruria, the consulship of Fabius was extended to another year, Decius being his colleague. Valerius was elected praetor for the fourth time. The consuls arranged their respective commands. Etruria fell to Decius and Samnium to Fabius. Fabius marched to Nuceria, where the people of Alpha Terna met him with a request for peace, but as they had refused it when offered to them before, he declined to grant it now. It was not till he actually began to attack the place that they were forced into unconditional surrender. He fought an action with the Samnites and won an easy victory. The memory of that battle would not have survived if it had not been that the Marsi engaged for the first time on that occasion in hostilities with Rome. The Polygni, who had followed the example of the Marsi, met with the same fate. The other consul, Decius, was also successful. He inspired such alarm in Tarquinii that its people provided his army with corn and asked for a forty years' truce. He captured several fortified posts belonging to Volsinii, some of which he destroyed that they might not serve as retreats for the enemy. And by extending his operations in all directions, he made his name so dreaded that the whole Etruscan League begged him to grant a treaty. There was not the slightest chance of their obtaining one, but a truce was granted them for one year. They had to provide a year's pay for the troops, and two tunics for every soldier. That was the price of the truce. While matters were thus quieted in Etruria, fresh trouble was caused by the sudden defection of the Umbrians, a people hitherto untouched by the ravages of war beyond what their land had suffered from the passage of the Romans. They called out all their fighting men, and compelled a large section of the Etruscan population to resume hostilities. The army which they mustered was so large that they began to talk in very braggart tones about themselves, and in very contemptuous terms about the Romans. They even expressed their intention of leaving Decius in their rear and marching straight to attack Rome. Their intentions were disclosed to Decius. He at once hastened by forced marches to a city outside the frontiers of Etruria, and took up a position in the territory of Pupinia to watch the enemy's movements. This hostile movement on the part of the Umbrians was regarded very seriously in Rome. Even their menacing language made people, after their experience of the Gaulish invasion, tremble for the safety of their city. Instructions were accordingly sent to Fabius, ordering him, if he could for the time being suspend operations in Samnium, to march with all speed into Umbria. The consul at once acted upon his instructions and proceeded by forced marches to Mavania, where the forces of the Umbrians were stationed. They were under the impression that he was far away in Samnium, with another war on his hands, and his sudden arrival produced such consternation amongst them that some advised a retreat into their fortified cities, while others were in favour of abandoning the war. There was one canton, the natives call it Materna, which not only kept the rest under arms, but even induced them to come to an immediate engagement. They attacked Fabius while he was fortifying his camp. When he saw them making a rush towards his entrenchments, he called his men off from their work, and marshaled them in the best order that the ground and the time at his disposal allowed. 
he reminded them of the glory they had won in Etruria and in Samnium, and bade them finish off this wretched aftergrowth of the Etruscan war, and exact a fitting retribution for the impious language in which the enemy had threatened to attack Rome. His words were received with such eagerness by his men that their enthusiastic shouts interrupted their commander's address, and without waiting for the word of command or the notes of the trumpets and bugles, they raced forward against the enemy. They did not attack them as though they were armed men. Marvellous to relate, they began by snatching the standards from those who bore them. Then the standard-bearers were themselves dragged off to the consul, the soldiers were pulled across from the one army to the other, the action was everywhere fought with shields rather than with swords, men were knocked down by the bosses of shields and blows under the armpits. More were captured than killed, and only one cry was heard throughout the ranks. Lay down your arms. So on the field of battle the prime offers of the war surrendered. During the next few days the rest of the Umbrian community submitted. The Acriculans entered into a mutual undertaking with Rome, and were admitted to her friendship. 42. After bringing to a victorious close the war which had been allotted to his colleague, Fabius returned to his own sphere of action. As he had conducted operations with such success, the Senate followed the precedent set by the people in the previous year, and extended his command for a third year, in spite of the strenuous opposition of Appius Claudius, who was now consul, the other consul being Lucius Volumnius. I find in some analysts that Appius was a candidate for the consulship while he was still censor, and that Lucius Furius, a tribune of the plebs, stopped the election until he had resigned his censorship. A new enemy, the Salentines, had appeared, and the conduct of this war was assigned to his colleague. Appius himself remained in Rome, with the view of strengthening his influence by his domestic administration, as the attainment of military glory was in other hands. Volumnius had no cause to regret this arrangement. He fought many successful actions and took some of the enemy's cities by storm. He was lavish in distributing the spoil, and this generosity was rendered still more pleasing by his frank and cordial manner. By qualities such as these he made his men keen to face any perils or labors. Quintus Fabius, as proconsul, fought a pitched battle with the Samnites near the city of Alephae. There was very little uncertainty as to the result. The enemy were routed and driven to their camp, and they would not have held that had more daylight been left. Before night, however, their camp was completely invested, so that none could escape. On the morrow, while it was still twilight, they made proposals for surrender, and their surrender was accepted on condition that the Samnites should be dismissed with one garment apiece after they had all passed under the yoke. No provision had been made for their allies, and as many as seven thousand of them were sold into slavery. Those who declared themselves Hernicans were separated and placed under guard. Subsequently, Fabius sent them all to the Senate in Rome. After inquiries had been made as to whether they had fought for the Samnites against Rome as conscripts or as volunteers, they were committed to the custody of the Latin cities. The new consuls, Publius Cornelius Arvina and Quintus Marcius Tremulus were ordered to bring the whole question of the prisoners before the Senate. The Hernicans resented this, and a national council was held at Nagnia in what they call the Maritime Circus. The whole nation thereupon, with the exception of Alatrium, Verentini, and Verule, declared war against Rome. 43 subjugation of the Hernicans and Aqui, peace with the Samnites. Now that Fabius had evacuated the country, the Samnites became restless. Calatia and Sora and the Roman garrisons there were taken by storm, and the soldiers who had been taken prisoners were cruelly massacred. Publius Cornelius was dispatched thither with an army. 
The Anagnians and Hernicans had been assigned to Marcius. At first the enemy occupied such a well-chosen position between the camps of the two consuls that no messenger, however active, could get through, and for some days both consuls were kept in ignorance of everything and in anxious suspense as to each other's movements. Tidings of this alarming state of things reached Rome, and every man liable to service was called out. Two complete armies were raised against sudden emergencies, but the progress of the war did not justify this extreme alarm, nor was it worthy of the old reputation which the Hernicans enjoyed. They attempted nothing worth mentioning. Within a few days they were stripped of three camps in succession, and begged for a thirty days' armistice to allow of their sending envoys to Rome. To obtain this, they consented to supply the troops with six months' pay and one tunic per man. The envoys were referred by the Senate to Marcius, to whom they had given full powers to treat, and he received the formal surrender of the Hernicans. The other consul in Samnium, though superior in strength, was more hampered in his movements. The enemy had blocked all the roads and secured the passes so that no supplies could be brought in, and though the consul drew up his line and offered battle each day, he failed to allure the enemy into an engagement. It was quite clear that the Samnites would not risk an immediate conflict, and that the Romans could not stand a prolonged campaign. The arrival of Marcius, who, after subjugating the Hernicans, had hurried to the assistance of his colleague, made it impossible for the enemy to delay matters any longer. They had not felt themselves strong enough to meet even one army in the open field, and they knew that their position would be perfectly hopeless if the two consular armies formed a junction. They decided, therefore, to attack Marcius while he was on the march, before he had time to deploy his men. The soldiers' kits were hurriedly thrown together in the centre, and the fighting line was formed as well as the time allowed, the noise of the battle shout rolling across and then the sight of the cloud of dust in the distance created great excitement in the standing camp of Cornelius. He at once ordered the men to arm for battle, and led them hurriedly out of the camp into line. It would, he exclaimed, be a scandalous disgrace if they allowed the other army to win a victory, which both ought to share, and failed to maintain their claim to the glory of a war which was especially their own. He then made a flank attack, and breaking through the enemy's centre, pushed on to their camp, which was denuded of defenders, and burnt it. As soon as Marcius's troops caught sight of the flames, and the enemy looking behind them saw them too, the Samnites took to flight in all directions, but no place afforded them a safe refuge, death awaited them everywhere. After thirty thousand of the enemy had been killed, the consuls gave the signal to retire. They were recalling and collecting the troops together amidst mutual congratulations, when suddenly fresh cohorts of the enemy were seen in the distance, consisting of recruits who had been sent up as reinforcements. This renewed the carnage, for, without any orders from the consuls or any signal given, the victorious Romans attacked them, exclaiming as they charged that the Samnites recruits would have to pay dearly for their training. The consuls did not check the ardor of their men, for they knew well that raw soldiers would not even attempt to fight when the veterans around them were in disorderly flight, nor were they mistaken. All the Samnite forces, veterans and recruits alike, fled to the nearest mountains. The Romans went up after them. No place afforded safety to the beaten foe. They were routed from the heights they had occupied, and at last with one voice they all begged for peace. They were ordered to supply corn for three months, a year's pay, and a tunic for each soldier, and envoys were dispatched to the Senate to obtain terms of peace. Cornelius was left in Samnium, Marcius entered the city in triumphal procession after his subjugation of the Hernicans, an equestrian statue was decreed to him, which was erected in the forum in front of the temple of Castor. Three of the Hernican communities, Alatrium, Beruli, and Ferentinum, had their municipal independence restored to them, as they preferred that to the Roman franchise, and the right of intermarriage with each other was granted them, a privilege which, for a considerable period, they were the only communities amongst the Hernicans to enjoy. 
the Anagnians and the others who had taken up arms against Rome were admitted to the status of citizenship without the franchise, they were deprived of their municipal self-government and the right of intermarriage with each other, and their magistrates were forbidden to exercise any functions except those connected with religion. In this year, the censor Gaius Junius Bubulcus signed a contract for the building of the temple to Salus, which he had vowed when engaged as consul in the Samnite War. He and his colleague, Marcus Valerius Maximus, also undertook the construction of roads through the country districts out of the public funds. The treaty with the Carthaginians was renewed for the third time this year, and munificent presents were made to the plenipotentiaries who had come over for the purpose. 44. Publius Cornelius Scipio was nominated dictator this year, with Publius Decius Mus as master of the horse, for the purpose of holding the elections, as neither of the consuls could leave the seat of war. The consuls elected were Lucius Postumius and Tiberius Minucius. Piso places these consuls immediately after Quintus Fabius and Publius Decius, omitting the two years in which I have inserted the consulships of Claudius and Volumnius, and of Cornelius and Marcius. Whether this was due to a slip of memory in drawing up the list, or whether he purposely admitted them, believing them to be wrongly inserted, is uncertain. The Samnites made forays this year into the district of Stelae in Campania. Both consuls accordingly were dispatched to Samnium. Posthumius marched to Tifernum, Minucius made Bovianum his objective. Posthumius was the first to come into touch with the enemy, and a battle was fought at Tifernum. Some authorities state that the Samnites were thoroughly beaten and 24,000 prisoners taken. According to others, the battle was an indecisive one, and Posthumius, in order to create an impression that he was afraid of the enemy, withdrew by night into the mountains, whither the enemy followed him and took up an entrenched position two miles away from him. To keep up the appearance of having sought a safe and commodious place for a standing camp, and such it really was, the consul strongly entrenched himself and furnished his camp with all necessary stores. Then, leaving a strong detachment to hold it, he started at the third watch and led his legions in light marching order by the shortest possible route to his colleague, who was also encamped in front of another Samnite army. Acting on Posthumius's advice, Minucius engaged the enemy, and after the battle had gone on for the greater part of the day without either side gaining the advantage, Posthumius brought up his fresh legions and made an unsuspected attack upon the enemy's wearied lines. Exhausted by fighting and by wounds, they were incapable of flight and were practically annihilated. Twenty-one standards were captured, both armies marched to the camp which Posthumius had formed, and there they routed and dispersed the enemy, who were demoralized by the news of the previous battle. Twenty-six standards were captured, the captain-general of the Samnites, Statius Gellius, and a large number of men were made prisoners, and both camps were taken. The next day they commenced an attack on Bovianum, which was soon taken, and the consuls, after their brilliant success celebrated a joint triumph. Some authorities assert that the consul Minucius was carried back to the camp severely wounded and died there, and that Marcus Fulvius was made consul in his place, and after taking over the command of Minucius's army, affected the capture of Bovianum. During the year, Sora, Arpinum, and Sicenia were recovered from the Samnites. The great statue of Hercules was also set up and dedicated in the capital. 45. Publius Sulpicius Severio and Publius Sempronius Sophus were the next consuls. During their consulship, the Samnites, anxious for either a termination or at least a suspension of hostilities, sent envoys to Rome to sue for peace. In spite of their submissive attitude, they did not meet with a very favorable reception. The reply they received was to the effect that if the Samnites had not often made proposals for peace while they were actually preparing for war, negotiations might possibly have been entered into. But now, as their words had proved worthless, the question must be decided by their deeds. They were informed that the consul Publius Sempronius would shortly be in Samnium with his army, and he would be able to judge accurately whether they were more disposed to peace 
or to war. When he had obtained all the information that he wanted, he would lay it before the Senate. On his return from Samnium, the envoys might follow him to Rome. Wherever Sempronius marched, they found the Samnites peaceably disposed and ready to supply them with provisions and stores. The old treaty was therefore restored. From that quarter, the Roman arms were turned against their old enemies, the Aequi. For many years, this nation had remained quiet, disguising their real sentiments under a peaceable attitude. As long as the Hernicans remained unsubdued, the Aequi had frequently cooperated with them in sending help to the Samnites. But after their final subjugation, almost the whole of the Aequian nation threw off the mask and openly went over to the enemy. After Rome had renewed the treaty with the Samnites, the Vitiles went on to the Aequi to demand satisfaction. They were told that their demand was simply regarded as an attempt on the part of the Romans to intimidate them by threats of war into becoming Roman citizens. How desirable a thing this citizenship was might be seen in the case of the Hernicans, who, when allowed to choose, preferred living under their own laws to becoming citizens of Rome. To men who were not allowed which they would prefer, but were made Roman citizens by compulsion, it would be a punishment. As these opinions were pretty generally expressed in their different councils, the Romans ordered war to be declared against the Aequi. Both the consuls took the field and selected a position four miles distant from the enemy's camp. As the Aequi had for many years had no experience of a national war, their army was like a body of irregulars with no properly appointed generals and no discipline or obedience. They were in utter confusion. Some were of opinion that they ought to give battle, others thought they ought to confine themselves to defending their camp. The majority were influenced by the prospect of their fields being devastated and their cities with their scanty garrisons being destroyed. In this diversity of opinions, one was given utterance to which put out of sight all care for the common weal and directed each man's regards to his own private interests. They were advised to abandon their camp at the first watch, carry off all their belongings, and disperse to their respective cities to protect their property behind their walls. This advice met with the warmest approval from all. Whilst the enemy were thus straggling homewards, the Romans, as soon as it was light, marched out and formed up in order of battle, and as soon as there was no one to oppose, they went on at a quick march to the enemy's camp. Here they found no pickets before the gates were on the rampart, none of the noise which is customary in a camp, and fearing from the unusual silence that a surprise was being prepared, they came to a halt. At length they climbed over the rampart and found everything deserted. Then they began to follow up the enemy's footsteps, but as these went in all directions alike, they found themselves going further and further astray. Subsequently, they discovered through their scouts what the design of the enemy was, and their cities were successively attacked. Within a fortnight, they had stormed and captured thirty-one walled towns. Most of these were sacked and burnt, and the nation of the Aqui was almost exterminated. A triumph was celebrated over them, and warned by their example, the Marusini, the Marsi, the Peligni, and the Ferrachani sent spokesmen to Rome to sue for peace and friendship. These tribes obtained a treaty with Rome. 46. The Idolship of Gnaeus Flavius it was during this year that Gnaeus Flavius, the son of a freedman, born in a humble station of life, but a clever, plausible man, became curule ideal. I find in some analysts the statement that at the time of the election of ideals, he was acting as apertor to the ideals, and when he found that the first vote was given in his favor and was disallowed on the ground that he was a clerk, he laid aside his writing tablet and took an oath that he would not follow that profession. Licinius Master, however, attempts to show that he had given up the clerk's business for some time as he had been a tribune of the plebs, and had also twice held office as a triumvir, the first time as a triumvir nocturnus, and afterwards as one of the free commissioners for settling a colony. 
money. However this may be, there is no question that he maintained a defiant attitude towards the nobles who regarded his lowly origin with contempt. He made public the legal forms and processes which had been hidden away in the closets of the pontiffs. He exhibited a calendar written on whitened boards in the forum, on which were marked the days on which legal proceedings were allowed. To the intense disgust of the nobility, he dedicated the Temple of Concord on the Vulcanal. At this function the pontifex Maximus, Cornelius Berbatus, was compelled by the unanimous voice of the people to recite the usual form of devotion in spite of his insistence that in accordance with ancestral usage none but a consul or a commander-in-chief could dedicate a temple. It was in consequence of this that the Senate authorized a measure to be submitted to the people, providing that no one should presume to dedicate a temple or an altar without being ordered to do so by the Senate, or by a majority of the tribunes of the plebs. I will relate an incident, trivial enough in itself, but affording a striking proof of the way in which the liberties of the plebs were asserted against the insolent presumption of the nobility. Flavius went to visit his colleague, who was ill. Several young nobles who were sitting in the room had agreed not to rise when he entered, on which he ordered his curial chair to be brought, and from that seat of dignity calmly surveyed his enemies, who were filled with unutterable disgust. The elevation of Flavius to the idealship was, however, the work of a party in the forum who had gained their power during the censorship of Appius Claudius, for Appius had been the first to pollute the Senate by electing into it the sons of freedmen, and when no one recognized the validity of these elections, and he failed to secure in the Senate House the influence which he had sought to gain in the city, he corrupted both the assembly of tribes and the assembly of centuries by distributing the dregs of the populace amongst all the tribes. Such deep indignation was aroused by the election of Flavius that most of the nobles laid aside their gold rings and military decorations as a sign of mourning. From that time the citizens were divided into two parties, the uncorrupted part of the people, who favoured and supported men of integrity and patriotism, were aiming at one thing, the mob of the forum were aiming at something else. This state of things lasted until Quintus Fabius and Publius Decius were made censors. Quintus Fabius, for the sake of concord, and at the same time to prevent the elections from being controlled by the lowest of the populace, threw the whole of the citizens of the lowest class, the mob of the forum, into four tribes and called them the city tribes. Out of gratitude for his action, it is said, he received an epithet which he had not gained by all his victories, but which was now conferred upon him for the wisdom he had shown in thus suggesting the orders in the state, the cognomen Maximus. It is stated that he also instituted the annual parade of the cavalry on July 15th. End of section 21section 22 of the history of rome volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the history of rome volume 2 by livy translated by william maston roberts book 10 chapters 1 to 9 Book ten, three hundred and three to two hundred and ninety three BC, the Third Samnite War, Chapter One, New Military Colonies Founded. During the consulship of Lucius Genusius and Servius Cornelius, there was almost a complete respite from foreign wars. Colonists were settled at Sora and Alba. The latter was in the country of the Aqui. Six thousand colonists were settled there. Sor had been a Volscian town, but the Samnites had occupied it. Four thousand men were sent there. The right of citizenship was conferred this year upon the Arpinates and the Chebulans. 
The Fusinates were mulcted in a third of their territory, for it had been ascertained that they were the instigators of the Hernican Revolt. The Senate decreed that the consuls should hold an inquiry, and the ringleaders were scourged and beheaded. However, in order that the Romans might not pass a whole year without any military operations, a small expeditionary force was sent into Umbria. A certain cave was reported to be the rendezvous of a body of freebooters, and from this hiding place they made armed excursions into the surrounding country. The Roman troops entered this cave, and many of them were wounded, mostly by stones, owing to the darkness of the place. At length they discovered another entrance, for there was a passage right through the cave, and both mouths of the cavern were filled up with wood. This was set on fire, and stifled by the smoke, the bandits, in trying to escape, rushed into the flames, and two thousand perished. Marcus Livius Stentor and Marcus Aurelius were the new consuls, and during their year of office hostilities were resumed by the Aequi. They resented the planting within their borders of a colony which was to be a stronghold of Roman power, and they made a desperate effort to capture it, but were beaten off by the colonists. In their weakened condition it seemed almost incredible that the Aequi could have begun war, relying solely upon themselves, and the fear of an indefinitely extended war necessitated the appointment of a dictator. Gaius Junius Bovulcus was nominated, and he took the field, with Marcus Titinius as master of the horse. In the very first battle he crushed the Aequi, and a week later he returned in triumph to the city. Whilst dictator, he dedicated the Temple of Salus, which he had vowed as consul, and the construction of which he had contracted for when censor. 2. Cleonymus makes attempts on Italy with his fleet. During the year, a fleet of Greek ships under the command of the Lacedaemonian Cleonymus sailed to the shores of Italy and captured the city of Furiae in the Salentine country. The consul, Aemilius, was sent to meet this enemy, and in one battle he routed him and drove him to his ships. Fourier was restored to its former inhabitants, and peace was established in the Salentine territory. In some analysts, I find it stated that the dictator, Junius Bubulcus, was sent into that country, and that Cleonymus left Italy to avoid a conflict with the Romans. He sailed round the promontory of Brundisium, and was carried up the Adriatic, where he had on his left the harbourless shores of Italy, and on his right the countries occupied by the Illyrians, the Liburnians, and the Histrians, savage tribes chiefly notorious for their acts of piracy. He dreaded the possibility of falling in with these, and consequently directed his course inland until he reached the coasts of the Veneti. Here he landed a small party to explore the neighborhood. The information they brought back was to the effect that there was a narrow beach, and on crossing it they found lagoons which were affected by the tide. Beyond these level, cultivated country was visible, and in the further distance hills could be seen. At no great distance was the mouth of a river deep enough to allow of ships being brought up and safely anchored. This was the Meduicus. On hearing this, he ordered the fleet to make for that river and sail upstream. As the river channel did not admit the passage of his largest ships, the bulk of his troops went up in the lighter vessels and came to a populous district belonging to the maritime villages of the Pataviae, who inhabit that coast. After leaving a few to guard the ships they landed, seized the villages, burnt the houses, and carried off the men and cattle as booty. Their eagerness for plunder led them too far from their ships. The people of Patavium were obliged to be always under arms, owing to their neighbors, the Gauls, and when they heard what was going on, they divided their forces into two armies. One of these was to proceed to the district where the invaders were reported to be carrying on their depredations, the other was to go by a different route, to avoid meeting any of the plunderers, to where the ships were anchored about fourteen miles from the town. The latter attacked the ships, and, after killing those who resisted them, they compelled the terrified sailors to take their vessels over to the opposite bank. 
the other army had been equally successful against the plunderers, who in their flight to their ships were intercepted by the Venity, and, hemmed in between the two armies, were cut to pieces. Some of the prisoners informed their captors that King Cleonymus, with his fleet, was only three miles distant. The prisoners were sent to the nearest village for safekeeping, and some of the defenders got into their river boats, which were flat-bottomed to allow of their passing over the shallows and the lagoons, whilst others manned the vessels they had captured and sailed down the river. When they reached the Greek fleet, they surrounded the large ships, which were afraid to stir and dreaded unknown waters more than the enemy, and pursued them to the mouth of the river. Some which in the confused fighting had run aground were captured and burnt. After this victory they returned. Failing to effect a successful landing in any part of the Adriatic, Cleonymus sailed away with barely a fifth part of his fleet undamaged. There are many still living who have seen the beaks of the ships and the spoils of Lacedaemonians hung up in the old temple of Juno and Patavium and the anniversary of that battle is celebrated by a sham fight of ships on the river which flows through the town. 3. War in Etruria The Vestinians had requested to be placed on the footing of a friendly state, and a treaty was made with them this year. Subsequently, several incidents created alarm in Rome. Intelligence was received of the renewal of hostilities by the Etruscans owing to disturbances in Eretium. The powerful house of the Silnii had created widespread jealousy through their enormous wealth, and an attempt was made to expel them from the city. The Marsai also were giving trouble, for a body of four thousand colonists had been sent to Carcioli, and they were prevented by force from occupying the place. In view of this threatening aspect of affairs, Marcus Valerius Maximus was nominated dictator, and he named Marcus Aemilius Paulus master of the horse. I think that this is more probable than that Quintus Fabius was made master of the horse, and therefore in a subordinate position to Valerius, in spite of his age and the offices he had held. But I am quite prepared to admit that the error arose from the cognomen Maximus, common to both men. The dictator took the field and routed the Marseilles in one battle. After compelling them to seek shelter in their fortified cities, he took Milionia, Plestina, and Frisilia within a few days. The Marseilles were compelled to surrender a portion of their territory, and then the old treaty with Rome was renewed. The war was now turned against the Etruscans, and an unfortunate incident occurred during this campaign. The dictator had left the camp for Rome to take the auspices afresh, and the master of the horse had gone out to forage. He was surprised and surrounded, and after losing some standards and many of his men, he was driven in disgraceful flight back to his camp. Such a precipitate flight is contradictory to all that we know of Fabius, for it was his reputation as a soldier that more than anything else justified his epithet of Maximus, and he never forgot the severity of Papirius towards him, and could never have been tempted to fight without the dictator's orders. 4. The news of this defeat created a quite unnecessary alarm in Rome. Measures were adopted as though an army had been annihilated, all legal business was suspended, Guards were stationed at the gates, watches were set in the different wards of the city, armor and weapons were stored in readiness on the walls, and every man within the military age was embodied. When the dictator returned to the camp, he found that, owing to the careful arrangements which the master of the horse had made, everything was quieter than he had expected. The camp had been moved back into a safer position, the cohorts who had lost their standards were punished by being stationed outside the rampart without any tents, the whole army was eager for battle that they might all the sooner wipe out the stain of their defeat. Under these circumstances, the dictator at once advanced his camp into the neighborhood of Rusula. The enemy followed him, and although they felt 
the utmost confidence in a trial of strength in the open field, they decided to practice stratagem on their enemy, as they had found it so successful before. At no great distance from the Roman camp were some half-demolished houses belonging to a village which had been burnt when the land was harried. Some soldiers were concealed in these, and cattle were driven past the place in full view of the Roman outposts, who were under the command of a staff officer, Gnaeus Fulvius. As not a single man left his post to take the bait, one of the drovers, coming up close to the Roman lines, called out to the others who were driving the cattle somewhat slowly away from the ruined cottages to ask them why they were so slow, as they could drive them safely through the middle of the Roman camp. Some Carites who were with Fulvius interpreted the words, and all the maniples were extremely indignant at the insult, but they did not dare to move without orders. He then instructed those who were familiar with the language to notice whether the speech of the herdsmen was more akin to that of rustics or to that of town-dwellers. On being told that the accent and personal appearance were too refined for cattle-drovers, he said, Go and tell them to unmask the ambush they have tried in vain to conceal. The Romans know all, and can now no more be trapped by cunning than they can be vanquished by arms. When these words were carried to those who were lying concealed, they suddenly rose from their lurking place, and advanced in order of battle on to the open plain, which afforded a view in all directions. The advancing line appeared to Fulvius to be too large a body for his men to withstand, and he sent a hasty message to the dictator to ask for help. In the meantime he met the attack single-handed. Five. When the message reached the dictator, he ordered the standards to go forward and the troops to follow. But everything was done almost more rapidly than the orders were given. The standards were instantly snatched up, and the troops were with difficulty prevented from charging the enemy at a run. They were burning to avenge their recent defeat, and the shouts— becoming continually louder in the battle that was already going on, made them still more excited. They kept urging each other on, and telling the standard-bearers to march more quickly, but the more haste the dictator saw them making, the more determined was he to check the column and insist upon their marching deliberately. The Etruscans had been present in their full strength when the battle began. Message after message was sent to the dictator, telling him that all the legions of the Etruscans were taking part in the fight, and that his men could no longer hold out against them, whilst he himself from his higher ground saw for himself in what a critical position the outposts were. As, however, he felt quite confident that their commander could still sustain the attack, and as he was himself near enough to save him from all danger of defeat, he decided to wait until the enemy became utterly fatigued, and then to attack him with fresh troops. Although his own men were advancing so slowly, there was now only a moderate distance over which to charge, at all events for cavalry between the two lots. The standards of the legions were in front, to prevent the enemy from suspecting any sudden or secret maneuver, but the dictator had left intervals in the ranks of infantry through which the cavalry could pass. The legions raised the battle shout, and at the same moment the cavalry charged down upon the enemy, who were unprepared for such a hurricane, and a sudden panic set in. As the outposts, who had been all but cut off, were now relieved at the last moment, they were all allowed a respite from further exertions. The fresh troops took up the fighting, and the results did not long remain in doubt. The routed enemy sought their camp, and as they retreated before the Romans who were attacking it, they became crowded together in the furthest part. In trying to escape, they became blocked in the narrow gates, and a good many climbed on to the mound and stockade in the hope of defending themselves on higher ground, or possibly of crossing ramparts and fosse, and so escaping. 
in one part the mound had been built up too loosely and owing to the weight of those standing on it crumbled down into the fosse and many both soldiers and non-combatants exclaiming that the gods had cleared the passage for their flight made their escape that way in this battle the power of the etruscans was broken up for the second time after undertaking to provide a year's pay for the army and a two-month supply of corn they obtained permission from the dictator to send envoys to rome to sue for peace a regular treaty of peace was refused but they were granted a two years truce the dictator returned in triumphal procession to the city some of my authorities aver that etruria was pacified without any important battle being fought simply through the settlement of the troubles in Eretium and the restoration of the Silnii to popular favor. No sooner had Marcus Valerius laid down the dictatorship than he was elected consul. Some have thought that he was elected without having been a candidate, and therefore in his absence, and that the election was conducted by an interrex. There is no question, however, that he held the consulship with Apuleius Pansa. 6. The Ogonian Law During their year of office foreign affairs were fairly peaceful. The ill success the Etruscans had met with in war and the terms of the truce kept the Etruscans quiet. The Samnites, after their many years of defeat and disaster, were so far quite satisfied with their recent treaty with Rome. In the city itself the large number of colonists sent out made the plebs less restless and lightened their financial burdens. But to prevent anything like universal tranquillity, a conflict between the most prominent plebeians and the patricians was started by two of the tribunes of the plebs, Quintus and Gnaeus Ogulnius. These men had sought everywhere for an opportunity of traducing the patricians before the plebs, and after all other attempts had failed, they adopted a policy which was calculated to inflame the minds, not of the jegs of the populace, but of the actual leaders of the plebs, men who had been consuls and enjoyed triumphs, and to whose official distinctions nothing was lacking but the priesthood. This was not yet open to both orders. The Ogulnii accordingly gave notice of a measure providing that, as there were at that time four augurs and four pontiffs, and it had been decided that the number of priests should be augmented, the four additional pontiffs and five augurs should all be co-opted from the plebs. How the college of augurs could have been reduced to four, except by the death of two of their number, I am unable to discover. For it was a settled rule amongst the augurs that their number was bound to consist of threes, so that the three ancient tribes of the Ramnes, Titinuses, and Luceres might each have their own augur, or, if more were needed, the same number should be added for each. This was the principle on which they proceeded when, by adding five to four, the number was made up to nine, so that three were assigned to each tribe. But the co-optation of the additional priests from the plebs created almost as much indignation amongst the patricians as when they saw the consulship made open. They pretended that the matter concerns the gods more than it concerns them. As for their own sacred functions, they would see for themselves that these were not polluted. They only hoped and prayed that no disaster might befall the Republic. Their opposition, however, was not so keen because they had become habituated to defeat in these political contests, and they saw that their opponents in striving for the highest honours were not, as formerly, aiming at what they had little hopes of winning. Everything for which they had striven, though with doubtful hopes of success, they had hitherto gained numberless consulships, censorships, triumphs. 7. Appius Claudius and Publius Decius are said to have been the leaders in this controversy, the former as the opponent, the latter as the supporter of the proposed measure. The arguments they advanced were practically the same as those employed for and against the Licinian laws when the demand was made for the consulship to be thrown open to the plebeians. After going over much of the old ground, Decius made a final appeal on behalf of the proposals. 
he began by recalling the scene which many of those present had witnessed when the elder decius his father vested in the gabine's cincture and standing upon a spear solemnly devoted himself on behalf of the legions and people of rome he proceeded the offering which the consul decius made on that occasion was in the eyes of the immortal gods as pure and holy as that of his colleague titus manlius would have been if he had devoted himself could not that decius also have been fitly chosen to exercise priestly functions on behalf of the roman people and for me are you afraid that the gods will not listen to my prayers as they do to those of appius claudius does he perform his private devotions with a purer mind or worship the gods in a more religious spirit than i do who has ever had occasion to regret the vows which have been made on behalf of the commonwealth by so many plebeian consuls so many plebeian dictators when they were going to take command of their armies or when they were actually engaged in battle count up the commanders in all the years since war was for the first time waged under the leadership and auspices of plebeians you will find as many triumphs as commanders the plebeians too have their nobility and have no cause to be dissatisfied with them you may be quite certain that if a war were suddenly to break out now the senate and people of rome would not put more confidence in a general because he was a patrician than in one who happened to be a plebeian now if this is the case who in heaven or earth could regard it as an indignity that the men whom you have honoured with curl chairs with the toga praetexta the tunica palmata and the toga picta with the triumphal crown and the laurel wreath the men upon whose houses you have conferred special distinction by affixing to them the spoils taken from the enemy that these men i say should have in addition to their other marks of rank the insignia of the pontiffs and the augurs a triumphing general drives through the city in a gilded chariot apparelled in the splendid vestments of jupiter optimus maximus after this he goes up to the capital is he not to be seen there with capus and lituus is it to be regarded as an indignity if he with veiled head slay a victim or from his place on the citadel take an augury and if in the inscription on his bust the words consulship censorship triumph are read without arousing any indignation in what mood will the reader regard the words which you are going to add augurship and pontificate i do indeed hope please heaven that thanks to the good will of the roman people we now possess sufficient dignity to be capable of conferring as much honour on the priesthood as we shall receive for the sake of the gods as much as for ourselves let us insist that as we worship them now as private individuals so we may worship them for the future as officials of the state eight but why have i so far been assuming that the question of the patricians and the priesthood is still an open one and that we are not yet in possession of the highest of all offices we see plebeians amongst the ten keepers of the sacred books acting as interpreters of the sibyl's runes and the fates of this people we see them too presiding over the sacrifices and other rites connected with apollo no injustice was inflicted on the patricians when an addition was made to the number of the keepers of the sacred books on the demand of the plebeians none has been inflicted now when a strong and capable tribune has created five more posts for augurs and four more for priests which are to be filled by plebeians not appius with the design of ousting you patricians from your places but in order that the plebs may assist you in the conduct of divine matters as they do to the utmost of their power in the administration of human affairs do not blush appius to have as your colleague in the priesthood a man whom you might have had as colleague in the censorship or in the consulship who might be dictator with you as his master of horse just as you might be dictator with him for your master of the horse a sabine immigrant Atius clausus or if you prefer it appius claudius the founder of your noble house was admitted by those old patricians into their number do not think it beneath you to admit us into the number of the priests 
We bring with us many distinctions, all those, in fact, which have made you so proud. Lucius Sextius was the first plebeian to be elected consul. Gaius Licinius Stolo was the first plebeian master of the horse. Gaius Marcius Rutilus, the first plebeian who was both dictator and censor. Quintus Publius Philo was the first praetor. We have always heard the same objection raised, that the auspices were solely in your hands, that you alone enjoy the privileges and prerogatives of noble birth, that you alone can legitimately hold sovereign command and take the auspices either in peace or war. Have you never heard the remark that it was not men sent down from heaven who were originally created patricians, but those who could cite a father? which is nothing more than saying that they were free-born i can now cite a consul as my father and my son will be able to cite him as his grandfather it simply comes to this queerities that we can get nothing without a struggle it is only a quarrel that the patricians are seeking they do not care in the least about the result i for my part support this measure which i believe will be for your good and happiness and a blessing to the state and i hold that you ought to pass it nine the assembly was on the point of ordering the voting to proceed and it was evident that the measure would be adopted when on the intervention of some of the tribunes all further business was adjourned for the day on the morrow the dissentient tribunes having given way the law was passed amid great enthusiasm the co-opted pontiffs were publius decius mus the supporter of the measure publius sempronius sophus gaius marcius rutilis and marcus livius denter the five augurs who were also taken from the plebs were gaius genusius publius alius paetus marcus minucius physus gaius marcius and titus publilius so the number of the pontiffs was raised to eight and that of the augurs to nine the valerian law in this year the consul marcus valerius carried a proposal to strengthen the provision of the law touching the right of appeal this was the third time since the expulsion of the kings that this law was reenacted, and always by the same family i think that the reason for renewing it so often was solely the fact that the excessive power exercised by a few men was dangerous to the liberties of the plebs the porcian law however seems to have been passed solely for the protection of the citizens in life and limb for it imposed the severest penalties on any one who killed or scourged a roman citizen the valerian law it is true forbade any one who had exercised his right of appeal to be scourged or beheaded but if any one transgressed its provision it added no penalty but simply declared such transgression to be a wicked act such was the self-respect and sense of shame amongst the men of those days that i believe that declaration to have been a sufficiently strong barrier against violations of the law nowadays there is hardly a slave who would not use stronger language against his master wars with the aqui and umbrians Valerius also conducted a war against the Aqui, who had recommenced hostilities, but who retained nothing of their earlier character except their restless temper. The other consul, Apuleius, invested the town of Nequinum in Umbria. It was situated where Narnia now stands, on high ground which on one side was steep and precipitous, and it was impossible to take it either by assault or by regular siege works. It was left to the new consuls, Marcus Fulvius Paetus and Titus Manlius Torquatus, to carry the siege to a successful issue. According to Licinius Maser and Tubero, all the centuries intended to elect Quintus Fabius consul for this year, but he urged them to postpone his consulship until some more important war broke out, for he considered that he would be more useful to the state as a city magistrate. So, without dissembling his real wishes or ostensibly seeking the post, he was elected curule idol along with Lucius Papirius Cursor. I cannot, however, be certain on this point, for the earlier analyst, Piso, states that the curule idols for this year were Gnaeus Domitius, Gnaeus Faustus Calvinus, Spurius Carvilius, and Quintus Faustus Maximus. 
I think that the cognomen of the last-mentioned idol, Maximus, was the cause of the error, and that a story in which the lists of both elections were combined was constructed to fit in with the mistake. The lustrum was closed this year by the censors, Publius Sempronius Sophus and Publius Sulpicius Severio, and two new tribes were added, the Aniensis and the Tiretina. These were the principal events of the year in Rome. End of section 22. Section 23 of the History of Rome, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox. Dot org. The History of Rome, Volume 2, by Livy, translated by William Maspin Roberts. Book 10, Chapters 10 to 17. Chapter 10. Meantime, the siege of Nequinum was dragging slowly on, and time was being wasted. At length, two of the townsmen, whose houses abutted on the city wall, made a tunnel and came by that secret passage to the Roman outposts. They were conducted to the consul, and undertook to admit a detachment of soldiers within the fortifications and the city walls. It did not seem right to reject their proposal, nor yet to accept it offhand. One of them was instructed to conduct two spies through the underground passage, the other was detained as a hostage. The report of the spies was satisfactory, and three hundred soldiers, led by the deserter, entered the city by night and seized the nearest gate. This was broken open, and the consul with his army took possession of the place without any fighting. Thus Nequinum passed into the power of Rome. A colony was sent there as an outpost against the Umbrians, and the place was called Narnia, from the river Nar. The army marched back to Rome with a large amount of spoil. Renewal of hostilities by the Etruscans and Samnites. This year the Etruscans determined to break the truce and began to make preparations for war. But the invasion of their country by an enormous army of Gauls, the last thing they were expecting, turned them for a time from their purpose. Trusting to the power of money, which with them was very considerable, they endeavoured to convert the Gauls from enemies into allies in order that they might combine their forces in an attack on Rome. The barbarians did not object to an alliance. The only question was as to the amount of pay. After this had been agreed upon, and all the other preparations for war had been completed, the Etruscans called upon the Gauls to follow them. They refused to do so, and asserted that they had not taken the money to make war on Rome. Whatever they had received had been accepted as compensation for not devastating the land of Etruria or subjecting its inhabitants to armed violence. However, they expressed their willingness to serve if the Etruscans really wished them to do so, but only on one condition, namely that they should be admitted to a share of their territory and be able to settle at last in a permanent home. Many councils were held in the various cantons to discuss this proposal, but it was found impossible to accept the terms, not so much because they would not consent to any loss of territory, as because they dreaded the prospect of having as their neighbors men belonging to such a savage race. The Gauls were accordingly dismissed, and carried back with them an enormous sum of money gained without labor and without risk. The rumor of a Gaulish invasion in addition to the Etruscan war created alarm in Rome, and there was less hesitation in concluding a treaty with the Picentes. 11. The campaign in Etruria fell to the consul Titus Manlius. He had scarcely entered the hostile territory when, as he was wheeling his horse round in some cavalry exercises, he was flung off and almost killed on the spot. Three days later the consul ended his life. 
The Etruscans derived encouragement from this incident, for they took it as an omen, and declared that the gods were fighting for them. When the sad news reached Rome, not only was the loss of the man severely felt, but also the inopportuneness of the time when it occurred. The Senate were prepared to order the nomination of a dictator, but refrained from doing so, as the election of a successor to the consul went quite in accordance with the wishes of the leading patricians. Every vote was given in favor of Marcus Valerius, the man whom the Senate had decided upon as dictator. The legions were at once ordered to Etruria. Their presence acted as such a check upon the Etruscans that no one ventured outside their lines. Their fears shut them up as closely as though they were blockaded. Valerius devastated their fields and burnt their houses till not only single farms but numerous villages were reduced to smoking ashes but he failed to bring the enemy to action while this war was progressing more slowly than had been anticipated apprehensions were felt as to another war which from the numerous defeats sustained formerly on both sides was not unreasonably regarded with dread the pisantes had sent information that the samnites were arming for war and that they had approached the pisantes to induce them to join them the latter were thanked for their loyalty and the public attention was diverted to a large extent from Etruria to samnium the dearness of provisions caused widespread distress amongst the citizens those writers who make Fabius Maximus a curial ideal for that year assert that there would have been actual famine if he had not shown the same wise care in the control of the market and the accumulation of supplies which he had so often before displayed in war. An interregnum occurred this year. Tradition assigns no reason for it. The interreges were Appius Claudius and Publius Sulpicius. The latter held the consular elections, at which Lucius Cornelius Scipio and Gnaeus Fulvius were returned. At the beginning of their year, a deputation came from the Lucanians to lay a formal complaint against the Samnites. They informed the Senate that that people had tried to allure them into forming an offensive and defensive alliance with them, and, finding their efforts futile, they invaded their territory and were laying it waste, and so by making war upon them, trying to drive them into a war with Rome. The Lucanians, they said, had made too many mistakes already. They had now quite made up their minds that it would be better to bear and suffer everything than to attempt anything against Rome. They implored the Senate to take them under its protection and to defend them from the wanton aggressions of the Samnites. They were fully aware that if Rome declared war against Samnium, their loyalty to her would be a matter of life and death, but notwithstanding that, they were prepared to give hostages as a guarantee of good faith. 12. Commencement of the Third Samnite War The discussion in the Senate was brief. The members unanimously decided that a treaty of close alliance should be made with the Lucanians and satisfaction demanded from the Samnites. When the envoys were readmitted, they received a favorable reply and a treaty was concluded with them. The Fetils were sent to insist upon the evacuation by the Samnites of the territories of the allies of Rome and the withdrawal of their forces from the Lucanian frontiers. They were met by emissaries from the Samnites, who warned them that if they appeared in any of the Samnite councils, their inviolability would be no longer respected. On this being reported in Rome, the assembly confirmed the resolution passed by the Senate and ordered war to be made upon the Samnites. In the allotment of their respective commands, Etruria fell to Scipio and the Samnites to Fulvius. Both consuls took the field. Scipio, who was anticipating a tedious campaign similar to the one of the previous year, was met by the enemy in battle formation at Volaterrae. The contests lasted the greater part of the day, with heavy loss on both sides. Night came on whilst they were still uncertain with whom the victory lay. The following morning made it clear, for the Etruscans had abandoned their camp in the dead of the night. 
when the romans marched out to battle and saw that the enemy had by their action admitted their defeat they went on to the deserted camp this they took possession of and as it was a standing camp and had been hurriedly abandoned they secured a considerable amount of booty the troops were marched back into the neighborhood of valerii and after leaving the baggage with a small escort there they proceeded in light marching order to harry the etruscan land everything was laid waste with fire and sword prey was driven in from all sides not only was the soil left an absolute waste for the enemy but their fortified posts and villages were burnt the romans refrained from attacking the cities in which the terrified etruscans had sought shelter gnaeus fulvius fought a brilliant action at bovianum and samnium and gained a decisive victory he then carried bovianum by storm and not long afterwards Ophidina. Thirteen. During the year a colony was settled at Carcioli in the country of, of the Aquiculi. The consul Fulvia celebrated a triumph over the Samnites. Just as the consular elections were coming on, a rumor spread that the Etruscans and Samnites were levying immense armies. According to the reports which were sent, the leaders of the Etruscans were attacked in all the cantonal council meetings for not having brought the Gauls over on any terms whatever to take part in the war. The Samnite government were abused for having employed against the Romans a force which was only raised to act against the Lucanians. The enemy was arising in his own strength and in that of his allies to make war on Rome, and matters would not be settled without a conflict on a very much larger scale than formerly. Men of distinction were amongst the candidates for the consulship, but the gravity of the danger turned all eyes to Quintus Fabius Maximus. He at first simply declined to become a candidate, but when he saw the trend of popular feeling, he distinctly refused to allow his name to stand. Why? he asked. Do you want an old man like me, who has finished his allotted tasks, and gained all the rewards they have brought? I am not the man I was, either in strength of body or mind, and I fear lest some god should even deem my good fortune too great or too unbroken for human nature to enjoy. I have grown up to the measure of the glory of my seniors, and I would gladly see others rising to the height of my own renown. There is no lack of honors in Rome for the strongest and most capable men, nor is there any lack of men to win the honor. This display of modesty and unselfishness only made the popular feeling all the keener in his favor by showing how rightly it was directed. Thinking that the best way of checking it would be to appeal to the instinctive reverence for law, he ordered the law to be rehearsed which forbade any man from being re-elected consul within ten years. Owing to the clamor, the law was hardly heard, and the tribunes of the plebs declared that there was no impediment here. They would make a proposition to the assembly that he should be exempt from its provisions. He, however, persisted in his refusal, and repeatedly asked what was the object in making laws if they were deliberately broken by those who made them. We, said he, are now ruling the laws instead of the laws ruling us. Notwithstanding his opposition, the people began to vote, and as each century was called in, it declared without the slightest hesitation for Fabius. At last, yielding to the general desire of his countrymen, he said, May the gods approve what you have done and what you are going to do. Since, however, you are going to have your own way as far as I am concerned, give me the opportunity of using my influence with you so far as my colleague is concerned. I ask you to elect as my fellow consul Publius Decius, a man whom I have found to work with me in perfect harmony, a man who is worthy of your confidence, worthy of his illustrious sire. The recommendation was felt to be well deserved, and all the centuries which had not yet voted elected Quintus Fabius and Publius Decius consuls. During the year, a large number of people were prosecuted by the ideals for occupying more than the legal quantity of land. 
hardly one could clear himself from the charge, and a very strong curb was placed upon inordinate covetousness. 14. Battle near Tifernum the consuls were busy with their arrangements for the campaign, deciding which of them should deal with the Etruscans, and which with the Samnites, what troops they would each require, which field of operations each was best fitted for, when envoys arrived from Sutrium, Nepeti, and Falerii, bringing definite information that the local assemblies of Etruria were being convened to decide upon a peace policy. On the strength of this information, the whole weight of war was turned against the Samnites. In order to facilitate the transport of supplies, and also to make the enemy more uncertain as to the line of the Roman advance, Fabius led his legions by way of Sora, while Decius proceeded through the Cidicine district. When they had crossed the frontiers of Samnium, they marched on a widely extended front, laying the country waste as they went on. They threw out their scouting parties still more widely, and so did not fail to discover the enemy near Tifernum. They had concealed themselves in a secluded valley, prepared to attack the Romans, should they enter the valley, from the rising ground on each side. Fabius removed the baggage into a safe place and left a small guard over it. He then informed his men that a battle was impending, and massing them into a solid square, came up to the above-mentioned hiding place of the enemy. The Samnites, finding all chance for surprise hopeless, since matters would have to be decided by an action in the open, thought it better to meet their foes in a pitched battle. Accordingly, they came down to the lower ground, and placed themselves in the hands of fortune, with more of courage than of hope. But whether it was that they had got together the whole strength out of every community in Samnium, or that their courage was stimulated by the thought that their very existence as a nation depended upon this battle, they certainly did succeed in creating a good deal of alarm in the Roman ranks, even though they were fighting in a fair field. When Fabius saw that the enemy were holding their ground in every part of the field, he rode up to the first line with his son, Maximus, and Marcus Valerius, both military tribunes, and ordered them to go to the cavalry and tell them that if they remembered any single occasion on which the Republic had been aided by the efforts of the cavalry, they should that day strive their utmost to sustain the reputation of that invincible arm of the state, for the enemy were standing immovable against the infantry, and all their hopes rested on the cavalry. He made a personal appeal to each of them, showering commendations upon them, and holding out the prospect of great rewards. Since, however, the cavalry charge might fail in its object, and attacking in force proved useless, he thought he ought to adopt a stratagem. Scipio, one of his staff, received instructions to draw off the hastatai of the first legion, and, attracting as little observation as possible, take them to the nearest hills. Then, climbing up where they could not be seen, they were suddenly to show themselves in the enemy's rear. The cavalry led by the two young tribunes dashed out in front of the standards, and their sudden appearance created almost as much confusion amongst their own people as amongst the enemy. The Samnites' line stood perfectly firm against the galloping squadrons, nowhere could they be forced back or broken. Finding their attempt a failure, the cavalry retired behind the standards, and took no further part in the fighting. This increased the courage of the enemy, and the Roman front could not have sustained the prolonged contest, met as they were by a resistance which was becoming more stubborn as its confidence rose, had not the consul ordered the second line to relieve the first. These fresh troops checked the advance of the Samnites, who were now pressing forward. Just at this moment the standards were descried on the hills, and a fresh battle shout arose from the Roman ranks. The alarm which was created amongst the Samnites was greater than circumstances warranted, for Fabius exclaimed that his colleague Decius was coming, and every soldier, wild with joy, took up the cry and shouted that the other consul with his legions was at hand. 
This mistake occurring so opportunely filled the Samnites with dismay. They dreaded, exhausted as they were by fighting, the prospect of being overwhelmed by a second army, fresh and unhurt. Unable to offer any further resistance, they broke and fled, and owing to their scattered flight, the bloodshed was small when compared with the greatness of the victory. Three thousand four hundred were killed, about eight hundred and thirty made prisoners, and twenty-three standards were captured. Fifteen. Before this battle took place, the Samnites would have been joined by the Apulians had not the consul Decius anticipated their action by fixing his camp at Maleventum. He drew them into an engagement and routed them, and in this battle also there were more who escaped by flight than were slain. These amounted to two thousand. Without troubling himself further about the Apulians, Decius led his army into Samnium. There the two consular armies spent five months in ravaging and desolating the country. There were forty-five different places in Samnium where Decius at one time or another had fixed his camp. In the case of the other consul, there were eighty-six. Nor were the only traces left those of ramparts and fosses. More conspicuous still were those which attested the devastation and depopulation of all the country round. Fabius also captured the city of Symmetra, where 2,900 became prisoners of war, 830 having been killed during the assault. After this he returned to Rome for the elections, and arranged for them to be held at an early date. The centuries who voted first declared without exception for Fabius. Amongst the candidates was the energetic and ambitious Appius Claudius. Anxious to secure the honor for himself, he was quite as anxious that both posts should be held by patricians, and he brought his utmost influence, supported by the whole of the nobility, to bear upon the electors, so that they might return him together with Fabius. At the outset Fabius refused, and alleged the same grounds for his refusal as he had alleged the year before. Then all the nobles crowded round his chair and begged him to extricate the consulship from the plebeian mire and restore both to the office itself and to the patrician houses the august dignity which they possessed of old. As soon as he could obtain silence, he addressed them in terms which calmed their excitement. He would, he said, have arranged to admit votes for two patricians if he saw that anyone else than himself was being elected, but as matters were, he would not allow his name to stand, since it would be against the law and form a most dangerous precedent. So Lucius Volumnius, a plebeian, was elected together with Appius Claudius. They had already been associated in a previous consulship. The nobles taunted Fabius and said that he refused to have Appius Claudius as a colleague because he was unquestionably his inferior in eloquence and statecraft. 16. When the elections were over, the previous consuls received a six months extension of their command and were ordered to prosecute the war in Samnium. Publius Decius, who had been left by his colleague in Samnium, and was now proconsul, continued his ravages of the Samnite fields until he had driven their army, which nowhere ventured to encounter him, outside their frontiers. They made for Etruria, and were in hopes that the object which they had failed to secure by their numerous deputations might be achieved now that they had a strong force and could back up their appeals by intimidation. They insisted upon a meeting of the Etruscan chiefs being convened. When it had assembled, they pointed out how for many years they had been fighting with the Romans, how they had tried in every possible way to sustain the weight of that war in their own strength, and how they had proved the assistance of their neighbors to be of small value. They had sued for peace because they could no longer endure war. They had taken to war again because a peace which reduced them to slavery was heavier to bear than a war in which they could fight as free men. The only hope left to them now lay in the Etruscans. They knew that they of all the nations of Italy were the richest in arms and men and money, and they had for their neighbors the Gauls, trained to arms from the cradle, naturally courageous to desperation, and especially against the Romans, a nation whom they justly boast of having captured and then allowing them to ransom themselves with gold. If the Etruscans had the same spirit which Porcina and their ancestors once had, there was no reason why they should not expel the Romans from the whole of their land as far as 
the Tiber and compel them to fight, not for their insupportable dominion over Italy, but for their very existence. The Samnite army had come to them completely provided with arms and a war chest, and were ready to follow them at once, even if they led them to an attack on Rome itself. 17. While they were thus busy with their intrigues in Etruria, the warfare which the Romans were carrying on in Samnium was terribly destructive. When Publius Decius had ascertained through his scouts the departure of the Samnite army, he summoned a council of war. Why, he asked, are we roaming through the country districts, making war only upon the villages? Why are we not attacking the walled cities? There is no army to defend them. The army has abandoned its country and gone into voluntary exile. His proposal was unanimously adopted, and he led them to the attack of Mergantia, a powerfully fortified city. Such was the eagerness of the soldiers, due partly to the affection they felt for their commander, and partly to the expectation of a larger amount of plunder than they were securing in the country districts, that they stormed and captured the city in a single day. Two thousand one hundred combatants were cut off and made prisoners, and an enormous quantity of plunder was seized. To avoid loading the army with a lot of heavy baggage, Decius called his men together and addressed them thus. Are you going to content yourselves with this one victory and this spoil? Raise your hopes and expectations to the height of your courage. All the cities of the Samnites and all the wealth left in them are yours now that their legions, routed in so many battles, have at last been driven by you beyond their frontiers. Sell what you now hold and attract traders for the hope of profit to follow our armies. I shall frequently supply you with things for sale. Let us go on to the city of Amulea, where still greater spoil awaits you, but not greater exertions. The booty was then sold, and the men, urging on their commander, marched to Romulea. Here, too, no siege works were constructed, no artillery employed. The moment the standards were brought up to the walls, no resistance on the part of the defenders could keep the men back. They planted their scaling ladders just where they happened to be, and swarmed on to the walls. The town was taken and sacked, 2,300 were killed, 6,000 taken prisoners, and a vast amount of plunder secured, which the troops as before, were obliged to dispose of to the traitors. The next place to be attacked was Ferentinum, and though no rest was allowed the men, they marched thither in the highest spirits. Here, however, they had more trouble and more risk. The position had been made as strong as possible by nature and by art, and the walls were defended with the utmost energy. But a soldiery habituated to plunder overcame all obstacles. As many as three thousand of the enemy were killed round the walls, the plunder was given to the troops. In some analysts, the greater part of the credit of these captures is given to Maximus. Decius, they say, took Morgantia, Ferentinum, and Romulea being captured by Fabius. Some again claim this honor for the new consuls, while a few restrict it to Lucius Volumnius, to whom they say Samnium was assigned as his sphere of action. End of section 23. Section 24 of the History of Rome, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Rome, Volume 2, by Livy, translated by William Maspin Roberts. Book 10, Chapters 18 to 23. Chapter 18. The Samnites and Etruscans allied against Rome. Whilst this campaign was going on in Samnium, whoever may have been the commander, a very serious war against Rome was being organized in Etruria, in which many nations were to take part. The chief organizer was Gellius Agnatius, a Samnite. Almost all the Tuscan cantons had decided on war. The contagion had infected the nearest cantons in Umbria, and the Gauls were being solicited to help as mercenaries. All these were concentrating at the Samnite camp. 
When the news of this sudden rising reached Rome, Lucius Volumnius had already left for Samnium with the second and third legions and fifteen thousand allied troops. It was therefore decided that Appius Claudius should at the earliest possible moment enter Etruria. Two Roman legions followed him, the first and fourth, and twelve thousand allies. He fixed his camp not far from the enemy. The advantage gained by his prompt arrival did not, however, show itself in any wise or fortunate generalship on his part, so much as the check imposed by the fear of Rome upon some of the Etrurian cantons which were mediating war. Several engagements took place in unfavorable positions and at unfortunate times, and the more the enemy's hopes of success, the more formidable he became. Matters almost reached the point when the soldiers distrusted their general, and the general had no confidence in his soldiers. I find it stated by some analysts that he sent a letter to his colleague summoning him from Samnium. But I cannot assert this as a fact, since this very circumstance became a subject of dispute between the two consuls, who were now in office together for the second time. Appius denying that he had sent any letter, and Volumnius insisting that he had been summoned by a letter from Appius. Volumnius had by this time taken three fortified posts in Samnium, in which as many as three thousand men were killed, and almost half that number made prisoners. He had also sent Quintus Fabius, the proconsul, with his veteran army, much to the satisfaction of the Lucanian magnates, to repress the disturbances which had been got up in that part of the country by the plebeian and indigent classes. Leaving the ravaging of the enemy's fields to Decius, he proceeded with his whole force to Etruria. On his arrival he was universally welcomed. As to the way Appius treated him, I think that if he had a clear conscience in this matter, that is, if he had written nothing, his anger was justifiable, but if he had really stood in need of help, he showed a disingenuous and ungrateful spirit in concealing the fact. When he went out to meet his colleague, almost before they had had time to exchange mutual greetings, he asked, Is all well, Volumnius? How are things going in Samnium? What induced you to leave your allotted province? Volumnius replied that all was going on satisfactorily, and that he had come because he had been asked to do so by letter. If it was a forgery, and there was nothing for him to do in Etruria, he would at once countermarch his troops and depart. Well then, said Appius, go, let nobody keep you here, for it is by no means right that whilst perhaps you are hardly able to cope with your own war, you should boast of having come to the assistance of others. May Hercules guide all for the best, replied Volumnius. I would rather have taken all this trouble in vain than that anything should happen which would make one consular army insufficient for Etruria. 19. As the consuls were parting from each other, the staff officers and military tribunes stood round them. Some of them implored their own commander not to reject the assistance of his colleague assistance which he himself ought to have invited and which was now spontaneously offered many of the others tried to stop volumnius as he was leaving and appealed to him not to betray the safety of the republic for a wretched quarrel with his colleague they urged that if any disaster occurred the responsibility for it would fall on the one who abandoned the other not on the other who was abandoned it came to this all the glory of success and all the disgrace of failure in Etruria was transferred to Volumnius. People would not inquire what words Appius had used, but what fortune the army was meeting with. He may have been dismissed by Appius, but his presence was demanded by the Republic and by the army. He had only to test the feelings of the soldiers to find this out for himself. Amidst appeals and warnings of this character, they almost dragged the reluctant consuls into a council of war. There the dispute which had previously been witnessed by only a few went on at a much greater length. Volumnius had not only the stronger case, but he showed himself by no means a bad speaker, even when compared with the exceptional eloquence of his colleague. 
Papias remarked sarcastically that they ought to look upon it as due to him that they had a consul who was actually able to speak, instead of the dumb, inarticulate man he once was. In their former consulship, especially during the first months of office, he could not open his lips. Now he was becoming quite a popular speaker. Volumnius observed, I would much rather that you had learnt from me to act with vigour and decision than that I should have learnt from you to be a clever speaker. He finally made a proposal which would settle the question, who was, not the better orator, for that was not what the Republic needed, but the better commander. The two provinces were Aturia and Samnium. Appius might choose which he preferred. He, Volumnius, was willing to conduct operations either in Aturia or in Samnium. On this the soldiers began to clamor. They insisted that both consuls should carry on the war in Aturia. When Volumnius saw that this was the general wish, he said, Since I have made a mistake in interpreting my colleagues' wishes, I will take care that there shall be no doubt as to what it is that you want. Signify your wishes by acclamation. Do you wish me to stay or to go? Such a shout arose in reply that it brought the enemy out of their camp. Seizing their arms, they came down to the battlefield. Then Volumnius ordered the battle signal to be sounded and the standards to be carried out of the camp. Appius, it is said, was for some time undecided, as he saw that whether he fought or remained inactive, the victory would be his colleagues. But at last, fearing lest his legions also should follow Volumnius, he yielded to their loud demands and gave the signal for battle. Defeat of the Allies on both sides the dispositions were far from complete. The Samnite captain-general, Gellius Ignatius, had gone off with a few cohorts on a foraging expedition, and his troops commenced the battle in obedience to their own impulses rather than to any word of command. The Roman armies again were not both led to the attack at the same time, nor was sufficient time allowed for their formation. Volumnius was engaged before Appius reached the enemy, so the battle began on an irregular front, and the usual opponents happened to be interchanged, the Etruscans fighting Volumnius, and the Samnites, after a short delay owing to their leader's absence, closing with Appius. The story runs that he lifted up his hands to heaven so as to be visible to those about the foremost standards, and uttered this prayer. Bologna, if thou wilt grant us victory to-day, I, in return, vow a temple to thee. After this prayer it seemed as though the goddess had inspired him, he displayed a courage equal to his colleagues, or indeed to that of the whole army. Nothing was lacking on the part of the generals to ensure success, and the rank and file in each of the consular armies did their utmost to prevent the other from being the first to achieve victory. The enemy were quite unable to withstand a force so much greater than any they had been accustomed to meet, and were in consequence routed and put to flight. The Romans pressed the attack when they began to give ground, and when they broke and fled, followed them up till they had driven them to their camp. There the appearance of Gellius and his cohorts led to a brief stand being made. Soon, however, these were routed, and the victors attacked the camp. Volumnius, encouraging his men by his own example, led the attack upon one of the gates in person, whilst Appius was kindling the courage of his troops by repeatedly invoking Bologna the victorious. They succeeded in forcing their way through rampart and fossi, the camp was captured and plundered, and a very considerable amount of booty was discovered and given to the soldiery. Six thousand nine hundred of the enemy were killed. 2,120 made prisoners. 20. A Samnite army surprised and routed. Whilst both the consuls with the whole strength of Rome were devoting their energies more and more to the Etruscan war, fresh armies were raised in Samnium for the purpose of ravaging the territories which belonged to the feudatories of Rome. They passed through the Vesini into the country round Capua and Falernum, and secured immense spoil, 
Volumnius was returning to Samnium by forced marches, bore the extended command of Fabius and Decius had almost expired, when he heard of the devastations which the Samnites were committing in Campania. He at once diverted his route in that direction to protect our allies. When he was in the neighborhood of Cales, he saw for himself the fresh traces of the destruction that had been wrought and the inhabitants informed him that the enemy were carrying off so much plunder that they could hardly keep any proper formation on the march. In fact, their generals had openly given out that they dared not expose an army so heavily laden to the chances of battle, and they must at once return to Samnium and leave their plunder there, after which they would return for a fresh raid. However true all this might be, Volumnius thought he ought to get further information, and accordingly he dispatched some cavalry to pick up any stragglers they might find among the raiders. On questioning them, he learnt that the enemy were halted on the river Volturnus, and were going to move forward at the third watch and take the road to Samnium. Satisfied with this information, he marched on and fixed his camp at such a distance from the enemy that while it was not close enough for his arrival to be detected, it was sufficiently near to allow of his surprising them while they were leaving their camp. Some time before daylight, he approached their camp and sent some men familiar with the Oscan language to find out what was going on. Mingling with the enemy, an easy matter in the confusion of a nocturnal departure, they found that the standards had already gone with only a few to defend them, the booty and those who were to escort it were just leaving, the army as a whole were incapable of any military evolution, for each was looking after his own affairs, without any mutually arranged plan of action, or any definite orders from their commander. This seemed the moment for delivering his attack, and daylight was approaching, so he ordered the advance to be sounded, and attacked the enemy's column. The Samnites were encumbered with their booty, only a few were in fighting trim, some hurried on and drove before them the animals they had seized, others halted, undecided whether to go on or retreat to their camp. In the midst of their hesitation, they were surrounded and cut off. The Romans had now got over the rampart, and the camp became a scene of wild disorder and carnage. The confusion created in the Samnite column by the swiftness of the attack was increased by the sudden outbreak of their prisoners. Some, after releasing themselves, broke the fetters of those round them, others snatched the weapons which were fastened up with the baggage and created in the centre of the column a tumult more appalling even than the battle which was going on. Then they achieved a most extraordinary feat. Statius Minasius, the general commanding, was riding up and down the ranks encouraging his men, when the prisoners attacked him, and after dispersing his escort, hurried him off, while still in the saddle, as a prisoner to the Roman consul. The noise and the tumult recalled the cohorts who were at the head of the column, and the battle was resumed, but only for a short time, as a long resistance was impossible. As many as six thousand men were killed, there were two thousand five hundred prisoners, amongst them four military tribunes, thirty standards were taken, and what gave the victors more pleasure than anything else, seven thousand four hundred captives were rescued, and the immense booty which had been taken from the allies recovered. Public notice was given inviting the owners to identify and recover what belonged to them. Everything for which no owner appeared on the appointed day was given to the soldiers, but they were obliged to sell it all that nothing might distract their thoughts from their military duties. 21. This predatory incursion into Campania created great excitement in Rome, and it so happened that just at this time grave news was received from Etruria. After the withdrawal of Volumnius's army, the whole country, acting in concert with the Samnite captain-general Gellius Ignatius, had risen in arms, whilst the Umbrians were being called on to join the movement, and the Gauls were being approached with offers of lavish pay. The Senate, thoroughly alarmed at these tidings, ordered all legal and other business to be suspended, and men of all ages and of every class to be enrolled for service. 
not only were the free born and all within the military age obliged to take the oath but cohorts were formed of the older men and even the freedmen were formed into centuries arrangements were made for the defence of the city and publius sempronius took supreme command the senate was however relieved of some of its anxiety by the receipt of despatches from lucius volumnius from which it was ascertained that the raiders of campania had been routed and killed thanksgivings for this success were ordered in honour of the consul the suspension of business was withdrawn after lasting eighteen days and the thanksgivings were of a most joyous character the next question was the protection of the district which had been devastated by the samnites and it was decided to settle bodies of colonists about the vicinian and Falernian country one was to be at the mouth of the Lyris, now called the colony of Menterna, the other in the Vecinian forest, where it is contiguous with the territory of Falernum. Here the Greek city of Sinope is said to have stood, and from this the Romans gave the place the name of Senusa. It was arranged that the tribunes of the plebs should get a plebiscite, passed requiring Publius Sempronius, the praetor, to appoint commissioners for the founding of colonies in those spots but it was not easy to find people to be sent to what was practically a permanent outpost in a dangerously hostile country, instead of having fields allotted to them for cultivation. The attention of the Senate was diverted from these matters to the growing seriousness of the outlook in Etruria. There were frequent dispatches from Appius, warning them not to neglect the movement that was going on in that part of the world. Four nations were in arms together, the Etruscans, the Samnites, the Umbrians, and the Gauls, and they were compelled to form two separate camps, for one place would not hold so great a multitude. The date of the elections was approaching, and Volumnius was recalled to Rome to conduct them, and also to advise on the general policy. Before calling upon the sentries to vote, he summoned the people to an assembly. Here he dwelt at some length upon the serious nature of the war in Etruria. Even, he said, when he and his colleague were conducting a joint campaign, the war was on too large a scale for any single general with his one army to cope with. Since then he understood that the Umbrians and an enormous force of Gauls had swollen the ranks of their enemies. The electors must bear in mind that two consuls were being elected on that day to act against four nations. The choice of the Roman people would, he felt certain, fall on the one man who was unquestionably the foremost of all their generals. Had he not felt sure of this, he was prepared to nominate him at once as dictator. 22. After this speech, no one felt the slightest doubt that Quintus Fabius would be unanimously elected. The prerogative sentries and all those of the first class were voting for him, and Volumnius, when he again addressed the electors very much in the terms he had employed two years before, and as on the former occasion when he yielded to the universal wish, so now he again requested that Publius Decius might be his colleague. He would be a support for his old age to lean upon. They had been together as censors and twice as consuls, and he had learnt by experience that nothing went further to protect the state than harmony between colleagues. He felt that he could hardly at his time of life get accustomed to a new comrade in office. He could so much more easily share all his counsels with one whose character and disposition he knew. Volumnius confirmed what Fabius had said. He bestowed a well-deserved encomium on Decius, and pointed out what an advantage in military operations is gained by harmony between the consuls, and what mischief is wrought when they are at variance. He mentioned as an instance the recent misunderstanding between him and his colleague, which almost led to a national disaster, and he solemnly admonished Decius and Fabius that they should live together with one mind and one heart. They were, he continued, born commanders, great in action, unskilled in wordy debate, possessing in fact all the qualifications of a consul. Those, on the other hand, who were clever and cunning in law, 
and practised pleaders like Appius Claudius ought to be employed in the city and on the bench, they should be elected praetors to administer justice. The discussion and the assembly lasted the whole day. On the morrow the elections were held for both consuls and praetors. The consul's recommendation was acted upon, Quintus Fabius and Publius Decius were elected consuls, and Appius Claudius was returned as praetor. They were all elected in their absence. The Senate passed a resolution, which the assembly confirmed by a plebiscite, that Volumnius's command should be extended for a year. 23. Affairs in the City Several portents occurred this year, and, with the view of averting them, the Senate passed a decree that special intercessions should be offered for two days. The wine and incense were provided at the public cost, and both men and women attended the religious functions in great numbers. This time of special observance was rendered memorable by a quarrel which broke out amongst the matrons in the chapel of the patrician Pudicitia, which is in the form Borium, against the round temple of Hercules. Virginia, the daughter of Aulus Virginius, a patrician, had married the plebeian consul Lucius Volumnius, and the matrons excluded her from their sacred rites because she had married outside the patriciate. This led to a brief altercation, which, as the women became excited, soon blazed up into a storm of passion. Virginia protested with perfect truth that she entered the temple of Prudicitia as a patrician and a pure woman, the wife of one man to whom she had been betrothed as a virgin, and she had nothing to be ashamed of in her husband or in his honourable career and the offices which he had held. The effect of her high-spirited language was considerably enhanced by her subsequent action. In the Vicus Longus, where she lived, she shut off a portion of her house, sufficient to form a moderately sized chapel, and set up an altar there. She then called the plebeian matrons together, and told them how unjustly she had been treated by the patrician ladies. I am dedicating, she said, this altar to the plebeian Pudicitia, and I earnestly exhort you as matrons to show the same spirit of emulation on the score of chastity that the men of this city display with regard to courage, so that this altar may, if possible, have the reputation of being honoured with a holier observance, and by purer worshippers than that of the patricians. The ritual and ceremonial practised at this altar was almost identical with that at the older one. No matron was allowed to sacrifice there whose moral character was not well attested, and who had had more than one husband. Afterwards it was polluted by the presence of women of every kind, not matrons only, and finally passed into oblivion. The curial ideals, Gnaeus and Quintus Olgolnius brought up several money-lenders for trial this year. The proportion of their fines which was paid into the treasury was devoted to various public objects. The wooden thresholds of the capital were replaced by bronze, silver vessels were made for the three tables in the shrine of Jupiter, and a statue of the god himself, seated in a four-horsed chariot, was set up on the roof. They have also placed near the Ficus Ruminalis, a group representing the founders of the city as infants, being suckled by the she-wolf. The street leading from the Porta Capena to the Temple of Mars was paved under their instructions with stone slabs. Some graziers were also prosecuted for exceeding the number of cattle allowed them on the public land, and the plebeian ideals, Lucius Aelius Paetus and Gaius Fulvius Curvus, spent the money derived from their fines on public games and a set of golden bowls to be placed in the temple of Ceres. End of section 24section 25 of the history of rome volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the history of rome volume 2 by thivy translated by william maspin roberts book 10 chapters 24 to 30 Chapter 24 The Consuls at Variance 
Quintus Fabius and Publius Decius were now entering their year of office, the former being consul for the fifth time, the latter for the fourth. Twice before they had been consuls together, they had held the censorship together, and the perfect unanimity between them, quite as much as their discharge of its duties, made their tenure of office a distinguished one. But this was not to last for ever. The conflict which broke out between them was, however, I think, due more to the antagonism of the two orders to which they belonged than to any personal feeling on their part. The patrician senators were extremely anxious that Fabius should have Etruria assigned to him without going through the usual procedure. The plebeian senators urged Decius to insist upon the question being settled in the usual way, by lot. There was, at all events, a sharp division of opinion in the Senate, and, when it became apparent that the Fabian interest was the stronger, the matter was referred to the people. As both were first of all soldiers, trusting more to deeds than to words, their speeches before the assembly were brief. Fabius declared that it would be an unworthy proceeding if another should gather up the fruit beneath the tree which he had planted. He had opened up the Ciminian forest and made a way through pathless jungle for the armies of Rome. Why had they troubled him at his time of life if they were going to carry on the war under another general? Then he turned to Decius. Surely, he said, I have chosen an opponent, not a comrade in office. Decius is annoyed at our three years of joint power having been so harmonious. Finally, he asserted that he desired nothing more than that if they thought him worthy of that command, they should send him there. He had bowed to the will of the Senate, and should accept the decision of the people. Publius Decius, in reply, protested against the injustice of the Senate. The patricians, he said, had done their utmost to exclude the plebeians from the great offices of the state, since personal merit had so far won the day that it no longer failed of recognition in any class of men, their object was now not only to stultify the deliberate decisions of the people as expressed by their votes, but even to turn the judgments which fortune is ever passing into so many reasons for retaining their power, small as their number was. All the consuls before his time had drawn lots for their commands. Now the Senate was giving Fabius his province independently of the lot. If this was simply as a mark of honor, then he would admit that Fabius had rendered services both to the Republic and to himself, and he would gladly consent to anything that would add to his reputation, provided it did not involve casting a slur upon himself. But who could fail to see that when a peculiarly difficult and formidable war is entrusted to one consul without any resort to the lot? It means that the other consul is regarded as superfluous and useless. Fabius pointed with pride to his achievements in Etruria. Decius wished to be able to do so too, and possibly he might succeed in totally extinguishing the fire which the other had only smothered, and smothered in such a way that it was constantly breaking out where one least expected and fresh conflagrations. He was prepared to concede honors and rewards to his colleague out of respect to his age and position, but when it was a question of danger or fighting, he did not give way, and would not voluntarily. If he gained nothing else from this dispute, he would at least gain this much, that the people should decide a question which was theirs to decide, rather than that the Senate should show undue partiality. He prayed Jupiter Optimus Maximus and the immortal gods to grant to him the impartial chance of the lot with his colleague, if they were going to grant them each the same courage and good fortune in the conduct of the war. It was, at all events, a thing eminently fair in itself, and an excellent precedent for all time, and a thing which touched the good name of Rome very closely, that both the consuls should be men by either of whom the Etruscan war could be conducted without any risk of failure. Fabius's only reply was to entreat the people to listen to some dispatches which had been sent by Appius before they proceeded to vote. He then left the assembly. The people were no less strong in his support than the Senate had been, and Etruria was decreed to Fabius without any casting of lots.
25. Preparations to meet the four nations. When this decision was come to, all the men of military age flocked to the consul, and every one began to give in his name, so eager were they to serve under him as their general. Seeing himself surrounded by this crowd, he called out, I do not intend to enlist more than four thousand infantry and six hundred cavalry, and will take with me those of you who give in your names today and tomorrow. I am more concerned to bring you all back wealthy men than to have a large number of men for my fighting force. With this compact army full of confidence and hope, all the more so because he felt no need of a great host, he marched to the town of Aharna, which was not far from the enemy, and from there went on to Appius's camp. He was still some miles distant from it, when he was met by some soldiers sent to cut wood, who were accompanied by an armed escort. When they saw the lictors marching in front of him, and heard that it was Fabius their consul, they were overjoyed and thanked the gods and the people of Rome for having sent him to them as their commander. As they pressed round the consul to salute him, Fabius asked them where they were going, and on their replying that they were going to cut wood, "'What do you say?' he inquired. "'Surely you have a ramparted camp.' They informed him that they had a double rampart and fosse round the camp, and yet they were in a state of mortal fear. Well then, he replied, go back and pull down your stockade, and you will have quite enough wood. They returned into camp and began to demolish the rampart, to the great terror of those who had remained in camp, and especially of Appius himself, until the news spread from one to another that they were acting under the orders of Quintus Fabius the consul. On the following day the camp was shifted, and Appius was sent back to Rome to take up his duties as praetor. From that time the Romans had no standing camp. Fabius said that it was bad for the army to remain fixed in one spot. It became more healthy and active by frequent marches and change of position. They made as long and frequent marches as the season allowed, for the winter was not yet over. As soon as spring set in, he left the second legion at Clusium, formerly called Camars, and placed Lucius Scipio in charge of the camp as pro praetor. He then returned to Rome to consult the Senate as to future operations. He may have taken this step on his own initiative, after finding from personal observation that the war was a bigger thing than he had believed it to be from the reports received, or he may have been summoned home by the Senate. Both reasons are assigned by our authorities. Some want to make it appear that he was compelled to return, owing to the action of Appius Claudius, who had sent alarming dispatches about the state of things in Etruria, and was now adding to the alarm by his speeches in the Senate and before the Assembly. He considered one general with only one army quite insufficient to cope with four nations, whether they combined their forces against him or acted separately. There was the danger of his being unable, single-handed, to meet all emergencies. He had left only two legions there, and less than five thousand infantry and cavalry had arrived with Fabius, and he advised that Publius Decius should join his colleague in Etruria as soon as possible. Samnium could be handed over to Lucius Volumnius, or if the consul preferred to keep to his own province, Volumnius should go to the support of Fabius with a full consular army. As the praetor's representations were producing a considerable impression, we are told that Decius gave it as his opinion that Fabius ought not to be interfered with, but left free to act as he thought best, until he had either himself come to Rome, if he could do so with safety to the state, or had sent some member of his staff from whom the Senate could learn the actual state of things in Etruria, what force would be necessary, and how many generals would be required. 26. Immediately on his arrival in Rome, Fabius addressed the Senate and also the Assembly on the subject of the war. His tone was calm and temperate, he did not exaggerate, nor did he underrate the difficulties. 
If, he said, he accepted a colleague's assistance, it would be more out of consideration for other people's fears than to provide against any danger either to himself or to the Republic. If, however, they did give him a coadjutor to be associated with him in the command, how could he possibly overlook Publius Decius, who had been so frequently his colleague, and whom he knew so well? There was no one in the world whom he would sooner have. If Decius were with him, he should always find his forces sufficient for the work, and never find the enemy too numerous for him to deal with. If his colleague preferred some other arrangement, they might give him Lucius Volumnius. The people, the Senate, and his own colleague all agreed that Fabius should have a perfectly free hand in the matter, and when Decius made it clear that he was ready to go either to Samnium or to Etruria, there was universal joy and congratulation. Victory was already regarded as certain, and it looked as though a triumph, and not a serious war, had been decreed to the consuls. I find it stated in some authorities that Fabius and Decius both started for Etruria immediately Immediately on entering office, no mention being made of their not deciding their provinces by lot, or of the quarrel between the colleagues which I have described. Some, on the other hand, were not satisfied with simply narrating the dispute, but have given in addition certain charges which Appius brought against the absent Fabius before the people, and the bitter attacks he made upon him in his presence, and mention is made of a second quarrel between the colleagues caused by Decius insisting that each should keep the province assigned to him, we find more agreement amongst the authorities from the time that both consuls left Rome for the scene of war. But before the consuls arrived in Etruria, the Senonian Gauls came in immense numbers to Clusium with the intention of attacking the Roman camp and the legion stationed there. Scipio was in command, and thinking to assist the scantiness of his numbers by taking up a strong position, he marched his force on to a hill which lay between his camp and the city. The enemy had appeared so suddenly that he had had no time to reconnoitre the ground, and he went on towards the summit after the enemy had already seized it, having approached it from the other side. So the legion was attacked in front and rear, and completely surrounded. Some offers say that the entire legion was wiped out there, not a man being left to carry the tidings, and that, though the consuls were not far from Clusium at the time, no report of the disaster reached them, until Gaulish horsemen appeared with the heads of the slain hanging from their horses' chests, and fixed on the points of their spears, whilst they chanted war songs after their manner. According to another tradition, they were not Gauls at all, but Umbrians, nor was there a great disaster. A foraging party commanded by Lucius Manlius Torquatus, a staff officer, was surrounded, but Scipio sent assistance from the camp, and in the end the Umbrians were defeated, and the prisoners and booty recovered. It is more probable that this defeat was inflicted by Gauls and not by Umbrians, for the fears of an eruption of Gauls which had been so often aroused were especially present to the minds of the citizens this year, and every precaution was taken to meet it. The force with which the consuls had taken the field consisted of four legions and a large body of cavalry, in addition to one thousand picked Campanian troopers detailed for this war, whilst the contingents furnished by the allies in the Latin League formed an even larger army than the Roman army. But in addition to this large force, two other armies were stationed not far from the city, confronting Etruria one in the Faliscan district, another in the neighborhood of the Vatican. The pro-praetors, Gnaeus Fulvius and Lucius Postumius Megalus, had been instructed to fix their standing camps in those positions. 27. The Battle of Sentinum After crossing the Apenninines, the consuls descended into the district of Sentinum and fixed their camp about four miles distant from the enemy. The four nations consulted together as to their plan of action, and it was decided that they should not all be mixed up in one camp, nor go into battle at the same time. The Gauls were linked with the Samnites, the Umbrians with the Etrurians. 
They fixed upon the day of battle. The brunt of the fighting was to be reserved for the Gauls and Samnites. In the midst of the struggle, the Etruscans and Umbrians were to attack the Roman camp. These arrangements were upset by three deserters, who came in the secrecy of night to Fabius and disclosed the enemy's plans. They were rewarded for their information, and dismissed with instructions to find out and report whatever fresh decision was arrived at. The consuls sent written instructions to Fulvius and Postumius to bring their armies up to Clusium, and ravage the enemy's country on their march as far as they possibly could. The news of these ravages brought the Etruscans away from Sentinum to protect their own territory. Now that they had got them out of the way, the consuls tried hard to bring on an engagement. For two days they sought to provoke the enemy to fight, but during those two days nothing took place worth mentioning. A few fell on both sides, and enough exasperation was produced to make them desire a regular battle without, however, wishing to hazard everything on a decisive conflict. On the third day, the whole force on both sides marched down into the plain. Whilst the two armies were standing ready to engage, a hind driven by a wolf from the mountains ran down into the open space between the two lines with the wolf in pursuit. Here they each took a different direction. The hind ran to the Gauls, the wolf to the Romans. Way was made for the wolf between the ranks. The Gauls speared the hind. On this a soldier in the front rank exclaimed, In that place where you see the creature sacred to Diana lying dead, flight and carnage will begin. Here the wolf, whole and unhurt, a creature sacred to Mars, reminds us of our founder, and that we too are of the race of Mars. The Gauls were stationed on the right, the Samnites on the left. Quintus Fabius posted the first and third legions on the right wing, facing the Samnites, to oppose the Gauls. Decius had the fifth and sixth legions, who formed the Roman left. The second and fourth legions were engaged in Samnium, with Lucius Volumnius the proconsul. When the armies first met, they were so evenly matched that had the Etruscans and Umbrians been present, whether taking part in the battle or attacking the camp, the Romans must have been defeated. 28. But although neither side was gaining any advantage, and fortune had not yet indicated in any way to whom she would grant the victory, the fighting on the right wing was very different from that on the left. The Romans under Fabius were acting more on the defensive and were protracting the contest as long as possible. Their commander knew that it was the habitual practice of both the Gauls and the Samnites to make a furious attack to begin with, and if that were successfully resisted, it was enough. The courage of the Samnites gradually sank as the battle went on, whilst the Gauls, utterly unable to stand heat or exertion, found their physical strength melting away. In their first efforts they were more than men, in the end they were weaker than women. Knowing this, he kept the strength of his men unimpaired against the time when the enemy usually began to show signs of defeat. Decius, as a younger man, possessing more vigor of mind, showed more dash. He made use of all the strength he possessed in opening the attack, and as the infantry battle developed too slowly for him, he called on the cavalry. Putting himself at the head of a squadron of exceptionally gallant troopers, he appealed to them, as the pick of his soldiers, to follow him in charging the enemy, for a twofold glory would be theirs if victory began on the left wing, and in that wing with the cavalry. Twice they swept aside the Gaulish horse. Making a third charge, they were carried too far, and whilst they were now fighting desperately in the midst of the enemy's cavalry, they were thrown into consternation by a new style of warfare. Armed men, mounted on chariots and baggage wagons, came on with a thunderous noise of horses and wheels, and the horses of the Roman cavalry, unaccustomed to that kind of uproar, became uncontrollable through fright. The cavalry, after their victorious charges, were now scattered in frantic terror. 
Horses and men alike were overthrown in their blind flight. Even the standards of the legionaries were thrown into confusion, and many of the front-rank men were crushed by the weight of the horses and vehicles dashing through the lines. When the Gauls saw their enemy thus demoralized, they did not give them a moment's breathing space in which to recover themselves, but followed up at once with a fierce attack. Decius shouted to his men and asked them whither they were fleeing, what hope they had in flight he tried to stop those who were retreating and recall the scattered units finding himself unable do what he would to check the demoralization he invoked the name of his father publius decius and cried why do i any longer delay the destined fate of my family this is the privilege granted to our house that we should be an expiatory sacrifice to avert dangers from, from the state now will I offer the legions of the enemy together with myself as a sacrifice to Tellus and the Dii Manes. When he had uttered these words, he ordered the pontiff, Marcus Livius, whom he had kept by his side all through the battle, to recite the prescribed form in which he was to devote himself and the legions of the enemy on behalf of the army of the Roman people, the Quirites. He was accordingly devoted in the same words and wearing the same garb as his father. Father, Publius Decius, at the Battle of Vesserus in the Latin War. After the usual prayers had been recited, he uttered the following awful curse. I carry before me terror and rout and carnage and blood and the wrath of all the gods, those above and those below. I will infect the standards, the armor, the weapons of the enemy with dire and manifold death. The place of my destruction shall also witness that of the Gauls and Samnites. After uttering this imprecation on himself and on the enemy, he spurred his horse against that part of the Gaulish line where they were most densely massed, and leaping into it, was slain by their missiles. 29. From this moment the battle could hardly have appeared to any man to be dependent on human strength alone. After losing their leader, a thing which generally demoralizes an army, the Romans arrested their flight and recommenced the struggle. The Gauls, especially those who were crowded round the consul's body, were discharging their missiles aimlessly and harmlessly as though bereft of their senses. Some seemed paralyzed, incapable of either fight or flight. But, in the other army, the pontiff Livius, to whom Decius had transferred his lictors, and whom he had commissioned to act as propraetor, announced in loud tones that the consul's death had freed the Romans from all danger, and given them the victory. The Gauls and Samnites were made over to Tellus the mother, and the Dii Manes. Decius was summoning and dragging down to himself the army which he had devoted together with himself. There was terror everywhere among the enemy, and the furies were lashed them into madness. Whilst the battle was thus being restored, Lucius Cornelius Scipio and Gaius Marcius were ordered by Fabius to bring up the reserves from the rear to the support of his colleagues. There they learnt the fate of Publius Decius, and it was a powerful encouragement to them to dare everything for the Republic. The Gauls were standing in close order covered by their shields, and a hand-to-hand -hand fight seemed no easy matter, but the staff officers gave orders for the javelins which were lying on the ground between the two armies to be gathered up and hurled at the enemy's shield wall. Although most of them stuck in their shields and only a few penetrated their bodies, the closely massed ranks went down, most of them falling without having received a wound, just as though they had been struck by lightning. Such was the change that fortune had brought about in the Roman left wing. On the right, Fabius, as I have stated, was protracting the contest, when he found that neither the battle shout of the enemy, nor their onset, nor the discharge of their missiles were as strong as they had been at the beginning, he ordered the officers in command of the cavalry to take their squadrons round to the side of the Samnite army, ready at a given signal to deliver as fierce a flank attack as possible. The infantry were at the same time to press steadily forwards and dislodge the enemy. When he saw that they were offering no resistance, and were evidently worn out, he massed all his support which he had kept in reserve for the supreme moment, and gave the signal for a general charge of infantry and cavalry. The Samnites could not face the onslaught, and fled precipitately past the Gauls to their camp, leaving their allies to fight as best they could. 
The Gauls were still standing in close order behind their shield wall. Phoebus, on hearing of his colleague's death, ordered a squadron of Campanian horse, about five hundred strong, to go out of action and ride round to take the Gauls in the rear. The principes of the Third Legion were ordered to follow, and wherever they saw the enemy's line disordered by the cavalry, to press home the attack and cut them down. He vowed a temple and the spoils of the enemy to Jupiter Victor, and then proceeded to the Samnite camp to which the whole crowd of panic-struck fugitives was being being driven. As they could not all get through the gates, those outside tried to resist the Roman attack, and a battle began close under the rampart. It was here that Gellius Ignatius, the captain-general of the Samnites, fell. Finally the Samnites were driven within their lines, and the camp was taken after a brief struggle. At the same time the Gauls were attacked in the rear and overpowered, twenty-five thousand of the enemy were killed in that day's fighting, and eight thousand made prisoners. The victory was by no means a bloodless one, for Publius Decius lost seven thousand killed and Fabius one thousand seven hundred. After sending out a search party to find his colleague's body, Fabius had the spoils of the enemy collected into a heap and burnt as a sacrifice to Jupiter Victor. The consul's body could not be found that day, as it was buried under a heap of galls. It was discovered the next day and brought back to camp amidst the tears of the soldiers. Fabius laid aside all other business in order to pay the last rites to his dead colleague. The obsequies were conducted with every mark of honor, and the funeral oration sounded the well-deserved praises of the deceased consul. 30. Fabius Celebrates His Triumph during these occurrences in Umbria, Gnaeus Fulvius the Propraetor was succeeding to the utmost of his wishes in Etruria. Not only did he carry destruction far and wide over the enemy's fields, but he fought a brilliant action with the united forces of Perusia and Clusium, in which more than three thousand of the enemy were killed, and as many as twenty standards taken. The remains of the Samnite army attempted to escape through the Polygnian territory, but were intercepted by the native troops, and out of five thousand as many as one thousand were killed. Great as the glory of the day on which the battle of Centidum was fought must appear to any writer who adheres to the truth, it has by some writers been exaggerated beyond all belief. They assert that the enemy's army amounted to a million infantry and forty-six thousand cavalry, together with one thousand war chariots. That, of course, includes the Umbrians and Tuscans who are represented as taking part in the battle. And by way of increasing the Roman in strength, they tell us that Lucius Volumnius commanded in the action as well as the consuls, and that their legions were supplemented by his army. In the majority of the analysts, the victory is assigned only to the two consuls. Volumnius is described as campaigning during that time in Samnium, and after driving a Samnite army on to Mount Tifernus, he succeeded, in spite of the difficulty of the position, in defeating and routing them. Quintus Fabius left Decius's army to hold Etruria, and led back his own legions to the city to enjoy a triumph over the Gauls, the Etruscans, and the Samnites. In the songs which the soldiers sang in the procession, the glorious death of Decius was celebrated quite as much as the victory of Fabius, and they recalled the father's memory in their praises of the son who had rivaled his father in his devotion, and all that it had done for the state. Out of the spoils each soldier received eighty-two assies of bronze, with cloaks and tunics, rewards not to be despised in those days. End of section 25section 26 of the History of Rome, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Rome, Volume 2, by Livy, translated by William Maspin Roberts. Book 10, Chapters 31 to 38. Chapter 31, Progress of the Samnite War. In spite of these defeats, Neither the Etruscans nor the Samnites remained quiet. 
After the consul had withdrawn his army, the Prussians recommenced hostilities. A force of Samnites descended into the country round Vesia and Formier, plundering and harrying as they went, whilst another body invaded the district of Icernum and the region round the Volturnus. Appius Claudius was sent against these with Decius's old army. Fabius, who had marched into Etruria, slew 4,500 of the Perusians and took 1,740 prisoners, who were ransomed at 310 asses per head. The rest of the booty was given to the soldiers. The Samnites, one body of which was pursued by Appius Claudius, the other by Lucius Volumnius, effected a junction in the Stellate district and took up a position there. A desperate battle was fought. The one army was furious against those who had so often taken up arms against them. The other felt that this was their last hope. The Samnites lost 16,300 killed and 2,700 prisoners. On the side of the Romans, 2,700 fell. As far as military operations went, the year was a prosperous one, but it was rendered an anxious one by a severe pestilence and by alarming portents. In many places, showers of earth were reported to have fallen, and a large number of men in the army under Appius Claudius were said to have been struck by lightning. The sacred books were consulted in view of these occurrences. During this year, Quintus Fabius Gurgis, the consul's son, who was an ideal, brought some matrons to trial before the people on the charge of adultery. Out of their fines he obtained sufficient money to build the Temple of Venus which stands near the circus. The Samnite wars are still with us, those wars which I have been occupied with through these last four books, and which have gone on continuously for six and forty years, in fact ever since the consuls, Marcus Valerius and Aulus Cornelius, carried the arms of Rome for the first time into Samnium. It is unnecessary now to recount the numberless defeats which overtook both nations, and the toils which they endured through all those years and yet these things were powerless to break down the resolution or crush the spirit of that people i will only allude to the events of the past year during that period the samnites fighting sometimes alone sometimes in conjunction with other nations had been defeated by roman armies under roman generals on four several occasions at centinum among the paligni at tifernum and in the stellate plains they had lost the most brilliant general they ever possessed they now saw their allies etruscans umbrians gauls overtaken by the same fortune that they had suffered they were unable any longer to stand either in their own strength or in that afforded by foreign arms and yet they would not abstain from war so far were they from being weary of defending their liberty even though unsuccessfully that they would rather be worsted than give up trying for victory what sort of a man must he be who would find the long story of those wars tedious, though he is only narrating or reading it, when they failed to wear out those who were actually engaged in them? 32. Quintus Fabius and Publius Decius were succeeded in the consulship by Lucius Postumius Medullus and Marcus Attilius Regulus. Samnium was assigned to both of them as the field of operations. In consequence of information received that three armies had been raised there, one being destined for Etruria, another was to ravage Campania, and the third was intended for the defense of their frontiers. Illness kept Postumius in Rome, but Attilius marched out at once in accordance with the Senate's instructions, with the view of surprising the Samnite armies before they had started on their expeditions. He met the enemy, as though they had had a previous understanding, at a point where he himself was stopped from entering the Samnite country, and at the same time barred any movement on their part towards Roman territory or the peaceable lands of her allies. The two camps confronted each other, and the Samnites, with the recklessness that comes of despair, ventured upon an enterprise which the Romans, who had been so often victorious, would hardly have undertaken, namely an attack on the enemy's camp. 
The daring attempt did not achieve its end, but it was not altogether fruitless. During a great part of the day there had been so dense a fog that it was not only impossible to see anything beyond the rampart, but even people who were together were unable to see each other. The Samnites, relying on their movements being concealed, came on in the dim twilight, what light there was being obscured by the fog, and reached the outpost in front of the gate, who were keeping a careless lookout, and who, being thus attacked unawares, had neither the strength nor the courage to offer any resistance. After disposing of the guard, they entered the camp through the decuman gate, and got possession of the quaestor's tent, the quaestor, Lucius Apemius Pansa, being killed. Then there was a general call to arms. 33. The consul, roused by the tumult, ordered two of the allied cohorts, those from Lucca and Sussa, which happened to be the nearest, to protect the headquarters tent, and then he mustered the maniples in the Via Principalis. They got into line almost before they were in proper fighting trim, and they located the enemy by the direction of the shouting rather than by anything that they could see. As to his numbers, they were quite unable to form any estimate. Doubtful as to their position, they at first retreated, and thus allowed the enemy to advance as far as the middle of the camp. Seeing this, the consul asked them whether they were going to be driven outside their rampart, and then try to recover their camp by assaulting it. Then they raised the battle shout, and steadily held their ground until they were able to take the offensive and force the enemy back, which they did persistently without giving him a moment's respite, until they had driven him outside the gate and past the rampart. Further than that they did not venture to go in pursuit, because the bad light made them fear the possibility of a surprise. Content with having cleared the enemy out of the camp, they retired within the rampart, having killed about three hundred. On the Roman side, the outpost who were killed and those who fell round the quaestor's tent amounted to two hundred and thirty. The partial success of this daring maneuver raised the spirits of the Samnites, and they not only prevented the Romans from advancing, but they even kept the foraging parties out of their fields, who had consequently to fall back on the pacified district of Sora. The report of this occurrence which reached Rome, and which was a much more sensational one than the facts warranted, compelled the other consul, Lucius Postumius, to leave the city before his health was quite re-established. He issued a general order for his men to assemble at Sora, and previous to his departure he dedicated the temple to victory which he had when Curel Ideal built out of the proceeds of vines. On rejoining his army, he marched from Sora to his colleague's camp. The Samnites despaired of offering an effectual resistance to two consular armies and withdrew. The consuls then proceeded in different directions to lay waste their fields and storm their cities. 34. Amongst the latter was Milania, which Postumius unsuccessfully attempted to carry by assault. He then attacked the place by regular approaches, and after his finier were brought up to the walls, he forced an entrance. From ten o'clock in the morning till two in the afternoon, fighting went on in all quarters of the town with doubtful result. At last the Romans got possession of the place. 3,200 Samnites were killed, and 4,700 made prisoners, in addition to the rest of the booty. From there the legions marched to Ferrichum, but the townsfolk evacuated the place quietly during the night, taking with them all their possessions, everything which could be either driven or carried. Immediately on his reaching the vicinity, the consul approached the walls with his men prepared for action, as though there was going to be as much fighting there as there had been at Miliania. When he found that there was a dead silence in the city, and no sign of arms or men was visible in the towers or on the walls, he checked his men, who were eager to get into the deserted fortifications, for fear he might be rushing blindly into a trap. He ordered two troops of cavalry belonging to the Latin contingent to ride round the walls and make a thorough reconnaissance. They discovered one gate open, and another near it also open 
and on the road leading from these gates traces of the enemy's nocturnal flight. Riding slowly up to the gates, they obtained an uninterrupted view of the city through the straight streets, and brought back reports to the consul that the city had been evacuated, as was clear from the unmistakable solitude, and the things scattered about in the confusion of the night, evidence of their hasty flight. On receiving this information, the consul led his army round to that side of the city which the cavalry had examined. Halting the standards near the gates, he ordered five horsemen to enter the city, and after going some distance, three were to remain where they were, and two were to return and report to him what they had discovered. They reported that they had reached a point from which a view was obtained in all directions, and everywhere they saw a silent solitude. The consul immediately sent some light-armed cohorts into the city. The rest of the army received orders to form an entrenched camp. The soldiers who had entered the place broke open some of the houses, and found a few old and sick people and such property left behind as they found too difficult to transport. This was appropriated, and it was ascertained from the prisoners that several cities in the neighborhood had mutually agreed to leave their homes, and the Romans would probably find the same solitude in other cities. What the prisoners had said proved to be true, and the consul took possession of the abandoned towns. 35. The other consul, Marcus Attilius, found his task by no means so easy. He had received information that the Samnites were besieging Luceria, and he marched to its relief. But the enemy met him at the frontier of the Lucerine territory. Exasperation and rage lent them a strength which made them a match for the Romans. The battle went on with changing fortunes and an indecisive result, but in the end the Romans were in the sorrier plight, for they were unaccustomed to defeat, and it was after the two armies had separated, rather than in the battle itself, that they realized how much greater the loss was on their side in both killed and wounded. When they were once more within their camp, they became a prey to fears which, had they felt them whilst actually fighting, would have brought upon them a signal disaster. They passed an anxious night expecting that the Samnites would make an immediate attack on the camp, or that they would have to engage their victorious foe at daybreak. On the side of the enemy the loss was less, but certainly the courage displayed was not greater. As soon as it began to grow light, the Romans were anxious to retire without fighting, but there was only one way, and that led past the enemy. If they took that route, it would amount to a challenge, for it would look as though they were directly advancing to attack the Samnite camp. The consul issued a general order for the soldiers to arm for battle, and follow him outside the rampart. He then gave the necessary instructions to the officers of his staff, the military troops and the prefix of the allies. They all assured him that as far as they were concerned, they would do everything that he wished them to do, but the men had lost heart, they had passed a sleepless night amidst the wounded and the groans of the dying, and had the enemy attacked the camp while it was still dark, they were in such a state of fright that they would have deserted their standards. As it was, they were only kept from flight by a feeling of shame, in every other respect they were practically beaten men. Under these circumstances, the consul thought he ought to go round and address the soldiers personally. When he came to any who were showing reluctance to arm themselves, he asked them why they were so slow and so cowardly. The enemy would come up to their camp unless they met him outside. They would have to fight to defend their tents if they refused to fight in front of their rampart. Armed and fighting, they had a chance of victory, but the men who awaited the enemy unarmed and defenseless would have to suffer either death or or slavery. To these taunts and reproaches they replied that they were exhausted with the fighting on the previous day, they had no strength or blood left, and the enemy seemed to be in greater force than ever. Whilst this was going on, the hostile army approached, and as they were now closer and could be seen more clearly, the men declared that the Samnites were carrying stakes with them, and there was no doubt they intended to shut the camp in with a circumvallation. 
Then the consul loudly exclaimed that it would indeed be a disgrace if they submitted to such a galling insult from so dastardly a foe. Shall we, he cried, be actually blockaded in our camp to perish ignominiously by hunger rather than, if we must die, die bravely at the sword's point? Heaven forbid! Act, every man of you, as you deem worthy of yourselves. I, the consul, Marcus Attilius, will go against the enemy alone, if none will follow, and fall amongst the standards of the Samnites, sooner than see a Roman camp hedged in by circumvallation. The consul's words were welcomed by all his officers, and the rank and file, ashamed to hold back any longer, slowly put themselves in fighting trim and slowly marched out of camp. They moved in a long, irregular column, dejected and to all appearance thoroughly cowed, but the enemy against whom they were advancing felt no more confidence and showed no more spirit than they did. As soon as they caught sight of the Roman standards, a murmur ran through the Samnite army from the foremost to the hindmost ranks, that what they feared was actually happening. The Romans were coming out to oppose their march. There was no road open even for flight. They must either fall where they were or make their escape over the bodies of their prostrate foes. 36. They piled their knapsacks in the centre and formed up in order of battle. There was by this time only a narrow space between the two armies, and each side were standing motionless, waiting for the others to raise the battle shout and begin the attack. Neither of them had any heart for fighting, and they would have marched off in opposite directions if they were not each apprehensive that the other would attack them on the retreat. In this timid and reluctant mood, they commenced a feeble fight, without receiving any order to attack or raising any regular battle shout, and not a man stirred a foot from where he stood. Then the consul, in order to infuse some spirit into the combatants, sent a few troops of cavalry to make a demonstration. Most of them were thrown from their horses, and the rest got into hopeless confusion. A rush was made by the Samnites to overpower those who had been dismounted. This was met by a rush from the Roman rank to protect their comrades. This made the fighting somewhat more lively, but the Samnites rushed forward with more dash and in greater numbers, whilst the disordered Roman cavalry on their terrified horses were riding down their own supports. The demoralization which began here extended to the whole army. There was a general flight, and the Samnites had none to fight with but the rearmost of their foes. At this critical moment, the consul galloped back to the camp and posted a cavalry detachment before the gate, with strict orders to treat as an enemy any one who made for the rampart, whether Roman or Samnite. He then stopped his men, who were running back to the camp in disorder, and in menacing tones called out, Where are you going, soldiers? Here, too, you will find armed men, and not one of you shall enter the camp while your consul is alive, unless you come as victors. Now make your choice whether you would rather fight with your own countrymen, or with the enemy. While the consul was speaking, the cavalry closed round the fugitives with levelled spears and peremptorily ordered them to return to the battlefield. Not only did the consul's courage help them to rally, but fortune also favoured them. As the Samnites were not in close pursuit, there was space enough for the standards to wheel round and the whole army to change front from the camp to the enemy. Now the men began to encourage each other. The centurion snatched the standards from the hands of the bearers and carried them forward, pointing out at the same time to their men how few the enemy were and in what loose order they were coming. In the middle of it all, the consul, raising his hands towards heaven and speaking in a loud voice so that he might be well heard, vowed a temple to Jupiter's stature. If the Roman army stayed its flight and renewed the battle and defeated and slew the Samnites. All officers and men, infantry and cavalry alike, exerted themselves to the utmost to restore the battle. Even the divine providence seemed to have looked with favour on the Romans. So easily did matters take a favourable turn. The enemy were repulsed from the camp, and in a short time were driven back to the ground where the battle began. Here their movements were hampered by the heap of knapsacks they had piled up in their centre. To prevent these from being plundered, they took up their position round them, but the Roman infantry pressed upon them in front, and the cavalry 
attacked them in rear, so between the two they were all either killed or made prisoners. The latter amounted to 7,800. These were all stripped and sent under the yoke. The number of those killed was reported to be 4,800. The Romans had not much cause for rejoicing over their victory, for when the consul reckoned up the losses sustained through the two days' fighting, the number of missing was returned to 7,800. During these incidents in Apulia, the Samnites made an attempt with a second army upon the Roman colony at Interamna, situated on the Latin road. Failing to get possession of the city, they ravaged the fields and proceeded to carry off, along with their other plunder, a number of men and several head of cattle, and some colonists whom they had captured. They fell in with the consul, who was returning from his victorious campaign in Luceria, and not only lost their booty, but their long straggling column was quite unprepared for attack, and was consequently cut up. The consul issued a notice summoning the owners of the plundered property to Interamna, to identify and recover what belonged to them, and leaving his army there, started for Rome to conduct the elections. He requested to be allowed a triumph, but this honour was refused him on the ground that he had lost so many thousands of men, and also because he had sent his prisoners under the yoke without its having been made a condition of their surrender. 37. The other consul, Posthumius, finding nothing for his troops to do amongst the Samnites, led them into Etruria and began to lay waste the district of Volsinia. The townsmen came out to defend their borders, and a battle ensued not far from their walls. Two thousand eight hundred of the Etruscans were killed, and the rest were saved by the proximity of their city. He then passed over into the Rosellan territory. There not only were the fields harried, but the town itself was successfully assaulted. More than two thousand were made prisoners, and under two thousand killed in the storming of the place. The peace which ensued this year in Etruria was more important, and redounded more to the honour of Rome, than even the war which led to it. Three very powerful cities, the chief cities in Etruria, Volsiniae, Perusia, and Eretium, sued for peace, and after agreeing to supply the troops with clothing and corn, they obtained the consul's consent to send spokesmen to Rome, with the result that they obtained a forty years' truce. Each of the cities was at once to pay an indemnity of five hundred thousand assis. For these services, the consul asked the Senate to decree him a triumph. The request was made more as a matter of form, to comply with the established custom, than from any hope of obtaining it. He saw that some who were his personal enemies and others who were friends of his colleague refused his request on various grounds, some alleging that he had been too late in taking the field, others that he had transferred his army from Samnium to Etruria without any orders from the Senate, whilst a third party was actuated by a desire to solace Attilius for the refusal which he had met with. In face of this opposition, he simply said, "'Senators, I am not so mindful of your authority as to forget that I am consul. By the same right and authority by which I have conducted wars, now that these wars have been brought to a successful close, Samnium and Etruria subdued, victory and peace secured, I shall celebrate my triumph.' and with that he left the senate. A sharp contention now broke out between the tribunes of the plebs. Some declared that they should interpose to prevent his obtaining a triumph in a way which violated all precedent. Others asserted that they should give him their support in spite of their colleagues. The matter was brought before the assembly, and the consul was invited to be present. In his speech he alluded to the cases of the consuls Marcus Horatius and Lucius Valerius, and the recent one of Gaius Marcius Rutilus, the father of the man who was censor at the time. All these, he said, had been allowed a triumph, not on the authority of the Senate, but by an order of the people. He would have brought the question before the people himself, had he not been aware that certain tribunes of the plebs, who were bound hand and foot to the nobles, would veto the proposal. He regarded the good will and favour of a unanimous people as tantamount to all the formal orders that were made. 
supported by three of the tribunes against the veto of the remaining seven and against the unanimous vote of the senate he celebrated his triumph on the following day amidst a great outburst of popular enthusiasm the records of this year vary widely from each other according to claudius posthumius after taking some cities in samnium was routed and put to flight in apulia he himself being wounded and was driven with a small body of his troops to luceria the victories in Etruria were won by Attilius, and it was he who celebrated the triumph. Fabius tells us that both consuls conducted the campaign in Samnium and at Luceria, and that the army was transferred to Etruria, but he does not say by which consul. He also states that at Luceria the losses were heavy on both sides, and that a temple was vowed to Jupiter's stature in that battle. This same vow Romulus had made centuries before, but only the phanum, that is, the site of the temple, had been consecrated. As the state had become thus doubly pledged, it became necessary to discharge its obligation to the god, and the senate made an order this year for the construction of the temple. 38. The year following was marked by the consulship of Lucius Papirius Cursor, who had not only inherited his father's glory, but enhanced it by his management of a great war and a victory over the Samnites, second only to the one which his father had won. It happened that this nation had taken the same care and pains to adorn their soldiery with all the wealth of splendor as they had done on the occasion of the elder Papirius's victory. They had also called in the aid of the gods by submitting the soldiers to a kind of initiation into an ancient form of oath. A levy was conducted throughout Samnium under a novel regulation. Any man within the military age who had not assembled on the captain general's proclamation or any one who had departed without permission was devoted to Jupiter and his life forfeited. The whole of the army was summoned to Aquilonia, and forty thousand men, the full strength of Samnium, were concentrated there. A space about two hundred feet square, almost in the centre of their camp, was boarded off and covered all over with linen cloth. In this enclosure a sacrificial service was conducted, the words being read from an old linen book by an aged priest, Ovius Pasius, who announced that he was taking that form of service from the old ritual of the Samnite religion. It was the form which their ancestors was used when they formed their secret design of wresting Capua from the Etruscans. When the service was completed, the captain-general sent a message to summon all those who were of noble birth or who were distinguished for their military achievements. They were admitted into the enclosure one by one. As it was admitted, he was led up to the altar more like a victim than like one who was taking part in the service, and he was bound on oath not to divulge what he saw and heard in that place. Then they compelled him to take an oath couched in the most terrible language, imprecating a curse on himself, his family, and his race if he did not go into battle where the commander should lead him, or if he either himself fled from battle, or did not at once slay any one whom he saw fleeing. At first there were some who refused to take this oath. They were massacred beside the altar, and their dead bodies lying amongst the scattered remains of the victims were a plain hint to the rest not to refuse. After the foremost men amongst the Samnites had been bound by this dread formula, ten were especially named by the captain-general, and told each to choose a comrade in arms, these again to choose others, until they had made up the number of sixteen thousand. These were called the Linen Legion, from the material with which the place where they had been sworn was covered. They were provided with resplendent armor and plumed helmets to distinguish them from the others. The rest of the army consisted of something under twenty thousand men, but they were not inferior to the Linen Legion, either in their personal appearance or soldierly qualities, or in the excellence of their equipment. This was the number of those in camp at Aquilonia, forming the total strength of Samnium. End of section 26section 27 of the history of rome volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information 
or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Rome, Volume 2, by Livy, translated by William Maspin Roberts. Book 10, Chapters 39 to 47. Chapter 39. The consuls left the city. The first to go was Spurius Carvilius, to whom were assigned the legions which Marcus Attilius, the previous consul, had left in the district of Interamna. With these he advanced into Samnium, and while the enemy were taken up with their superstitious observance and forming secret plans, he stormed and captured the town of Amiternum. Nearly two thousand eight hundred men were killed there, and four thousand two hundred and seventy made prisoners. Papirius, with a fresh army raised by senatorial decree, successfully attacked the city of Durania. He made fewer prisoners than his colleague, but slew a somewhat greater number. In both towns rich booty was secured. Then the consuls traversed Samnium in different directions. Carbilius, after ravaging the Atinate country, came to Caminium. Papirius reached Aquilonia, where the main army of the Samnites was posted. The Battle of Aquilonia For some time his troops, while not quite inactive, abstained from any serious fighting. The time was spent in annoying the enemy when he was quiet, and retiring when he showed resistance, and threatening rather than in offering battle. As long as this practice went on day after day, of beginning and then desisting, even the slightest skirmish led to no result. The other Roman camp was separated by an interval of twenty miles, but Carvilius was guided in all his measures by the advice of his distant colleague. His thoughts were dwelling more on Aquilonia, where the state of affairs was so critical, than on Caminium, which he was actually besieging. Papirius was at length perfectly ready to fight, and he sent a message to his colleague announcing his intention, if the auspices were favourable, of engaging the enemy the next day, and impressing upon him the necessity of attacking Cominium with his full strength, to give the Samnites no opportunity of sending succour to Aquilonia. The messenger had the day for his journey. He returned in the night, bringing word back to the consul that his colleague approved of his plan. Immediately after dispatching the messenger, Papirius ordered a muster of his troops and addressed them preparatory to the battle. He spoke at some length about the general character of the war they were engaged in, and especially upon the style of equipment which the enemy had adopted, which he said served for idle pageantry rather than for practical use. Plumes did not inflict wounds. Their painted and gilded shields would be penetrated by the Roman javelin, and an army resplendent in dazzling white would be stained with gore when the sword came into play. A Samnite army all in gold and silver had once been been annihilated by his father, and those trappings had brought more glory as spoils to the victors than they had brought as armor to the wearers. It might perhaps be a special privilege granted to his name and family that the greatest efforts which the Samnites had ever made should be frustrated and defeated under their generalship, and that the spoils which they brought back should be sufficiently splendid to serve as decorations for the public places in the city. Treaties so often asked for, so often broken, brought about the intervention of the immortal gods, and if it were permitted to man to form any conjecture as to the feelings of the gods, he believed that they had never been more incensed against any army than against this one of the Samnites. It had taken part in infamous rites and been stained with the mingled blood of men and beasts. It was under the twofold curse of heaven, filled with dread at the thought of the gods who witnessed the treaties made with Rome, and horror struck at the imprecations which were uttered when an oath was taken to break those treaties, an oath which the soldiers took under compulsion, and which they recall with loathing. They dread alike the gods, their fellow countrymen, and the enemy. Forty. These details the consul had gathered from information supplied by deserters, and his mention of them increased the exasperation of the troops. 
assured of the favor of heaven and satisfied that humanly speaking they were more than a match for their foes they clamored with one voice to be led to battle and were intensely disgusted at finding that it was put off till the morrow they chaffed angrily at the delay of a whole day and night after receiving the reply from his colleague papirius rose quietly in the third watch of the night and sent a pulerius to observe the omens there was not a man whatever his rank or condition in the camp who was not seized by the passion for battle the highest and lowest alike were eagerly looking forward to it the general was watching the excited looks of the men the men were looking at their general the universal excitement extended even to those who were engaged in observing the sacred bird the chickens refused to eat but the pulerius ventured to misrepresent matters and reported to the consul that they had eaten so greedily that the corn dropped from their mouths on to the ground the consul delighted at the news gave out that the omens could not have been more favorable they were going to engage the enemy under the guidance and blessing of heaven he then gave the signal for battle just as they were taking up their positions a deserter brought word that twenty cohorts of the samnites comprising about four hundred men each had gone to cominium he instantly dispatched a message to his colleague in case he should not be aware of this movement and ordered the standards to be advanced more rapidly he had already posted the reserves in their respective positions and told off an officer to take command of each detachment the right wing of the main army he entrusted to lucius volumnius the left to lucius scipio and two other members of his staff gaius caedicius and titus tribonius were placed in command of the cavalry he gave orders orders for spurious nautius to remove the pack saddles from the mules and to take them together with three of the auxiliary cohorts by a circuitous route to some rising ground visible from the battlefield where during the progress of the fight he was to attract attention by raising as great a cloud of dust as possible while the consul was busy with these arrangements an altercation began between the pulerii about the omens which had been observed in the morning some of the roman cavalry overheard it and thought it of sufficient importance to justify them in reporting to spurius papirius the consul's nephew that the omens were being called in question this young man born in an age when men were not yet taught to despise the gods inquired into the matter in order to make sure that what he was reporting was true and then laid it before the consul he thanked him for the trouble he had taken and bade him have no fears but he continued if the man who is watching the omens makes a false report he brings down the divine wrath on his own head as far as i am concerned i have received the formal intimation that the chickens ate eagerly there could be no more favorable omen for the roman people and army he then issued instructions to the centurions to place the polarius in front of the fighting line the standards of the samnites were now advancing followed by the army in gorgeous array even to their enemies they presented a magnificent sight before the battle shout was raised or the lines closed a chance javelin struck the pulerius and he fell in front of the standards when this was reported to the consul he remarked the gods are taking their part in the battle the guilty man has met with his punishment while the consul was speaking a crow in front of him gave a loud and distinct caw the consul welcomed the augury and declared that the gods had never more plainly manifested their presence in human affairs he then ordered the charge to be sounded and the battle shout to be raised forty one a savagely fought contest ensued the two sides were however animated by very different feelings the romans went into battle eager for the fray confident of victory exasperated against the enemy and thirsting for his blood the samnites were most of them dragged in against their will by sheer compulsion and the terrors of religion and they adopted defensive rather than aggressive tactics accustomed as they had been for so many years to defeat they would not have sustained even the first shout in charge of the romans had not a still more awful object of fear possessed their minds and stayed them from flight they had before their eyes all that paraphernalia of the sacred rite the armed priests the slaughtered remains of men and beasts scattered about indiscriminately the altars sprinkled with the blood of the victims and of their murdered countrymen the awful imprecations the frightful curses which they had invoked 
choked on their family and race. These were the chains which bound them so that they could not flee. They dreaded their own countrymen more than the enemy. The Romans pressed on from both wings and from the centre, and cut down men who were paralysed by fear of gods and men. Only a feeble resistance could be offered by those who were only kept from flight by fear. The carnage had almost extended to the second line, where the standards were stationed, when there appeared in the side distance a cloud of dust as though raised by the tread of an immense army. It was Spurius Nautius, some say Octavius Macius, the commander of the auxiliary cohorts. They raised the dust out of all proportion to their numbers, for the camp followers mounted upon the mules were dragging leafy bows along the ground. At first the arms and standards gradually became visible through the beclouded light, and then a loftier and thicker cloud of dust gave the appearance of cavalry closing the column. Not only the Samnites, but even the Romans were deceived. The consul endorsed the mistake by shouting to his front rank so that the enemy could hear, Cominium has fallen. My victorious colleague is coming on the field. Do your best to win the victory before the glory of doing so falls to the other army. He rode along while saying this, and commanded the tribunes and centurions to open their ranks to allow passage for the cavalry. He had previously told Trebonius and Caedicius that when they saw him brandish his spear aloft, they should launch the cavalry against the enemy with all the force they could. His orders were carried out to the letter, the legionaries opened their ranks, the cavalry galloped through the open spaces, and with leveled spears charged the enemy's centre. Wherever they attacked, they broke the ranks. Volumius and Scipio followed up the cavalry charge and completed the discomfiture of the Samnites. At last the dread of gods and men had yielded to a greater terror. The linen cohorts were routed. Those who had taken the oath and those who had not alike fled. The only thing they feared now was the enemy. The bulk of the infantry who survived the actual battle were driven either into their camp or to Aquilonia. The nobility and cavalry fled to Bovianum. The cavalry were pursued by cavalry, the infantry by infantry, the wings of the Roman army separated, the right directed its course towards the Samnite camp, the left to the city of Aquilonia. The first success fell to Volumnius, who captured the Samnite camp. Scipio met with more sustained resistance at the city, not because the defeated foe showed more courage there, but because stone walls are more difficult to surmount than the ramparts of a camp. They drove the defenders from their walls with showers of stones. Scipio saw that unless his task was completed before the enemy had time to recover from their panic, an attack on a fortified city would be a somewhat slow affair. He asked his men whether they would be content to allow the enemy's camp to be captured by the other army, whilst they themselves, after their victory, were repulsed from the gates of the city. There was a universal shout of no. On hearing this, he held his shield above his head and ran to the gate. The men followed his example, and roofing themselves with their shields, burst through into the city. They dislodged the Samnites from the walls on either side of the gate, but as they were only a small body, did not venture to penetrate into the interior of the city. 42. The consul was at first unaware of what was going on, and was anxious to recall his troops, for the sun was now rapidly sinking, and the approaching night was making every place suspicious and dangerous, even for victorious troops. After he had ridden forward some distance, he saw that the camp on his right hand had been captured, and he heard at the same time the mingled clamor of shouts and groans arising in the direction of the city on his left. Just then the fighting at the gate was going on. As he he approached more closely, he saw his men on the walls, and recognized that the position was no longer doubtful, since by the reckless daring of a few the opportunity for a brilliant success had been won. He at once ordered the troops whom he had recalled to be brought up and prepared for a regular attack on the city. Those who were within bivouacked near the gate as night was approaching, and during the night the place was evacuated by the enemy. The Samnite losses during the day amounted to 20,340 killed and 3,870 made prisoners, 
or else 97 standards were taken. It is noted in the histories that hardly any other general ever appeared in such high spirits during the battle, either owing to his fearless temperament or to the confidence he felt in his final success. It was this dauntless and resolute character which prevented him from abandoning all idea of fighting when the omens were challenged. It was this, too, that made him in the very crisis of the struggle, at the moment when it is customary to vow temples to the gods, make a vow to Jupiter Victor, that if he routed the legions of the enemy, he would offer him a cup of sweetened wine, before he drank anything stronger himself. This vow was acceptable to the gods, and they changed the omens into favorable ones. 43. Capture of Cominium the same good fortune attended the other consul at Cominium. At the approach of daylight he brought his whole force up to the walls so as to enclose the city with a ring of steel, and stationed strong bodies of troops before the gates to prevent any sortie from being made. Just as he was giving the signal for assault, the alarming message reached him from his colleague about the twenty cohorts. This delayed the attack and necessitated the recall of a portion of his troops, who were ready and eager to begin the storm. He ordered Decimus Brutus Scaeva, one of his staff, to intercept the hostile reinforcements with the first legion and ten auxiliary cohorts with their complement of cavalry. Wherever he fell in with them, he was to hold them and stop their advance. If circumstances should make it necessary, he was to offer them battle. In any case, he was to prevent those troops from reaching Cominium. Then he went on with his preparations for the assault. Orders were issued for scaling ladders to be reared against the walls in all directions, and an approach made to the gates under a shield roof. Simultaneously with the smashing in of the gates, the storming parties clambered up on the walls on every side. Until they saw their enemy actually on the walls, the Samnites had sufficient courage to try to keep them from approaching the city, but when they had to fight not by discharging their missiles from a distance, but at close quarters, when those who had forced their way onto the walls and overcame the disadvantage of being on lower ground were fighting on even terms, an enemy who was no match for them, the defenders abandoned their walls and towers and were driven back into the forum. Here they made a desperate effort to retrieve their fortune, but after a brief struggle they threw down their arms, and eleven thousand four hundred men surrendered, after losing four thousand eight hundred and eighty killed. Thus matters went at Cominium as they had gone at Aquilonia. In the country between these two cities, where a third battle was expected, nothing was seen of the twenty cohorts. When they were still seven miles from Cominium, they were recalled by their comrades, and so did not come in for either battle. Just as twilight was setting in, when they had reached the spot from which their camp and Aquilonia were both visible, a noise of shouting from both quarters made them call a halt. Then, in the direction of their camp, which had been set on fire by the Romans, flames shooting up far and wide, a more certain indication of disaster, stopped them from going any further. They threw themselves down just where they were under arms, and passed a restless night waiting for and dreading the day, when it began to grow light, whilst they were still uncertain what direction to take. They were espied by the cavalry who had gone in pursuit of the Samnites in their nocturnal retreat from Aquilonia. The whole body were plainly discernible, with no entrenchments to protect them, no outposts on guard. They were visible, too, from the walls of the city, and in a short time the legionary cohorts were on their track. They made a hasty flight, and the infantry were unable to come up with them, but some two hundred and eighty in the extreme rear were cut down by the cavalry, a great quantity of arms, and twenty-two standards were left behind in their hurry to escape. The other body who had escaped from Aquilonia reached Bovianum in comparative safety, considering the confusion which marked their retreat. 44. The rejoicings in each of the Roman armies were all the greater because of the success achieved by the other. The consuls, by mutual agreement, gave up the captured cities to be sacked by the soldiery. When they had cleared out the houses, they set them on fire, and in one day Aquilonia and Cominium were burnt to the ground. Amidst their own mutual congratulations and those of their soldiers, the consuls united their camps. In the presence of the two armies, rewards and decorations 
were bestowed by both Carvilius and Papirius. Papirius had seen his men through many different actions in the open field, round their camp under city walls, and the rewards he bestowed were well merited. Spurius Nautius, Spurius Papirius, his nephew, four centurions, and a maniple of Hastatai all received golden bracelets and crowns. Spurius Nautius won his for his success in the maneuver by which he frightened the enemy with the appearance of a large army. The young Papirius owed his reward to the work he did with the cavalry in the battle, and in the following night, when he harassed the retreat of the Samnites from Aquilonia. The centurions and men of the maniple were rewarded for having been the first to seize the gate and wall of the city. All the cavalry were presented with ornaments for their helmets and silver bracelets as rewards for their brilliant work in various localities. Subsequently, a council of war was held to settle whether the time had come for withdrawing both armies from Samnium, or at all events one of them. It was thought best to continue the war, and to carry it on more and more ruthlessly in proportion as the Samnites became weaker, in order that they might hand over to the consuls who succeeded them a thoroughly subdued nation. As the enemy had now no army in a condition to fight in the open field, the war could only be carried on by attacking their cities, and the sack of those which they captured would enrich the soldiers, whilst the enemy, compelled to fight for their hearths and homes, would gradually become exhausted. In pursuance of this plan, the consuls sent dispatches to Rome giving an account of their operations, and then separated. Papirius marching to Sipnum, whilst Carvilius led his legions to the assault on Velia. 45. The contents of these dispatches were listened to with every manifestation of delight, both in the Senate and in the Assembly. A four days' thanksgiving was appointed as an expression of the public joy, and festal observances were kept up in every house. These successes were not only of great importance in themselves, but they came most opportunely for Rome, as it so happened that at that very time information was received that Etruria had again commenced hostilities. The question naturally occurred to people's minds, how would it have been possible to withstand Etruria if any reverse had been met with in Samnium? The Etruscans, acting upon a secret understanding with the Samnites, had seized the moment when both consuls and the whole force of Rome were employed against Samnium as a favourable opportunity for recommencing war. Embassies from the allied states were introduced by Marcus Attilius the Praetor into the Senate, and complained of the ravaging and burning of their fields by their Etruscan neighbours, because they would not revolt from Rome. They appealed to the Senate to protect them from the outrageous violence of their common foe, and were told in reply that the Senate would see to it that their allies had no cause to regret their fidelity, and that the day was near when the Etruscans would be in the same position as the Samnites. Still, the Senate would have been somewhat dilatory in dealing with the Etruscan question, had not intelligence come to hand that even the Feliscans, who had for many years been on terms of friendship with Rome, had now made common cause with the Etruscans. The proximity of this city to Rome made the Senate take a more serious view of the position, and they decided to send the Fetils to demand redress. Satisfaction was refused, and by order of the people, with the sanction of the Senate, war was formally declared against the Feliscans. The consuls were ordered to decide by lot which of them should transport his army from Samnium into Etruria. By this time, Carvilius had taken from the Samnites three of their cities, Velia, Palumbinum, and Herculaneum. Velia he took after a few days' siege. Palumbinum, on the day he arrived before its walls, Herculaneum gave him more trouble. After an indecisive battle in which, however, his losses were somewhat the heavier, he moved his camp close up to the town and shut up the enemy within their walls. The place was then stormed and captured. In these three captures, the number of killed and prisoners amounted to 10,000, the prisoners forming a small majority of the total loss. On the consuls casting lots for their respective commands, Etruria fell to Carvilius, much to the satisfaction of his men, who were now unable to stand the intense cold of Samnium. But Pyrrhus met with more resistance at Sipinum. There were frequent encounters in the open field, on the march and round the city itself, when he was checking the sorties of the enemy. There was no question of siege operations. The enemy met him on equal terms, for the Samnites protected their walls 
walls with their arms quite as much as their walls protected them. At last, by dint of hard fighting, he compelled the enemy to submit to a regular siege, and after pressing the siege with spade and sword, he finally effected the capture of the place. The victors were exasperated by the obstinate resistance, and the Samnites suffered heavily, losing no less than 7,400 killed, while only 3,000 were made prisoners. Owing to the Samnites having stored all their property in a limited number of cities, there was a vast amount of plunder, the whole of which was given to the soldiery. 46. Papirius celebrates his triumph. Everything was now deep in snow, and it was impossible to remain any longer in the open, so the consul withdrew his army from Samnium. On his approach to Rome, a triumph was granted to him by universal consent. This triumph, which he celebrated while still in office, was a very brilliant one for those days. The infantry and cavalry who marched in the procession were conspicuous with their decorations. Many were wearing civic, mural, and valerian crowns. The spoils of the Samnites attracted much attention, their splendor and beauty were compared with those which the consul's father had won, and which were familiar to all through their being used as decorations of public places. Amongst those in the victor's chain were some prisoners of high rank, distinguished for their own or their father's military services. They were also carried in the procession. 2,533,000 bronze assis, stated to be the proceeds of the sale of the prisoners, and 1,830 pounds of silver taken from the cities. All the silver and bronze was stored in the treasury, none of this was given to the soldiers. This created dissatisfaction amongst the plebs, which was aggravated by the collection of the war tax to provide the soldiers' pay, for if Papirius had not been so anxious to get the credit of paying the price of the prisoners into the treasury, there would have been enough to make a gift to the soldiers and also to furnish their pay. He dedicated the temple of Quirinus. I do not find in any ancient offer that it was he who vowed this temple in the crisis of a battle, and certainly he could not have completed it in so short a time. It was vowed by his father when dictator, and the son dedicated it when consul, and adorned it with the spoils of the enemy. There was such a vast quantity of these that not only were the temple and the forum adorned with them, but they were distributed amongst the allied peoples in the nearest colonies to decorate their public spaces and temples. After his triumph, Papirius led his army into the neighborhood of Vesia, as that district was still infested by the Samnites, and there he wintered. Carvilius's Successes and Triumph During this time, Carvilius was making preparations to attack Troilum in Etruria. He allowed 470 of its wealthiest citizens to leave the place after they had paid an enormous sum by way of ransom. The town, with the rest of its population, he took by storm. Going on from there, he carried five forts, positions of great natural strength. In these actions, the enemy lost 2,400 killed and 2,000 prisoners. The Faliscans sued for peace, and he granted them a truce for one year on condition of their supplying a year's pay to his troops, and an indemnity of 100,000 assis of bronze coinage. After these successes, he went home to enjoy his triumph, a triumph less illustrious than his colleagues in regard of the Samnite campaign, but fully equal to it considering his series of successes in Etruria. He brought into the treasury 380,000 assis out of the proceeds of the war, the rest he disposed of partly in contracting for the building of a temple to Fortis Fortuna, near the temple of that deity, which King Servius Tullius had dedicated, and partly as a donative to the soldiers, each legionary receiving 102 assis, the centurions and cavalry twice as much. This gift was all the more acceptable to the men after the niggardliness of his colleagues. Lucius Posumius, one of his staff, was indicted before the people, but was protected by the consul's popularity. His prosecutor was Marcus Scantius, a tribune of the plebs, and the report was that he had evaded trial by being made a staff officer. Proceedings, therefore, could only be threatened without being carried out. 47. Various Notices the year having now expired, new plebeian tribunes entered upon office, but there was a flaw in their election, and five days later others took their place. The lustrum was closed this year by the censors, Publius Cornelius Arvina, 
and Gaius Marcius Rutilus. The census returns give the population as numbering 262,321. These were the 26th pair of censors since the first, the lustrum was the 19th. This year, for the first time, those who had been crowned for their deeds in war were allowed to wear their decorations at the Roman Games, and then, too, for the first time, palms were given to the victors after a custom borrowed from Greece. This year, also, the road from the Temple of Mars to Beauvale was paved throughout its length by the Curule Ideals, who devoted to the purpose the fines levied on cattle breeders. Lucius Papirius conducted the consular elections. The consuls elected were Quintus Fabius Gurgites, the son of Maximus, and Decius Junius Brutus Scaeva. Papirius himself was made praetor. The many incidents which helped to make the year a happy one served to console the citizens for one calamity, a pestilence which raged in the city and country districts alike. The mischief it did was looked upon as a portent. The sacred books were consulted to see what end or what remedy would be vouchsafed by the gods. It was ascertained that Aesculapius must be sent for from Apidarus. Nothing, however, was done that year, owing to the consuls being engrossed with the war, beyond the appointment of a day of public intercession to Aesculapius. End of section 27. Section 28 of the History of Rome, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Rome, Volume 2, by Livy, translated by William Maspin Roberts. The First Lost Decade, Summary of Books 11 to 20. The second decade, of which the following is the summary, is the first of the lost decades. The history of the period is treated by Momsen in Volume 1, pages 377 to 425, and Volume 2, pages 26 to 77. Book 11. Fabius Gurgis had been unfortunate in his campaign against the Semnites, and the Senate were considering the question of removing him from his command, when Fabius Maximus, his father, implored them not to inflict this disgrace upon him. He promised to serve under his son, and the Senate gave way. Through his advice and assistance, his son won a triumph over the Semnites. Gaius Pontius, the captain-general of the Samnites, was led in the triumphal procession, and then beheaded. On the occasion of a pestilence which ravaged the city, a deputation was sent to bring away the statue of Esculapius from Epidorus. A snake, which had taken up its quarters in their ship, and in which it was asserted that the deity was dwelling, was brought back, and when it left the ship and swam to the island in the Tiber, the spot was made the site of a temple to Esculapius. Lucius Postumius, a man of consular rank, was condemned for having employed his soldiers as laborers on his land when they were under his command. The treaty with the Semnites was, at their request, renewed for the fourth time. The consul Curius triumphed twice in his year of office over the Semnites, upon whom he had inflicted very heavy loss, and over the Sabines, who had been defeated and made their surrender. Colonists were settled at Castrum, Senna, and Hadria. The Triumviri Capitalis were then appointed for the first time. The census was taken and the lustrum closed. The number of citizens was returned at 272,000. After long continued and serious conflicts over the question of debt, the plebs, at last, seceded to the Janiculum, they were brought back by the dictator Quintus Hortensius. He died while still actually in office. This book contains also the operations against the Volusinii and also those against the Lucanians, against whom the Thurians decided to render assistance. Book 12. Ambassadors from Rome were put to death by the Senonian Gauls, and war was declared against them. Lucius Cecilius, the praetor, with his legions, was cut up by them. The Roman fleet was destroyed by the Tarentines, and the Deumvir, who was in command, was killed. 
the ambassadors who were sent by the Senate to protest against this outrage were beaten. War, accordingly, was declared against them. The Semnites revolted, and numerous successes were gained over them by various generals, as well as over the Lucanians, the Brutians, and the Etruscans. Pyrrhus, king of the Epirotes, came to Italy to assist the Tarentines. The Campanian legion, under the command of their prefect, Decius Vibelius, were sent to garrison Regium. They killed the townspeople and took possession of the place. Book 13 Valerius Levinus, the consul, fought unsuccessfully with Pyrrhus. The soldiers were terrified at the unfamiliar sight of the elephants. When Pyrrhus examined the bodies of the Romans who had fallen in the battle, he found their faces all turned towards their foe. He advanced towards Rome, laying the country waste as he marched. Gaius Fabricius was sent to him by the Senate to arrange for the ransom of the prisoners, and the king vainly endeavored to induce him to desert his country. The prisoners were sent back without ransom. Cineas was sent by Pyrrhus to the Senate to ask that the king might be admitted into the city to arrange terms of peace. It was decided to refer the question to a full house, and when it had assembled, Appius Claudius, who, owing to the state of his eyes, had long withdrawn from public business, came into the Senate and succeeded in persuading them to refuse Pyrrhus's request. Nias Domitius, the first censor taken from the plebs, closed the lustrum. The census returns gave a population of 287,222. A second battle took place with Pyrrhus, with indecisive results. The treaty was renewed for the fourth time with the Carthaginians. A deserter from Pyrrhus's army came to Gaius Fabricius and promised to poison the king. He was sent back, and the king was informed of his treachery. This book also narrates successes against the Lucanians, the Brutii, the Semnites, and the Etruscans. Book 14. Pyrrhus crossed over into Sicily. Amongst other portents which were happening, the statue of Jupiter in the capital was thrown down by a stroke of lightning. The head was afterwards discovered by the augurs. When Curius Dentatus was raising his army, he sold the property of any who refused to give in their names. On Pyrrhus's return from Sicily, he defeated him in battle and drove him out of Italy. Fabricius, as censor, removed Publius Cornelius Rufinus, a man of consular rank, from the role of senators, because he possessed ten pounds weight of silver plate. The lustrum was closed by the censors, and the population returned at 271,234. An alliance was formed with Ptolemy, king of Egypt. Sextilia, a vestal virgin, was found guilty of unchastity and buried alive. Colonists were settled at Posidonia and Cosa. A Carthaginian fleet came to the assistance of the Tarentines in direct violation of the treaty. Successful campaigns against the Lucanians, the Brutians, and the Semnites. The death of King Pyrrhus. Book 15. After the conquest of the Tarentines, peace and autonomy were granted them. The Campanian legion, which had seized Regium, were besieged and forced to surrender. They were then all beheaded. The envoys who had been sent to the Senate by the Apolloniates were beaten by some young men who were handed over to the Apolloniates. The Pisentians were defeated and then granted terms of peace. Colonists were settled at Ariminum in the Pisentian territory and at Beneventum in Semnium. The Roman people began for the first time to use silver coinage. The Umbrians and Salentines were forced to surrender. The number of the questors was increased to eight. Book 16. The origin of the Carthaginians and the beginnings of their city narrated. In conjunction with Hero, king of Syracuse, they attacked the Mamertines, and the Senate considered that assistance ought to be sent to them. There was a division of opinion, some thinking they ought to receive help, others arguing against it. The Roman cavalry crossed the sea for the first time, and had several successful encounters with Hero. Peace was concluded with him on his request. The lustrum was closed by the censors. 
the number of the population returned at 372,234. Decimus Junius Brutus gave a gladiatorial exhibition for the first time at his father's funeral. Colonists were settled at Esernia. Successes were obtained over the Carthaginians and Volsinians. Book 17. Nias Cornelius, the consul, was hemmed in by the Carthaginian fleet, and after being treacherously invited to a conference, was taken prisoner. Gaius Duilius, the consul, fought a successful action with the Carthaginian fleet, and was the first of all the Roman generals to celebrate a triumph for a naval victory. For thus distinguishing himself, the honor was conferred upon him for life of being attended on his return home by torches and flutes. Lucius Cornelius, the consul, campaigning in Sardinia and Corsica, won victories over the Sardinians and Corsicans, and over Hanno, the Carthaginian general. When the consul Attilius Calatinus had incautiously led his army into a position beset by the Carthaginians, he owed his escape to the courage and assistance of Marcus Calpurnius, a military tribune, who made a sudden attack upon the enemy with only three hundred men, and so diverted their attention. Hannibal, the Carthaginian admiral, was beaten in a sea fight and was crucified by his own men. Attilius Regulus, the consul, after defeating the Carthaginian fleet, crossed over into Africa. Book 18. Whilst in Africa, Attilius Regulus killed a serpent of preternatural size after losing a large number of his men. As he was carrying on a successful campaign against the Carthaginians, the Senate did not appoint anyone to succeed him. He complained of this in his dispatches to the Senate, and stated, amongst other reasons why he should be relieved, that his little farm was being left to itself by those whom he had hired to look after it. Fortune determined to make Regulus a striking example of her capriciousness, for Xanthippus, the Lacedaemonian general, whom the Carthaginians had invited over, defeated him in battle and took him prisoner. Subsequently, the series of successes gained by the Roman commanders by land and sea was marred by the wreck of the fleet. Tiberius Coruncanius was the first plebeian to be appointed Pontifex Maximus. The censors Marcus Sempronius Sophus and Monlius Valerius Maximus removed sixteen members of the Senate. They closed the lustrum. The number of the population was returned at 297,797. Regulus was sent by the Carthaginians to the Senate to arrange terms of peace, or, if that could not be effected, to arrange for an exchange of prisoners. He was bound by oath to return to Carthage if an exchange of prisoners was refused, and after persuading the Senate to refuse both the men's, he capped his sworn pledge and returned. The Carthaginians put him to death. Book 19 after successes over the Carthaginians, Cecilius Metellus celebrated a splendid triumph. Thirteen of the enemy's commanders and a hundred and twenty elephants formed part of the procession. Claudius Pulcher started for the war against the auspices. The chickens would not eat, so he ordered them to be thrown into the water, and fought a disastrous naval battle against the Carthaginians. He was recalled by the Senate and ordered to nominate a dictator, he nominated Claudius Glycia, a man of the lowest class, who was compelled to resign his office, and then, afterwards, was a spectator at the games in his dictator's toga. Aulus Attilius Calatinus was the first dictator to take an army out of Italy. An exchange of prisoners was effected with the Carthaginians. Colonists were settled at Fregene and at Brundisium in the Salentine country. The lustrum was closed by the censors, and the number of the population was returned at 241,212. Claudia, a sister of the Publius Claudius, who, after treating the auspices with contempt, was unsuccessful in battle, was pressed by the crowd on her return from the games, and explained, I wish my brother were alive and once more in command of the fleet. For this speech she was fined. Two praetors were appointed for the first time, Aulus Postumius was a flamen of Mars, and when he was elected consul, he wanted to go to war, 
but Cecilius Metellus, the Pontifex Maximus, kept him in the city and would not allow him to desert his sacred functions. After several generals had been successful against the Carthaginians, Gaius Latatius, the consul, won the crowning victory by defeating the Carthaginian fleet at Egates. The Carthaginians sued for peace, which was granted them. When the temple of Vesta was on fire, the Pontifex Maximus, Cecilius Metellus, snatched the holy vessels from the flames. Two tribes were added, the Veline and the Quirine. Book 20 The Feliscans commenced a six days' war, at the end of which, having been thoroughly beaten, they made a formal surrender. Colonists were settled at Spoletium. A military expedition was undertaken for the first time against the Ligurians. Attempts on the part of the Sardinians and Corsicans to renew hostilities were suppressed. Tusia, a vessel virgin, was found guilty of unchastity. War was declared against the Illyrians owing to a member of the embassy which had been sent to them having been murdered, and they were reduced to submission. The number of preachers was raised to four. A body of Gauls from the north side of the Alps invaded Italy and were cut to pieces. It is stated that the Roman army, including the Latin contingent, amounted in the course of that war to 300,000 men. The armies of Rome were then, for the first time, led beyond the Po, and after defeating the Insubrian Gauls in several battles, compelled them to surrender. Marcus Claudius Marcellus, the consul, slew their leader, Vertomorus, and brought home the Spolia Opima. The Istrians were subjugated. The Illyrians also, who had recommenced hostilities, were reduced to submission. The lustrum was closed by the censors on two several occasions. The first time it was closed, the population was returned at 270,213. The freedmen, who had previously been dispersed among all the tribes, were now formed into four, the Esquiline, the Palatine, the Suburban, and the Colline. Gaius Flaminius, the censor, constructed the Flaminian Road, and built the Flaminian Circus. Colonists were settled on the territory taken from the Gauls at Placentia and Cremona. End of section 28. End of the History of Rome, volume 2, by Livy, translated by William Masson Roberts.